Copyright Information Wild Magic Book 1 in Animalians Hall Series A Hundred Halls Universe Series Copyright 2020 by Thomas K. Carpenter Cover Design by Raven This is a digitally narrated audiobook. Chapter 1 Pack smelled blood on the way past the Firehound Dome at the Portland Supernatural Zoo. She stuttered to a stop, her shoes scuffing gravel on the path. She hesitated to test the air again, not that she wasn't used to blood. She dealt with buckets of the thick red stuff when she was in charge of feeding the manticore, but her nose hadn't been enchanted for hypersensing then like it was in that moment. She'd forgotten to have Esmeralda remove the spell before she left the herpetarium. The brief tang she'd caught had been like gargling coppery fire, it choked her. The unexpected wave of late summer heat turned the scent rancid. Even without actively sniffing, her nose burned as if she'd snorted chili powder. But her reluctance evaporated the moment she heard the shrieks of a wounded animal. The noise had come from her right, off the path, in a thicket of trees. Leafy branches whipped her bare skin as she burst through the undergrowth, cursing for the first time at the zoo's policy of natural landscaping. Pax fought through a bramble patch where a thorny limb snagged her backpack. The rational part of her brain reminded her quite dispassionately of the sheer stupidity of rushing towards the cries of a wounded animal, especially in the confines of the Portland Zoo, which was considered the most dangerous zoo in the world due to the prevalence of supernatural creatures. If a creature was being injured, it was likely something larger was doing the injuring, which meant she could be rushing into a more dangerous situation than she could anticipate. When she broke through the underbrush into a small clearing, she had to accept that the rational part of her brain had been correct. Stupid brain, she chastised it. It was a dangerous animal. The most dangerous of all. And worse yet, there were three of them. Where'd it go? asked a tall boy in a striped t-shirt, wielding a long stick he'd clearly broken from a nearby tree. In that hole, said a second boy, who had a zoo flag resting on his shoulder in the pose of someone who was always taken seriously. Derek, you go over there and shove your stick into the hole. Me and Blaine will wait over here for when it comes rushing out. The boys hadn't seen Pax yet but she'd certainly seen them, and with growing distress she realized they weren't just boys but well on their way to adulthood probably around her age, had been lead to believe they were their parents' gift to the world and had a severe lack of a working conscience. She'd rather be facing down a long-tailed dragon with bad breath, but there was no way she was going to let them bother even a fruit fly if she could help it. It'd be a lot easier if Callie was with her, but since she wasn't allowed at the zoo anymore, the little thoracic fox was at home in the shed. Nor did she think returning to the main pathways would help, since it was unlikely she'd find one of the guards, the zoo was radically underfunded, and the creature could be dead by then. Pax checked that she was still wearing her Portland magical zoo shirt, took a deep breath and yelled, Put even one inch of that stick in the hole and I'll have my death hawk bite your faces off. My darling anthrax loves eating faces, said Pax with her arms crossed, glancing at the sky expectantly. Three heads turned her direction. The man-child Derek had the end of his stick hovering over the hole, while his jaw hit his chest. Who the hell is that? asked Blaine. Shit, it looks like she works here, said Derek who was as pale as chalk. This place freaks me out enough already. Pax craned her neck towards the trees. Come down here Anthrax. Lovely, lovely faces to eat. Yum yum. As she turned her back on the three boys, she pursed her lips and made the call of an African lightning bird. Despite the name, the creature was relatively tame. She'd gotten to handle one last year in the avian section, but their calls were shiver-inducing. The first time she'd heard one scream, she thought a ghost had climbed through her. Logan, the boy in front who'd been giving them directions, screwed his face up. She might be working at the zoo, but there ain't no such thing as death hawks, and she wouldn't have one with her outside of the domes anyway. Derek didn't seem to be buying his argument. He threw down his stick and backed away, breaking into a jog as he left the clearing. Blaine looked like he was going to stay, until Pax spread her arms wide and screeched like the lightning bird again. This chick is messing with us, said Logan as he strolled towards her. Deathhawk or no, I don't want to get in trouble. 
She's got a zoo shirt on, said Blaine over his shoulder as he trotted away. After the other two left, she was face to face with Logan. He had brown wavy hair, icy blue eyes and a smattering of freckles across his nose. He should have been attractive, except she could see right into his rotten soul. I don't like when people mess with me, said Logan slapping the flagpole in his other hand. Pax's guts were doing backflips. Logan was calling her bluff. While she knew a few spells that she wasn't supposed to cast because of the dangers of Fay's madness, using magic as a non-hall mage would get her into major trouble. Pax crouched low and rocked on her heels as she decided if she should run, but she could still smell the injured animal in the hole and she didn't want him to finish the job. He poked her in the shoulder with the flag. I wouldn't let my two idiot friends talk to me like that, so I certainly ain't going to let. Before he could finish, Pax knocked the flag away and lunged with her fist, driving it into his nose. The crack filled the clearing. Fuck you broke my nose, he said, holding his hands over his face as fresh blood streamed down his lips and chin. It looks like we've got a bleeder, she said. Rage built in his eyes until they bulged. As he took a step forward, Pax saw her opening. She kicked him between the legs hard enough that the toe of her shoe caught him in the ass. His eyes rolled into the back of his head as he tipped over backwards, landing unceremoniously in a sticker bush. He lay there groaning with his hands between his legs and his mouth covered in blood. Seeing her opening, Pax rushed to the hole in the ground, hoping the critter inside would let her tend it. Hello, little one. She spoke into the hole, sending out good vibes in hopes that it could sense them. I'm here to help. If you come out, I'll take you home and fix you. With her enhanced nose, she could smell the injury. The creature had been badly hurt, which meant that it might lash out at her if she reached in, and since she didn't know what it was, that could prove deadly. Due to the climate, the Portland area had an overpopulation of supernatural creatures, which was one reason why the zoo was so successful. Esmeralda would kill me if she saw me now, said Pax, leaning onto her elbow so she could shove her arm into the hole. Behind her, Logan seemed to be recovering. He was alternating between moans and cursing her. Come on, little one. I just want to help, she said. Worming her arm into the hole, Pax jumped when something sharp sunk into her fingers. She cried out but didn't move her hand. An initial bite might only be reflexive. See, said Pax, I'm not going to hurt you. Just let me rescue you, whatever you are. When the creature didn't bite a second time, Pax reached further, grabbing onto downy fur and tugging the creature out. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw that Logan had regained his feet and was stumbling towards her, one hand on his crotch, spitting blood and profanity. Without checking to see what kind of critter she'd rescued, Pax cradled it against her chest and crashed through the undergrowth until she burst upon the main path. She headed towards the Lovelace Research Building, where she knew she'd find Esmeralda and a first aid kit. It was about a quarter mile to the front of the park, which Pax speed walked, not wanting to run and upset the injured critter, glancing over her shoulder to make sure Logan wasn't pursuing her, but once she knew she was away from him, she slowed her escape, pressing her chin against her chest long enough to realize that she'd rescued an owl thing. The critter looked like an owl, but it couldn't fly and burrowed in the ground. They were native to Scandinavia, but had been brought to the Northwest as pets to be abandoned when the owners realized that owl things could chew through stone and hypnotized small prey to walk into their open beaks. Oh you poor thing, she said. They had wide, expressive eyes that made her feel gooey inside. Underneath the owl thing's arm, a gash had been opened. Already, the sleeve of her shirt was warm with coppery blood. Pax cut through the southern aviary dome which housed a number of flight-capable supernaturals like the Kamazots, the Pseudo-Griffin, and the Rainbow Crow. As she hurried past an enclosure covered in signs that said, Do not tap the glass, and Kamazots, the Death Bat, a dark shape shot past the glass landing in a tree. The Kamazots was as big as a human, with black-brown leathery wings and sharp teeth that ripped through flesh easily. The critter in her arms seemed to sense the presence of the predator, because she heard it squeaking. Shish little one almost there, she told it. Shouldering through the north exit door led her to a short path. When she burst into the Lovelace Research Building, Esmeralda was standing with a handsome, somewhat familiar, older man in a brown suit, 
looking over a tray of selkie eggs that had been gifted to the zoo a week ago. Esmeralda wore the standard uniform of tan slacks and a green polo shirt, had her gorgeous black hair tamed by a jade clip, which showed off the silvery bangles on her ears, and had her right hand resting on the gentleman's arm. Pax, said Esmeralda, immediately rushing over to her. Zoo people always knew when a critter was injured. I thought you went home. Hey Essie, I heard this owl thing injured in the clearing past the fire hound dome, said Pax as she set the feathery critter on the table while Esmeralda pulled out the first aid kit. If it weren't for the presence of the exceedingly familiar gentleman, Pax would have told Esmeralda about the kids, but decided not to air zoo business in front of a stranger. Using one hand to hold the owl thing on the table, Pax popped open a tube of veterinary-grade antibacterial and squeezed it into the crescent-shaped wound while Essie prepared a bandage. The owl thing squeaked softly at the cool medicine, but otherwise let her work. While they administered care, the gentleman in the suit wandered over to watch. As Esmeralda pulled the bandage tape from the roll, she nodded to him and said, Pax, this is Mr. Alfred Lovelace, one of the zoo's major contributors. Oh! said Pax, widening her eyes as she finally understood why she recognized him. His picture was on the main entrance to the building he was named for. It's nice to meet you. Mr. Lovelace had an easy grin. It would be hard for me not to give money to this zoo. You do such important work here. Pax covertly shot Esmeralda an eye roll. She'd clearly been flirting with him. You look quite busy so I should go, said Mr. Lovelace. Thank you again, Ms. Esmeralda, for giving me a tour. Of course, said Esmeralda. Any time. We're just so grateful for your support. After he left, as they finished with the owl thing, leaving it swaddled on the table in a fresh blanket, Pax turned on Esmeralda with a big grin on her face. Esmeralda flipped her ponytail with the shake of her head. Whatever it takes. She winked. Anyway, he's a very nice man. Generous, too. Believes in the zoo, which we need badly. What happened with the owl thing? Pax sighed. A couple of guys were tormenting it. Esmeralda raised an eyebrow. What did you do, Pax? I scared two of them off then sort of kind of broke the last kid's nose. I got out of there before he could catch me, said Pax. Pax? That was a customer. You could get yourself fired again, or sued, or both. Esmeralda put a hand on one hip and pointed her finger at Pax, but despite the lecturing posture, her eyes were rounded with concern. Or what if he'd caught you? You could get hurt again. I know, Essie, I know, said Pax with a sigh as she traced her finger along the edge of the table. But the owl thing was injured, and those assholes were making it worse. Esmeralda crossed her arms. Pax, you know I love you, would do anything for you, but eventually rushing into danger is going to get you killed. Yes, Sue Mom, said Pax. Esmeralda sighed, tapping on the table next to the swaddled critter. You know we don't have the facilities to hold an owl thing. It's okay, I'll take it back to my shed, said Pax. The wound wasn't as bad as I thought. It just needs a few days rest, and then I can release it back into the woods before I leave. Esmeralda grabbed Pax's hands as her eyes brightened like suns. The two fingers that the owl thing had clamped on smarted, but no real damage had been done, and she didn't want Esmeralda to know about her reckless grab into the hole, or she'd get a lecture about protecting her hands. Oh, that's right. That's this weekend. I'm so excited for you, Pax. You finally get to try out for the hundred halls. A lump rose into Pax's throat. She looked away. Do you really think I can pass the trials? Esmeralda cupped her face. Oh, sweetie, I know you will. And then you'll join Animalians like I did. I can't wait for you to meet Patron Adele and the other professors. It was truly the most wonderful place. I loved every moment of it. Pax wished she was as confident about the entrance trials as Esmeralda was. While she'd been training for years, her grasp of magic wasn't to the level she thought it needed to be to pass. Pax, I see that look in your eyes. Magical ability is only one part of it. So what if your Merlin scores were low? Animalians isn't a high-phase kind of haul. 
Esmeralda tapped on her chest. You have what matters most, a willingness to try, and you have a heart as big as an ocean. Salty and moody, asked Pax, cocking a grin. Esmeralda let the corners of her plush lips rise slightly. You've been doing your finger and enunciation exercises, right? A mage is only as good as their digit dexterity and diction. All the phase in the world is useless if you can't make the gestures. Pax nodded, but covertly tested the spot where the owl thing had clamped its beak onto her hand. Her fingers were sore but not injured. Eleven benevolent elephants in red rolling wagons watching six sticky skeletons, said Pax, hoping she wouldn't ask for a demonstration of finger exercises. Esmeralda leaned her head back and laughed, then patted Pax on the shoulder. You need to get home. The last thing you need is more problems with your parents. Pax collected the owl thing, which had fallen asleep in the blanket, flexing her fingers beneath the covering. Thanks, Umam. Before Pax could leave, Esmeralda held up her hand. And remember, everyone gets through the trials in their own way. There's no one right answer. Use what you know best. Rush headlong into danger? Responded Pax with a smirk. Esmeralda tilted her head and pursed her lips. You know what I mean. Be yourself, your best version of yourself. As Pax pushed through the exit with the bundle of owl thing in her arms, she yelled out over her shoulder, but what if I don't know what that means? Chapter 2 Pax missed the max light rail by 20 seconds, which pushed her even later than normal. So when she finally made it to her stop, holding the owl thing against her chest, Pax ran eight blocks to the two-story Victorian with stained glass windows that she unfortunately had to call home. Her legs were screaming by the time she got to the little corner lot. She ducked under the vine-covered trellis, heading straight for the shed. She used her elbow to slide the door open, then followed up that maneuver by grabbing the string connected to the light with her teeth. The light clicked on, revealing a 15 by 20 shed filled with cages and boxes. Dozens of pairs of eyes appeared upon her arrival. She made the owl thing a nest in a box with strips of cloth. The little critter nestled into the bedding until she couldn't see it. Before she left, Pax took out a black marker and wrote owl thing on the cardboard so she didn't forget what was in the box. One time she almost freed a basilisk when she thought it was a pseudo pixie instead. Halfway out the door, she glanced one last time into the shed before clicking off the light. She'd expected to find Callie in the shed. That she wasn't there meant that she was out hunting, since she usually liked to sleep in the daytime. As she shut the door, a ruckus went up in the house. Even from across the yard, the throwing of pots into the kitchen sink and subsequent screaming was unmistakable. It was tempting to return to the relative quiet of her makeshift veterinary infirmary, but it was nearing dinner time, and if she was any later, it would be much, much worse. Pax blew out a cleansing breath before crossing through the garden. The olfactory enchantment was wearing off, but Baba's coneflowers, abelias and geraniums filled her nose with floral resolve before she had to face her parents' nightly rage. Pax headed down the carpeted hallway, glancing at her childhood pictures gracing the wall. The pale streak in her hair hadn't always been there. It had showed up after the bad thing. She touched her hair at the same time she remembered that she had blood all over her sleeve. Before her parents saw her, Pax ducked into the bathroom and turned the water on hot, waiting until it was steaming before shoving her sleeve in. The hot water turned her skin bright red as she scrubbed away the blood. When the sleeve was a dark blotch, she switched the water to a cooler temperature and threw some on her face, wiping away the mascara that had smeared beneath her eyes. Esmeralda had deemed it necessary to practice her smoky eye treatment on her, while they were waiting for the baby ghost vipers to wake for their ectoplasm feeding. While she worked at cleaning up, a new round of her mother's cursing erupted. Every slam of the cabinet made Pax flinch. With her sleeves pulled up to hide the wetness, she entered the kitchen which smelled like beef stew with cabbage. Where the hell have you been? asked her father, glowering from the table. Papers from his brokerage business were scattered over the table in neat piles. Pax was careful as she moved through the kitchen to start collecting plates, so as not to cause a breeze and upset the papers. At work, she said as neutrally as possible. You look blotchy, like you've been running. 
What kind of shit have you been stirring up? I know you Pax, I can see that goddamn plotting in your eyes, he said. Her mother, who was stirring a steaming pot, spoke over her shoulder. Black heart means black deeds. Pax ignored the glares and continued into the dining room to set the plates. Her grandmother was sitting in the living room, carving a piece of bone with a sharp knife. Her eyes rounded with sympathy. Pax threw up one shoulder in response, as if to say that she was used to it. Whatcha makin' Baba? she asked her grandmother. Baba held up the hunk of curved bone, eyes sparkling at it. This old thing? It ain't completely decided if it's a mermaid or a narwhal, but I'll keep working until it tells me. I bet it's a narwhal, said Pax. Hush you, said Baba with a wink. I like to be surprised. The best ones always work that way. If it weren't for her grandmother, Pax might have run away a long time ago. The only thing that had been keeping her in the house was that Baba had said she'd sponsor her for a trip to the Hundred Halls, the only magical university in the world, to take the trials of magic to see if she qualified for entry. Pax had turned 17 a couple of months ago, which meant she could finally take the tests. It would require a trip to the city of Invictus on the East Coast. There was no way her parents would pay for it, but Baba had been selling her scrimshaw pieces at the Portland Art Show for years to collect the funds. With the table set, Pax hurried into the kitchen to help. She tried to stir the stew, but her mother slapped her hand away. I didn't tell you to fuss with it. You'd probably just screw it up. Yes, mother, said Pax, keeping her gaze lowered. Before she could move away, her mother grabbed her sleeve. What did you do? Your sleeve is wet. Is there blood on this? Who did you hurt? Her mother's gray hair fell into her face as she leered at Pax. I didn't hurt anybody, she said, even though she knew it was a lie. Her whole middle tightened, as if she'd been clamped into a vice. Sandy, leave her alone, said Baba, who had come into the kitchen. She stepped between them, giving Pax a chance to slip away. Fine, if you don't want me to find out why your granddaughter has blood on her sleeve, said her mother as she ladled beef stew into a bowl, slopping broth onto the counter. See? Look what you made me do. Pax touched the scar on her chin, the one from the bad thing. She couldn't really remember what had happened, because it had happened when she was young, or so she thought. She had a strong suspicion that it had to do with why her parents thought she was always causing trouble, but no one, not even Baba, would explain. Everyone took their spots at the table. Pax kept her head down, taking care not to scrape the spoon against the bowl so as not to set off her parents. She was halfway finished eating her stew when Baba cleared her throat. I trust you both remember that Pax will be flying to Invictus this weekend for the Merlin trials, asked Baba. Her mother's face flashed with anger before resolving into spite. Lot of good it will do her. Never heard of a child more prone to destruction than that one. She'll probably bring the whole damn university down on her. Sandy, said Baba, pounding her fist on the table. Enough. I know you can't control yourself. She took a big, cleansing breath as her eyes rounded with a mixture of sadness and resolve. But stop picking on your daughter. Pax kept as still as possible. She felt like a mouse in a field waiting for the hawk to pass over. Because her grandmother never failed to defend her, Pax couldn't understand why she argued for her to stay in the house. Family was only a word. Her father, Edwin, leaned on his elbow, spoon sticking out of his fist. If you want to waste your money on the child, Ellie, you go ahead. We could do with a break without her, and maybe we'll be lucky enough that she passes, though I seriously doubt it. Pax placed her hands flat on the table beside the plate and bowl. Her soup was only half eaten. May I be excused from the table? she asked. Her parents shared a glance before her mother tilted her head with a little shake, rolling her eyes slightly. Oh, how will we miss your sparkling conversation? Head ducked, Pax carried her plate bowl and silverware into the kitchen. The murmuring continued without her, but being outside of the room allowed her to breathe again. She was headed to the shed to check on the owl thing when Baba appeared at the back door. I'm sorry Pax that you have to deal with that, said Baba. Pax sniffed, wiping at her eyes. 
I don't know why we couldn't have just left, me and you. It's almost like they don't even know I'm their kid. Baba's eyes rounded. She put her hand on Pax's arm and gave it a squeeze. Darling Pax, I assure you that you are their child, but the events in this house have never been typical, said Baba. I swear to you they can't help it. Pax looked at her shoes. Yeah yeah the bad thing that you won't tell me about. Pax you didn't do a bad thing. I wish you would get that out of your head, said Baba. Then why won't you tell me, asked Pax. Baba reached out and cupped her chin upward, until she was forced to look into her grandmother's soft brown eyes. I'll tell you next April on your birthday. I swear it. Then you'll understand. All this pain and suffering that you've endured will make sense. Pax. You are a strong, strong girl. That you have thrived under these circumstances, that you have given back, between your little veterinary clinic and the volunteer work at the zoo, I couldn't be more proud, she said. I just wish they were proud of me, said Pax, tilting her head towards the kitchen. They will be someday, but not right now. I'm sorry this is such a hard road for you. It breaks my heart that you have to travel this path, but you've done it with your head held high. You could have made things worse, much much worse, but you've done as I asked and done your best not to upset them. I know it's been hard for you, because you're a girl that fixes things when you see something wrong. Hearing Baba speak about her like that, took a weight off her shoulders. A kernel of pride at her earlier defense of the owl thing in the woods warmed her middle. Thanks Baba, I needed to hear that. Pax threw her arms around her grandmother. Though she was rail thin, she had a strength and solidity to her like she'd been built with steel. When she pulled away, Baba kissed her on the forehead and touched her nose with her forefinger. Three days Pax Nygaard, said Baba, letting her Scandinavian accent color her words. In three days, you'll fly in a steel bird to the city of sorcery and take your rightful place in the halls of magic. Chapter 3 After Baba went back to the kitchen to finish her dinner, Pax left the house, crossing through the garden in the twilight with thoughts of the hundred halls racing through her mind. For a long time she'd thought that the day would never come, or that something would happen that would keep her from going. But she had her one-way flight booked. She couldn't afford a hotel, so she'd arrive the morning of the Merlin trials. Once she was at the university for the testing, she wouldn't have to worry about lodging. If she didn't pass, she didn't know what she would do. But until then, she had to get her friends ready for the time when she wouldn't be there to care for them. Most of them were healthy enough to leave on their own, but a few of them, like the owl thing, she'd take to Esmeralda on Friday. Mind busy with plans for the future, Pax didn't register that the light in the shed was on until she'd stepped inside. Logan stood over the owl thing's box with a bowie knife in his fist. He'd cleaned the blood off his face, but his shirt still had stains around the collar. The rage pulsing across his forehead turned his eyes dark. Close the door, said Logan. And if you so much as even squeak, I'll put my blade through your little friend. Pax turned around completely to close the door so she could check for anything nearby that would help her with Logan, but she kept a neat clinic, so any potential weapons like scissors or knives were put away in their drawers. That's better, he said, twitching and glancing around as if he expected an attack from every angle. What do you want, she asked. You made a fool of me, said Logan. Pax lifted one shoulder. No one saw. Logan glanced down. I know, he said with venom. She almost felt sorry for him. She could see the misplaced rage in his bones, the emotions bottled up with nowhere to put them. He probably had a father who lectured him about the importance of being a man, emphasized with a fist. Or maybe he had no father at all. Beneath the hate and the violence, he was probably scared. It was why he'd come here, because he didn't know how to rectify the person he thought he was with the one that deep down inside, he wanted to be. She almost felt sorry for him. Almost. He'd threatened her friends. Any pity she felt drained away. I don't know what happened to you, but I'm not going to participate in your delusions of power. You made a big mistake when you stepped into my shed. You might be thinking, but why, this girl doesn't have a weapon in her hand. But you're standing in a room full of weapons. 
Some of my animal's friends are cute and cuddly, but others, not so much. Logan's head snapped to the right as the mated Baliangs clacked their tongues, probably expecting that it was feeding time. The bat-like creatures were benignly supernatural with the ability to turn their bodies as black as the night, but Logan wouldn't know that. What was that? he asked, shifting the point of his knife in the Baliang's direction. The fearsome Baliang, the vampire bat of the Australian outback. They're impervious to metal and can only be hurt by bone weapons and can suck out a liter of blood a minute, she said. Bullshit, I'm not an idiot, he said, though his face was screwed up. You're making that up. Maybe I am, but how are you going to know, she said. But I can tell you that you'd better be ready to kill every last one of us, because if you put even one scratch on one of my friends, you're not walking out of here alive. Shut up. Why do you keep talking? said Logan, shaking his knife at her. I promise you, if you want this to end, I'll open the door and step aside and you can leave. No harm, no foul. Your choice, said Pax. Logan's face contorted with anger. Screw you, screw this, said Logan, holding his knife back over the Althing's box. You hurt me, now I'm going to hurt you. Pax's heart nearly stopped when she realized that he'd called her bluff, again. The soft clicks of claws on metal sounded from high above, bringing a measure of relief. She hadn't just been bluffing. She'd also been delaying, hoping that Callie would sense her distress and return from her hunt. A bit of shadow moved behind the cages and boxes. Pax kept her gaze on Logan. As Callie neared, Pax prepared to strike. She didn't know exactly what the little thoracic fox would do, since their psychic connection only worked with intention and emotion but she knew Callie would give a signal right before. Callie's bushy black tail rose above the Adarna cage briefly, then a pair of golden eyes peered out of the shadows. The tang of sharp lemon filled Pax, a warning that it had begun. Pax saw the results when Logan's eyes became unfocused. He shook his head, as if that would remove the visions that Callie was projecting into his mind. Hey! What have you done? I can't see. While Logan slashed his knife around in frantic defense, Pax dropped down and reached underneath the workbench where she knew a 2 by 4 resided. It had a notch in the end, so she could carry the cages of dangerous animals at a distance. Pax stepped to the side and lifted the 2 by 4 to hit Logan's arm so he would drop the knife, but he must have heard her because he snapped his head in her direction and rushed her before she could bring it down. She got out of the way of the knife, which slammed into a bench, levering the weapon from his hand, but his shoulder charge knocked the wind out of her. Before she could scramble away, he wrapped his arms around her midsection, lifting her up in a bare hug, then slammed her down, using his body weight to drive her into the ground. The impact knocked stars into her eyes, and she tried to scramble away. Pax kicked and squirmed, giving it everything she had to escape, but Logan was bigger and stronger, so she dug her fingers into his eye sockets. When he shifted to protect his face, she spun her hips enough to knee him between the legs. After a low groan she managed to scramble away, but he was up on his feet at the same time, and somehow he had the two by four in his hands. Get out of my mind you crazy bitch! What's going on? Screamed Logan as he swung the board around indiscriminately, still in a low crouch from her knee blow. Callie was probably projecting awful images into his head, making it appear he was being flayed by demons or more horrific scenes, but it wasn't slowing him down, only making him more frantic. Logan knocked the Balayang enclosure off its hook to crash onto the table. The bat squeaked and flew around the mesh cage, turning Matt black in reflexive defense. Stop hurting my friends, said Pax as she shifted on the balls of her feet, watching him for his next move. He growled, his face rippling with fear, and raised the board above his head. She saw the trajectory of his swing. He would smash the owl thing, so Pax leapt in the way, trying to catch the board before it hit her in the face. There was a loud crack as the board hit her fingers with considerable force. Pain shot through her arm as her mind flashed red. A moment later, Logan screamed again, but this time it was because Callie had leapt upon his neck, raking his back with her claws. She must have released the vision, because he ran straight for the door, slipping through it as Callie leapt away, leaving Pax in the shed, cradling her injured hand. Callie bounded over to her, and placed her front paws on Pax's leg as she sat in the dirt of the shed. 
The thoracic fox looked like a miniature silver fox with black-gray fur. Callie's normally black eyes had turned reddish. She licked Pax's chin, adding a little wine in the back of her throat. Pax looked down at her left hand, which had taken the brunt of the hit. Her pinky and ring fingers were already swelling up. Squeezing them only brought pain. She didn't want to know if they were broken, not with the trials only a few days away. It was going to be hard enough to pass the trials already, but now with an injured hand it felt impossible. Pax squeezed her eyes shut, leaning her head against the shelf. Above her the balayangs had quieted down, but she could hear soft squeaking from the owl thing. When Callie bumped her head against her shoulder, Pax opened her eyes. I hope your hunt went well, said Pax, trying not to think about her hand. Pictures of mice appeared in Pax's mind, along with the flavor of coppery blood in the back of her throat. That's great, said Pax, mustering a broken smile. The thoracic fox tilted her head, whined, and nudged Pax's injured hand. It might be broken, said Pax. If the tickets and everything hadn't already been paid for, I'd wait until next year, but I have to go, even if it means I'm probably going to fail. I don't regret protecting the owl thing, but why did it have to be my fingers? I should have let him hit me in the head. A sense of warmth and sweetness emanated from Callie. The mental signature was like biting into a cherry pie, fresh out of the oven. Thanks Callie, I appreciate the feeling, Pax said as she climbed to her feet, careful not to use her injured hand. She closed and locked the door, not that she thought Logan would come back, but it gave her peace of mind, and she needed to focus on something positive after what had happened. Let's start getting everything ready for this weekend. We have to put together the records for the ones headed to the zoo. The others we can release. After Pax bandaged her fingers together, she and Callie went through each cage and box. If the animal inside had recovered, they freed it. If not, they prepared the container for travel. Pax did the heavy work, lifting, sorting, and gathering the foods. Callie used her psychic ability to calm the creatures before they were released back into the wild. This was particularly important for the Adarna bird, which could, under the right circumstance, turn parts of her flesh to stone. It wasn't as bad as a medusa, but Pax had no desire to go through life with the tip of her nose as hard as a rock. Callie kept the Adarna bird oblivious to her surroundings until the cage was opened outside the shed. The bird, which had long colorful plumage, climbed to the top of the cage before spreading its wings and leaping into the night sky. Late in the night, after they were finished, Callie hopped on Pax's shoulder as she crept into the sleeping house. She made it to her room without further incident. The day had been crazy enough. Settled under her covers, Pax tried to fall asleep, but her fingers ached and the worry that she wouldn't be able to pass the Merlin trials left her wide awake. Callie, on the other hand, curled up in the crook of Pax's arm and snored softly, furry body rising and falling slowly, as if it had been an uneventful day. Staring at the ceiling, caressing her injured fingers, Pax spoke aloud. One good thing, I saved the owl thing. A thing I would do better. Next time take the board to the head. She chuckled. And what do I hope for tomorrow? She bit her lower lip. I hope my freaking fingers get better. Pax sighed. I'm going to the hundred halls, and I'm going to pass my Merlin trials, and when I get into Animalians, things will be different. Things will be better. Baba said so, and I believe her. Callie stirred, one eye opening slightly, followed by a snort. Okay, little one. I'll sleep now. In a few days I go to the hundred halls. I get to start my new life, I hope. Pax inhaled until her chest was bursting with air. After a long slow release, she spoke one last time before letting sleep claim her. Tomorrow things will be better. Chapter 4 When Pax woke on Saturday morning, the day she would leave for the halls, she felt refreshed and ready, even if two of her fingers could only bend halfway down. To her immense surprise, neither of her parents made a single rude comment while she was eating breakfast. She didn't even have the normal tension that came with being in their presence, always anticipating a put-down. When it came time to leave, Baba had to remind them to say goodbye. Try not to kill anyone, said her mother without looking up from her cell phone. 
Her father frowned. You don't really look like a potential mage. Bye, I'll see you next summer I hope, said Pax, but by then they'd returned their attention to their cell phone and newspaper respectively, leaving her and Baba to walk out of the house in relative peace. The bus was a minute late, which had Pax bouncing and pacing, but when it arrived Baba gave her a sweet smile. Pax put her head on her grandmother's shoulder the whole way, fiddling with the silver bracelet on her wrist, while Callie sat in her lap watching the city pass with an inquisitive expression. When they arrived at the airport, Pax felt dizzy. Her whole body ached. I can't believe I'm not going to see you for a whole year, said Pax, hugging Baba to her chest. Nine months to be exact, said Baba, pulling away and smiling wistfully. And when I get back. Before Pax could get the words out, Baba put her finger to her lips. Today's not the day for that kind of talk. You have a plane to catch. Be quick about it, I only had enough money for one flight, said Baba. With Callie on her shoulder, Pax backed away. Thank you Baba. Thank you for everything. Baba shook her wrinkled hand at her. Don't forget the paperwork for Callie. It's in your backpack, the front pocket, the letter with the seal. The next part of the journey was so new and unfamiliar, it simultaneously took forever and flew by. But eventually she found herself on the plane and in the air, Callie loved taking off. The five hours to travel across the country were the longest five hours of her life. When the pilot announced that they neared their destination, and that they should look out the windows at the city of Invictus, she had to thumb away a tear at the corner of her eye. Invictus, the city of sorcery, was named after its head patron, a man presumed dead due to his long absence. It was the jewel of the modern, magical world, a city west of New York and north of Philadelphia. The sprawling metropolis was made of thirteen wards, which circled the spire, the tallest structure in the world. With her face plastered against the window, engines rumbling and Callie asleep in her lap, it didn't even seem real it was so large. If she squinted, she could see tiny flashes of light in the air around the tower, the famed glass gondolas that rode on invisible gossamer lines. In a section of the city near the spire, right to the east, giant colorful shapes moved through the streets. That must be the second ward, Pax told Callie. All the world's best entertainers work there. Her furry companion poked her head up and tilted it at Pax before returning to her nap. Seeing the city from the sky made her face all tingly. She'd been sure that something would happen to keep her from attending, but now that she was about to arrive, her heart was so full she could hardly breathe. Baba had sent her with a packed lunch, but she'd been too excited the whole ride to eat it. Arrival in the airport was made easier by the papers Baba had printed out for her, telling her how to get to the train station that would take her to the spire. Callie rode on her shoulder, tail wrapped around her neck like a soft scarf. Pax was taller than most girls her age, so most people didn't notice Callie since their heads were down as they hurried to the next location. Plus, Callie could make herself unseen in large crowds. It didn't make her invisible, but it kept people from actively noticing her. When they sat in the train car, a little girl in a sparkly pink t-shirt with a Halls logo on the front stared at Callie the whole way. Are you a mage? asked the little girl. Layla dear, that's a rude question, said her mother, who'd been thumbing through her phone the moment before. I'm very sorry. No worries. I don't mind, Pax told the little girl's mother. Pax winked when the mother returned her focus to the cell phone screen. Not yet but hopefully soon. I'm headed to the spire for the Merlin trials, she said. The girl's eyes went wide with wonder. Awesome. Is that a fairy? No, this is Callie. She's a silver fox, nothing special, said Pax, receiving a sharp claw in the tender part of her neck. Pax chuckled under her breath. Callie hated when she told people she was only a silver fox, but since thoracic foxes were restricted animals, she had to lie. Oh, said the little girl as she returned to playing with the hem of her pink skirt. As the train rumbled through the city towards the spire, Pax studied the people as much as the little girl had studied her. Invictus had a higher concentration of supernatural creatures than anywhere else in the world, and while Pax was used to dealing with some of them due to her volunteer work in the Portland Magical Zoo, their existences were carefully controlled. 
Here, many roamed free or had been put to work in service of the city like the famed ghost taxis. Leaving the train station, the sights and sounds of the city hit her in full. The smells from a falafel vendor mixed with the diesel exhaust of a double-decker tourist bus wafted past. A man wearing a hat that put off a fountain of sparks carried an armful of glowing necklaces while shouting, Sparkman's good luck charms? Best charms in the third ward. Get him for a cool twenty bucks. What'd you think, Callie? asked Pax with a grin plastered on her face. Even the ache in her fingers couldn't dampen her good mood as she strolled through the city, absorbing the sights and sounds and smells. The best was yet to come, as she boarded the gondola for a ride across the city on invisible wires. The gondolas were reserved for staff and upperclassmen, except for the day of the Merlin trials when prospective mages were given a taste of what was to come. Looking down from the gondola, Pax was surprised at how much of the city was residential. She'd always had an image that it was like a giant magical bazaar, with trinket stores on every corner. It must be weird to live in such a place, she thought. Arriving in the spire, prospective mages were led down a long wide hall. Pax filled out a series of documents, which were mostly about giving up any rights of legal action should she be injured or killed. The papers were mostly redundant, as U.S. law gave the hundred halls immunity from legal action but the guy working that station told her it was a reminder of what she was signing up for before she entered. At the last station before she was allowed to enter the testing facility, Pax signed the tome of record using a quill and ink pot. Make sure you put a minimum of three halls on your list. After the trials, you can't be chosen by that hall unless you wrote it down in this tome, and if your final score isn't high, all the spots might be taken up by the time they come to you, said the woman at the station. Pax ignored the advice and wrote, The Society for the Understanding of Animals next to her name. She didn't care about being a mage unless she could be an animalians, and since Esmeralda was an alumni, she'd said she'd put in a good word with the selection team from the hall. The only thing Pax had left to do was to pass the Merlin trials. No easy feat considering it took most prospective students two tries if they passed at all, but Esmeralda had been helping her prepare for years. As she stepped up to the double doors leading to the testing chamber, the mage at the door motioned to Callie on her shoulders. No pets during the Merlin trials. Callie's just a silver fox, said Pax. The man shifted his mouth to the side as if he knew better. Silver fox or no, your Callie isn't allowed. But no worries, he said, breaking into a smile. We have a waiting area for furry and not-so-furry friends. Callie will be taken care of while you're testing. A young woman with frosty pink hair appeared from the side. She wore an animalian's pin, which was two hands, one human and one primate, holding each other. I can take Callie, said the girl, holding out her arm. Go ahead. Callie bounded from Pax's shoulder onto the girl's arm. Bye, little one. See you in a few days, said Pax, receiving a feeling of warmth and sunshine from the thoracic fox. Good luck, said the girl with pink hair as she walked away with Callie on her shoulder. The mage at the double doors motioned towards the big room beyond. You may enter the Trials of Magic. Chapter 5 The nervous energy in the welcome hall was enough to run a small city. Pax wandered around the area, which was three or four times larger than her high school gym, examining her competition for entrance into the hundred halls. She received a lot of anxious smiles as she passed the others. Everything was riding on the next few days, but she knew that some of them wouldn't even make it past the first hour. A platform sat at the center of the circular chamber. At locations around the outside wall, interspaced between the huge windows, large blank tapestries hung. Pax pushed her face against the glass, examining the city outside the spire. I've heard you can jump out a window and the building won't let you fall said a melodic voice nearby. Pax wasn't the only one standing by the window, but everyone had been doing so separately, so the comment caught her by surprise. Care to try? She quipped, cringing internally when she turned, finding that the speaker was an exceedingly handsome guy. He had tousled brown hair, sun-kissed skin that spoke of a life outdoors and a playful twinkle in his green eyes. I'm Liam, he said, offering a hand. There was no lack of confidence in his stance. 
He was the type that knew he was good-looking, but didn't go out of his way to show off. He wore faded jeans and a tan khaki shirt, rolled up at the sleeves. Though he looked scrubbed clean, she could almost smell the trail dust in his soul. And I'm here for the trials, said Pax, keeping her arms crossed but the corner of her lips raised. He laughed, a warm sound that made her regret her standoffishness. Liam placed his hands into the back pockets of his jeans. Just trying to make friends, said Liam. You know, there are parts of the trials that require teamwork. Pax raised an eyebrow. We have to get through the first part before the team events, and even then, we don't even know how the game will be structured. He pulled a hand out of his back pocket and caressed the glass, a gesture that annoyed her only because it was way more effective than she would have liked. But if we get placed on the same team, we'll already have some good chemistry. He let out a short laugh, raising one shoulder in a half shrug. But what am I saying? You'll have guys and gals falling all over themselves to be on your team. Warmth rose to her cheeks so she rolled her eyes. Pax was saved from further embarrassment, by a professor on center stage asking everyone to gather. Good luck. She hesitated before she turned away, instantly aware that she would regret it if she didn't say something. If we make it to the third round, I'll look out for you. Pax stood in the throng, shoulder to shoulder with the other potential initiates. The woman on the stage looked like a dressed-down version of Marilyn Monroe, with stark white hair tamed with a small red ribbon and only a hint of ruby coloring to her lips. Good morning. I am Instructor Penny Whistle from the Academy of the Subtle Arts, said the instructor, adding a girlish curtsy that brought laughter and a few whistles. Today you will be attempting to pass the first test of the Merlin Trials. There will be three total, an individual trial, a partnered contest, and a group free-for-all. While there are thousands of you here today, only a small fraction will pass. Some of you will fail outright, others will give up in the face of danger, yes I see your faces, you all think you won't, but at least a third will drop out, and an unfortunate few will lose their lives in the trials. While this may seem cruel and capricious, know that your life as a mage will be far more dangerous than these trials. A clean death is the safest failure mode for a mage. Some consequences will haunt unprepared mages for many lifetimes. A murmur traveled through the potential initiates. Everyone knew the stories about mages that had gone mad, turned themselves inside out with the wrong word, or trapped themselves in a demi-plane for all time. I would bore you further with warnings about the chances of you making it through the trials, but let's be honest, this will not dissuade you because you've made the important step of coming to the city of Invictus and writing your name in the Tome of Records. The rest will depend on how prepared and lucky you are. Pax held her two injured fingers, tentatively flexing them, but they could only bend halfway. Not that lucky. Before you can begin your trials, you must temporarily link yourselves to one of our patrons. This will protect you from the phase, the dangerous energy that powers our magics, during your trials. Today you will bind yourselves to the patron of the Royal Society of Illustrious Artificers, or what everyone likes to call tinkers. May I introduce Gracie Longfellow, said Instructor Pennywhistle as she extended her hand in a flourishing bow. Appearing from the crowd was a woman with sculpted auburn hair, wearing an aviator military uniform, as if she were performing for the USO during World War II. Pax heard a guy mutter from behind her, pretty hot for being over a hundred. Patron Longfellow held up her hand, silencing the crowd. She looked over the people, with an air of arrogant concern. Welcome potential students. I see so many smiling, excited faces here today. That will change soon enough. By this time tomorrow, if you are still here, there will be a different mood present. Dare I say quite sullen, so enjoy this while you can. These might be your last moments. If I have unnerved you, or if at a later time you feel you cannot continue, you may leave at any time by going to the rune doors, placing both hands on them and saying I am defeated three times. You will not be missed. Patron Longfellow waited to see if anyone made a move towards the door. The pause brought a wave of unexpected anxiety to Pax as she cradled her injured hand. Am I an idiot for attempting this? She looked back to the door, halfway wishing at least one person would leave and simultaneously wishing the opposite too. 
She looked around to see a lot of inwardly contemplating expressions, which gave her a bit of resolve that she wasn't the only one having doubts, but she mostly just wished that Callie was on her shoulder providing a comforting presence. Okay then. It seems I will be your patron for the trials. So open yourself to your magic, let it collect into your fist and hold it up high. When you feel the tingling in your arm, pull the phase back inside of you like sucking in a breath of icy cold air. Do not let go. It will feel uncomfortable for a little while. Once the link is there, and you will know when it is, you may put your hand down. Please start. As if it were the encore of a concert, thousands of fists hit the air. Pax put her right fist up, letting the phase trickle into her mind, which took coaxing because she was used to holding it back for fear of corrupting her mind. Pax waited for the connection to form. It started with a tingle in her fingers, which she wanted to shake out, as if she'd let her hand fall asleep, but she kept them closed and pulled the magic into her, and when she felt the icy warmth in the base of her skull, she held it. The wait lasted forever. It was like squeezing an ice cube in her fist. But then the cold dissipated, and warmth bubbled up from her midsection, followed by a wave of pleasure that brought a gasp to her lips. The unexpected end resulted in a round of laughter, and Pax joined in. As she looked across the crowd, she happened to catch Liam's gaze and he stared back, adding a wink for good measure. Afterwards about fifteen fists remained in the air, to which patron Goodfellow added, those of you who failed to follow directions please come forward. Once they had gathered, she made a few elaborate finger gestures, and a list of names appeared on blank tapestries around the walls. Next to each name was the same number, minus two hundred. Unfortunately, those of you who could not follow these simple directions have been docked 200 points. The good part is that only a small few of you were incapable, but that also means that the competition might be particularly fierce this year. As you compete in the trials, you will be scored. Your scores will be recorded on the tapestries. If you do not meet the minimum cutoff at the end of each round, you will be released. If your score is too low to reach the upper third, you will be released. And last, the lower your score, the less of a chance you will be selected by your desired hall or even at all. Patron Goodfellow paused. Good luck. You're going to need it. The crowd around the dais dispersed. Pax rubbed the back of her head, right at the base of her skull, where the part of her mind that generated phase ached slightly. She was so focused on the strangeness that she didn't realize who she was standing directly across from until he spat on the ground towards her shoes. It was Logan. Chapter 6 The sinking hole in her gut and the rage in her head combined to pull her apart. He stared her down, a self-satisfied smirk on his lips. Pax tensed up when he strolled over to her. Logan bore no signs of their battles. In fact, he looked more fit and hale than during their previous encounter, which suggested that he had magical enhancements for the trials, which was technically illegal, but since it usually meant they were kids of alumni, there was little incentive to check. How's that hand, sweetheart? asked Logan, cocking his head to the side. I seem to recall a loud crack when that board hit them. Just fine, said Pax, holding out her right hand and flexing her fingers. Logan raised an eyebrow and glanced to her left hand. Care to do that with your other one? Before she could respond, a couple of names went up on the tapestries. Logan raised his head. Sorry, but I guess I get to go first, which means this will be the last time I have to see you, whatever your name is, he said as he headed towards the double doors on the other side of the circular room. After he left, she checked the board, cursing under her breath when she saw his full name. Logan Lovelace. The son of the zoo's benefactor, Alfred Lovelace. Now that she knew they were related, she could see the resemblance. Pax cursed her bad luck not that she would have done anything differently. You okay? You look like you're going to punch someone, said Liam, wandering up from the crowd. Ran into someone I know, she said. Liam cocked an easy smile. Maybe the trials will take care of him for you. Dark thoughts, said Pax, wrinkling her forehead. Liam shrugged. Yet I can guess that thought crossed your mind. I wouldn't be lucky enough that he would fail, she said. He looks like he's been enhanced, and he's probably been well prepared for the trials. 
which means he's going to be a problem on the third test. Liam narrowed his gaze. Still interested in teaming up then? Pax laughed and stared at her shoes. Of course. I was before too, I'm just not great with people. He screwed up his face. You? A single wink and you could knock down half this place. Think about it. You and I should be working together to recruit a good team. Pax rolled her eyes. Whether or not that's true, it's just what I look like. I could be a complete asshole, a horrible person. You just wanted to team up because you think I'm attractive. I mean, he said, gesturing towards them both, that is true but it was more because you seemed both confident and cautious. Also, your whole I'm not aware of my own hotness vibe is well, hot. There was a whole speech in her head, one that she'd given before about looks being like the fur on a mammal which people just wanted to skin and display like a trophy, so hotness was a poor judge of who someone was. Especially given the bad thing. But after opening her mouth to spout her beliefs, she realized that for the sake of passing the trial just this once, she would shut her damn mouth. Fine, she said. While there's no guarantee that either one of us will make it to the third trial, it would be prudent to start working towards that goal. Liam spread his hands wide. Exactly. So how about you take that side of the auditorium, and I'll take this side? Pax forced herself to smile, which she knew came out like she had bad gas. Sounds like a plan. But then a new list of names went up on the tapestry, and right at the top was hers. Pax Nygaard. When she sighed, Liam followed her gaze to the board and shot her a wink. See you on the other side. You too, she said, holding back the fear that she would throw up before she reached the door. All eyes were on the half-dozen potentials walking towards the trial area. When she worked at the zoo, her bland uniform and the thrill of the supernatural animals kept her relatively anonymous, but walking across the room with everyone watching made her stomach feel like she'd eaten two pounds of cookie dough. Pax reached the door first, and it opened without her touching it. For a moment, her right leg wouldn't move forward, but then she surged through the door and into a circular room with six obsidian archways. A digital display showing a name was above each archway. Pax went to hers, where she was greeted by a heavy girl in a black bodysuit who had a long black braid over her shoulder. She looked like she could punch through a wall. Welcome, Pax. This is the first trial. You must complete the test as quickly as you can, but if at any time you wish to give up, simply shoot a five-element spell, any of them into the air and yell, I surrender, said the girl mage. What happens if I'm unconscious, asked Pax. After a certain time, we come through and retrieve you. Assuming of course that you're still alive, said the girl, far too nonchalantly for Pax's taste. The mage handed Pax a roll of parchment sealed with wax, which had the double H symbol for the halls pressed into it, and a small empty vial. These are available for your use during the trial. Everything else depends on you. Enter when you are ready, she said. Pax glanced to the other archways. Two of the others had already entered their trials. She took a step towards her entrance, then pulled back right before she crossed the glimmering threshold. What happens if I make it through the trial, but come out injured on the other side? Do I carry that injury through the next two parts? Pax asked. The girl squished her mouth to the side. The infirmary will deal with any minor injuries incurred during the trials. Of course, if it takes longer than a day to fix, you'll be out, but at least you'll be alive. Thanks, said Pax, approaching the archway with trepidation. Before her was the hall's famed teleportation system. She was a little nervous about having her body thrown somewhere else through the power of magic, but she figured that if she became a mage, this would be the least strange thing that would happen to her. When she stepped through the shimmering field, a world of darkness and cold consumed her for a heartbeat and then. Chapter 7 The sheer whiteness of her landing spot made Pax throw out her hands, thinking she was falling through a pale sky. She dropped to her knees on the hard floor just to get a sense of place. Wherever she was, it was so white, so blank, there was no visual clue to grab a hold of. Looking beyond a few feet gave her vertigo. What the hell is this place? Pax spun around, finding no archway behind her and nothing but blankness. 
She regretted the motion, because as she turned back to what she thought was the front, she worried that she might have overcorrected, and for some reason she thought that knowing where she was at was important. Hello? Has there been a mistake? Did I get dropped into the wrong place? She called out. A slight echo returned, which at least told her there were walls ahead. Esmeralda had told her the first test usually involved a maze, various obstacles that you had to bypass, and a supernatural creature or two. Pax pulled out the two items she'd been given, broke the wax seal on the parchment, and unrolled the chunky paper which contained a complex spell. There was no description for the spell, but the finger gestures and timing signals for the manual part would be impossible with her injured hand. One of the finger articulations involved crossing the fourth and fifth digits over each other in a twin snake embrace. She had the impression the spell involved pacifying something or someone, but since she didn't stand a chance of casting it successfully, she rolled it back up and jammed it into her back jeans pocket. The vial, as she first thought, contained nothing. At least it was plastic, so she didn't fear breaking the glass. Pax shoved it into her front pocket. Pax edged forward with her hands out like a blind girl, afraid there might be a hidden pit or other traps. She shuffled ahead, squinting and rotating, checking for the sudden appearance of danger. The shock in her fingertips felt like touching a metal door handle in the winter after walking across plush carpet. When the tingle hit her hand, translucent walls appeared for a brief moment. What the, she said. An invisible maze, huh? This should be interesting. Pax flexed her hands, stretching her fingers as much as possible. Of the five elements, water had no finger gestures that utilized the fourth and fifth digits on her left hand. Pax adjusted her position, aiming further down the path where she thought no walls had appeared, then she made the gestures for water summoning phase to her mind. A jet of water shot from her hand, arcing across the gap and splattering against an invisible wall. To her surprise, even though the water had been far from her when it hit, she received a small shock like the first. It made her grit her teeth. Home can't avoid the shock, said Pax. I guess they don't want us to fumble our way through the maze. She edged forward, judging her steps based on the mental map she constructed when the walls appeared again. She was able to make it two meters ahead, before she lost confidence that she wouldn't run into a wall. Girding herself for the pain, Pax sent out another jet of water in the direction she thought the passage would allow her. The liquid splashed at an angle, catching a wall, a corner, and a second wall. The shock hit as expected but at least only once. That one felt harder, she said, shaking her head and rubbing her jaw. Pax made it another meter before her shoulder brushed the right wall, knocking her back. Fuck, she said, rubbing her upper arm where the shock had slammed into her. Okay, that one hurt, a lot. Before moving from her spot, she took a small step to the left to position herself in the middle of the path. Then she sat down on the ground, crossing her legs. All right, how am I going to pass through this stupid invisible maze without electrocuting myself, said Pax, leaning her elbows on her knees. Her mental library of useful spells was rather limited. While she knew the five elements, basic spells involving personal protection and a few other odds and ends that Esmeralda had taught her, nothing came to mind to solve this problem. This is stupid, said Pax. I can't even get past the first obstacle. She imagined the other mages flying through the maze using elaborate spells. She didn't even know what those could be, she just imagined them making arcane gestures, flinging themselves to the end, then throwing their hands up ta-da. Pax sat cross-legged in the middle of the invisible maze for what seemed like forever, but since the trial was being timed, every second felt like a minute. Be yourself, said Pax sarcastically, thinking about Esmeralda's advice as she shook her head. Ha! Huh. I'd be better off if I were a rat. As soon as she said it, she had an idea. The hypersensing spell she used for finding the phantom snakes in the herpetarium would increase her senses. While the maze was invisible, maybe there were other clues available. She fumbled the spell three times due to her stiff fingers, and because Esmeralda had usually cast the spell before finally completing it successfully. The smell of lingering phase, like ozone in a lightning storm, tickled her nose first. She had to parse the odors, 
sifting through the more extreme smell of leftover magic before she found the sharp scent beneath. It was like a mix of lemon and chili powder. As she moved her head to the right and left, the smell grew and retreated, which suggested there was a specific trail. Okay, she said. Maybe I can do this. Crawling on her hands and knees to keep her nose to the forefront like a rat, Pax sniffed her way forward, rotating her head back and forth like a radar confirming the location of the marker smell. The hardest part was making the turns, because she always felt like she was going to rotate her feet into the wall, but she managed to avoid getting another shock as she worked her way through the maze. After a while her knees hurt from shuffling across the hard surface, and then her neck added its ache from keeping it faced up. Now I know why rats are built like they are, said Pax. When she got to the end, the sea of white faded away, replaced with a field of thick grass. By the time Pax got to her feet, she was standing amid waist-high grains. Turning around revealed only more field, and not the exit to the maze like she thought she'd find. Before she could even consider what the next challenge might be, a soul-rending scream from somewhere not far ahead in the golden field made her crouch behind the grasses for safety. Chapter 8 A chill passed through Pax as the insubstantial being floated past her hiding spot. While she'd handled all manner of dangerous supernatural creatures in the zoo, tending the baby basilisks with their cute little scaled rumps, feeding the death-head snakes, or cleaning out the cages of the dream-eating Baku, Pax knew nothing about the incorporeal world. She rose above the grasses to get a good look at what she was dealing with, but a second scream tore through her, leaving Pax cowering in the dirt. When the effects of the fear had passed, she punched the soft ground, ripping away the stalks, revealing grubs and worms right beneath the surface. Staying low to the ground, Pax crept through the grasses, making her way to the right in hopes of circumventing the obstacle. She felt the being before she saw it, a cold shiver passing through her. Above the grains, an insubstantial woman in a see-through scarf carrying a bushel stared down at her. What the hell am I supposed to do? Pax asked. She pulled out the vial and the parchment. The empty container gave her no clues, while the spell seemed unlikely that it was meant for the ghost. The ghost's eerie dead gaze left Pax frozen in her tracks as she waited for it to make the next move. The ghost turned into a blast of psychic energy, clothes rippling to ribbons, arms outstretched, fingers like knives, until Pax's heart stopped. The sheer terror overwhelmed her, leaving her curled into a ball, a force like a hand squeezing her heart leaving her gasping as she dug her fingers into the loamy soil. Pax passed out, her face skipping off the rough grass as she fell face forward into the dirt. She woke to tingling in her hands and legs, but the ache in her chest had relaxed enough she could rock back to her butt, finding that across her skin, black tendrils like ink had been dyed into the flesh of her arms. The black veins looked suspiciously like poison, not that it mattered since she had no way to cleanse it, nor did she think the normal methods that she might use if she'd been bitten in the herpetarium would work. No, the only thing she realized would save her now would either be to finish the trial or surrender and give up her shot at the hundred halls. At least my fingers don't hurt anymore. She laughed as the pain coursing through her arms made them stiff. The ghostly peasant woman had floated away, leaving Pax in a heap of agony, but she didn't think she would stay away forever. She was probably waiting for the poison to take hold, soften her up for a gummy ghostly crunch. Time had been her enemy before, as the first trial was timed and her placement mattered for making it into the university, but now the seconds mattered for more than a test. Baba always said I was bullheaded, let's show her she was right, said Pax, struggling to her feet like a newborn foal as waves of pain rocked her. As soon as she pointed herself in the direction of the exit, she lowered her head and ran through the grasses, which flayed her tender skin with rough stalks, and threatened to trip her at every step as if the field itself hated her. She felt like she was about to fall on her face, and before she'd made it halfway, the ghost woman shrieked and sped after her. Pax didn't slow nor falter as she rushed headlong across the field, screaming as she went, her voice rising as high as the ghosts. Pax barely glanced up, only enough to keep herself on target, even as the ghost lashed at her back, ripping holes in her shirt, slicing skin. When the ghost appeared in her way, arms stretched, mouth a cavernous display of teeth, Pax dove through the incorporeal midsection, the cold like being plunged beneath an icy lake and flew through the archway. For a brief moment, Pax thought she'd escaped to safety, 
until she skipped off the top of a bramble bush and landed in the mud not three meters before an enormous manticore with its spiked tail raised for striking. Chapter 9 The manticore at the Portland Supernatural Zoo was a smallish version. It had had half its wings ripped off by hunters, and so its bat-like appendages only looked menacing. But even knowing that it wasn't a fully functioning version, Esmeralda had warned her never to underestimate the creature. The manticore crouched before her was twice as large as the one in the zoo, with its leathery wings stretched wide while the scorpion tail arched above its back. The lion head stretched its fierce mouth, and the roar made the shriek of the ghost a whimper in comparison. Pax felt the manticore's voice in her gut, and had she no experience with the sound of the creature, she might have stayed nailed to the spot, but her time in the zoo had taught her what was coming next. Pax scrambled in a reverse crab walk as the manticore flung spikes into the spot where she'd just been a moment ago. The four-inch bone shards stuck into the mud. A bramble bush at the back of the enclosure provided a temporary barrier. Pax tore her shirt and ripped chunks out of her arm climbing through the angry foliage, but the pain was worth having something, even a sticker bush, between her and the manticore. Kneeling behind the leafy plant, Pax took stock of her situation. She was muddy, covered in gashes, shirt half-shredded, arms veined with inky black lines. The parchment in her back pocket had been destroyed when she rolled out of the way, and the vial was useless. Before her, growling and pacing in the dirt, was an enormous manticore, the largest she was aware of. The injured hand she'd entered the trial with was now the least of her worries. Esmeralda would freak if she could see this beauty, said Pax, grimacing as she yanked a thorn from her forearm, leaving a bloody line across her flesh. The manticore was likely the creation of a drunken wizard who probably thought it'd make a good guard dog, or so the story suggested. Pax hoped he'd been eaten by his pet, given that she was now tasked with getting past one. Another archway stood a good pace back from the manticore, meaning she would have to cross a length of ten meters without getting punctured like a pincushion along the way. The only thing keeping the manticore from ripping her apart was the Cynthia thorn bush, which was one of the few things manticores avoided. The leaves were toxic to the dangerous creatures. Pax knew about them because the zoo lined the manticore's enclosure with them to keep the creature from testing the spell-hardened glass. As she wiped the sweat from her brow, Pax watched the manticore pace across the dirt, growling under its breath. If only I had a pocket full of stakes. A bout of dizziness brought her back to her knees, and she rested her hands on the ground to keep from falling over. The black veins in her arms reached past her elbow like an inky tattoo of vines. If I give up now, I'll never get to find out if you ate Logan, said Pax, laughing deliriously as she stared at the dangerous predator growling and pawing the earth with massive claws. Come on, Pax. Think. While she'd never had more than a few sips of alcohol in her life, Baba made her have a drink of Aquavit on her birthday, Pax felt certain the wooziness she felt was a good approximation of being tipsy. As her mind filled with fog, Pax recounted the things she knew about manticores, great eyesight for tracking prey, terrible sense of smell, the bone spikes can only be thrown every few minutes due to the vertebrae structure in the tail, preferred food is bloody meat, weigh as much as a small car, and usually let their prey succumb to the deadly poison before eating. If I can confuse it somehow, maybe I can get past it, reach the archway before it can kill me. It probably can't throw its spikes again, not yet, but soon. She shook her head. I can't believe I'm considering this. Is getting into the hundred halls worth this? Staring at the manticore pacing, waiting for her to emerge from her hiding spot, left her hands shaking. She made fists with them, but the tremble just transferred to her arms. Maybe it was the poison or maybe it was the insane idea of crossing that distance that left her choking on pungent fear. If only to give herself a respite from looking at the manticore, Pax turned away. She happened to glance up at the exit of the grass field and saw the stalks of grass that she'd tumbled through hanging past the ledge. Though it caused a bit of pain to grasp, Pax leapt up and yanked the hunks of grass down. The woody material was tinder dry, but if she wanted to start a good fire she was going to need more. Pulling herself back up to the ghost's territory left her shaking and covered in a damp sweat. She knew she didn't have much time left before the toxins completely immobilized her, 
but she worked fast, ripping hunks of grass and tossing them down to her hiding spot behind the thorny bush, keeping an eye out for the lady peasant ghost. Pax stripped the area around the archway, never once seeing her previous tormentor, as if passing through the exit had ended the encounter. When she had multiple armfuls of dry grass, she dropped back down, nearly passing out when she hit. Sliding between the wall and the bush, Pax transferred the grass to a dry spot in the open. Using the fire element, she lit the material, which immediately burst into a thick, billowing, pale smoke. The pile was about half her height. She blew on it, quickly realized she'd pass out that way and probably fall into the fire, and switched to using the element of air to expand the flame and the smoke. Before long, a huge cloud covered the area between her and the manticore, which had backed up, sniffing and growling in confusion. In a fit of inspiration, Pax grabbed the green leaves from the cynthia bush and threw them onto the fire, which partially damped the flame, but increased the smoke. The manticore huffed and backed away as the cloud reached it, so Pax grabbed more leaves. As excited as she was that the cynthia smoke was working, black spots were forming in her vision. Time was short. Pax shoved more cynthia foliage into the flames, grabbed another handful of leaves and a stalk of burning grass and moved into the open with her makeshift torch. The manticore roared at her, gouging the earth with its claws. Pax waved the smoky brand at the creature. The manticore surged forward, its tail waving hypnotically above its back. As Pax moved around the outer edge of the space, the billowing smoke that had protected her at the entrance faded away, leaving only a puffy cloud drifting from her handful of burning stalks. The manticore approached, stopping a meter and a half from her. Pax couldn't keep her eyes off the bulbous end of the tail covered in bone spikes. While the smoke was keeping the creature from ripping into her with its claws and teeth, the thin cloud would do nothing against a hail of bone spikes that would rip through her chest. Back, she said, hearing the fading of her voice. Back. The exit to the trial seemed so far away. Pax stumbled towards it, waving the flames at the beast, which kept approaching closer and closer as the smoke trickled down to wisps with most of the cynthia leaves already burnt. The spots in her eyes gathered together, forming blotches in her sight. Pax pushed herself, waving the flaming brand, moving towards the exit. When the stalks burned down to her hand, Pax threw them at the manticore and sprinted towards the exit. The beast bounded after her, flapping its leathery wings as it leapt. She sped through the exit right as the beast slammed into the archway, the black spots in her eyes connecting as she was hit by a whirlwind of vertigo. Chapter 10 Pax woke in the infirmary with rune-covered bandages wrapped around her arms, wires and tubes stringing her to machines, and smoke from the fire still lingering. The bed sat in a large room with dozens of beds, half of which were filled. Across from Pax, a convulsing girl was being worked on diligently by a team of doctors, but their grave expressions left her little doubt about the eventual result. A nurse in green scrubs caught her watching and closed the curtains around the girl's bed. He came over with a pleasant smile. Nice to see you're awake, Pax. Good to be awake, she said. How long have I been out? Not long, he said. Don't worry. You're not missing the trials. We've got you patched up and should be able to discharge you this afternoon. You'll be ready to go for the second trial. Great, said Pax. She held up her left hand and flexed the two fingers on the end without pain or stiffness. We took care of those for you, said the nurse. They were banged up pretty good. A whooping alarm from the bed across from Pax flattened the nurse's lips as he glanced grimly towards the curtained area. He tried to smile when he turned his head back, but his eyes were flat. Rest up, he said, patting her leg before leaving to check on another patient. To her surprise, Liam wandered into the infirmary, head craning, clearly searching for her. Pax couldn't help but admire his rugged physique, the way he simultaneously looked ready to wrestle a bear and work at a soup kitchen. She reminded herself that she'd come to the Hundred Halls to study magic and learn more about animals, maybe even more about herself, not find a boyfriend. She had Callie for companionship anyway, and she was better than any human relationship. But that didn't stop her stomach from doing a backflip when he finally spotted her. His grin went all the way up to his eyes and left Pax warm all over. 
Congrats on making it past the first trial, said Liam. She gestured towards the medical equipment. Surviving is more like it. I'm glad they don't record those, or I'm sure my mess of a trial would go viral. Liam half sat on the bed, his leg close enough even beneath the covers to give her goosebumps. You wouldn't know it by your score. You're smack in the middle of the upper group. A safe spot for the trials, so it must not have been all bad. He wrinkled his nose at her injuries. What did you do? Charge the manticore? And what if I did, she said sheepishly. Didn't you use the spell they gave you, asked Liam. Let's just say things didn't go as planned, she said. When the alarms across the room fell silent, they shared an uncomfortable glance. Pax was all too aware that that could have been her if things had gone a little worse in the first trial. A gray soul-stealing guilt bubbled up. We all know the risk when we make the attempt, said Liam. This isn't your first time, is it? she asked. Third and one way or another, my final time. He held up his right arm and pulled back the shirt, revealing a thick, ropey scar along the bottom. I got this two years ago when an Azaban pushed me off a ledge, right through a window. Nothing like getting suckered by a trickster raccoon. I had to call in the cavalry or bleed out. It was the worst day of my life. And this year, she asked. Top ten so far. Which puts me in good position. He shook his head. But you never know what can happen in the third trial. Bloody chaos. The weight of the trials hung on his shoulders as Liam stared into the distance. Which is why you recruited me this morning, she said. You didn't want to get stuck on the bad side of the chaos. Liam cocked a grin. I mean, that's not the only reason but I won't lie to you. Getting into the halls is my main priority. If there are other benefits in the process, who am I to complain? I'm here for the halls too. I doubt I'll ever be able to afford another attempt. So this is it, she said. He made a throwaway shrug. The reality is that even if we both pass, as soon as we get to our respective halls, we won't have much personal time. Before Pax could respond, the nurse returned, holding a clipboard. He nodded to Liam. Sorry, visitors have to go but you'll see her after the second trial. Liam saluted. Good luck. Hope you get a good partner, he said. She watched him saunter away, blushing when the nurse followed her gaze and raised an eyebrow. Chapter 11 Pax spent way longer in the infirmary than she would have liked, due to the constant inflow of new wounded entering from the first trial. When the nurse that had been treating her finally removed the bandages from her arms and released her, it was time to sleep. She was led to a dormitory filled with silence bunks, so there were no worries about snoring or other nighttime noises. But the absence of Callie curled up in the crook of her arm, furry head resting on her chest, left her tossing and turning all night. Breakfast and the morning announcements went by in a blur, and before Pax knew it, she was called into the second trial. To her surprise, she found Liam standing in the ready area fiddling with the chunky metal ring. His eyes widened upon her arrival. Well, this is a nice surprise. He tilted his head. Though, I'm not sure how you're managing to look worse than when I saw you in the infirmary. You really should work on your pickup lines. Pax gestured lazily at her hair, which she'd barely tamed into a ponytail before heading to the trials. I'm not used to sleeping in large groups, I guess. Liam brightened. At least I know I have a good partner. Second try, the girl somehow dropped her wand off the platform where she couldn't recover it, and I had to win it by myself. The student mage at the station had his arms crossed. Whenever you two are done flirting, you have a trial to attend. Right, said Liam shooting her a wink. What's your item? Pax opened an ornate box, producing a small vial holding a pale milky liquid with runic writing on the side. Tan Grisner, said Pax, not understanding even though the word was familiar. The student mage tapped on the box. Read the underside. Beneath the lid read a small passage. Caprids are known for their stubbornness. Snarler and his brother Grinder were two legendary Caprids, who helped the mage Thorner pull his chariot when he tamed the frozen north. Pax pulled the potion out of the box and slammed the lid in disgust. 
Caprid asked Liam. With the potion clutched in her hand, Pax said with a groan, a goat cryptid. What? It turns you into a goat, he asked. No, probably not. Transformation is too difficult for a single potion. I would guess it gives me abilities like Tangrisner, which was Thor's companion, said Pax. You mean Thorner, he said. Pax shrugged. My Baba is from Scandinavia, so I vaguely remember the stories, but the legends of Thor supposedly come from the mage Thorner, who had a thing for hammers and lightning. What's yours? Liam held up the chunky ring. My first choice of halls is Coterie. I'll be able to move faster, jump higher, that sort of thing. I didn't peg you for Coterie, said Pax, crossing her arms with a playful smirk, ignoring the student mage who was tapping on the table. I was thinking explorers or maybe protectors, not Coterie, not at all. I volunteer for trail maintenance back in Colorado, so you're not far off. Truthfully, I put all the halls on my list. Since it's my last year, I don't want anything to ruin my chance to get in, but Coterie was a tactical reason. There's no way they would pick me. Since my Merlin scores weren't that high, I don't have a sponsor, and since my mom's a high school teacher, we definitely don't have money, but Coterie usually has the best second trial items. He wrinkled his forehead. Animalians or daring maids? The attendant cleared his throat. If you two don't enter soon, you're going to forfeit. Past the ruined archway with Liam at her side, Pax found an enormous chamber filled with small ascending platforms that rose high above their heads until they reached a peak, upon which stood a slight girl and a flag. It looked like a pixelated version of a rough pyramid. I'm starting to see the reason for our items, said Pax. The girl on the pyramid shouted down at them. The object of the game is to capture the flag. If you can take it from me, you win. Pax unstoppered her vial, tipped the glass to her lips and threw it back. The mixture tasted like greasy fries and crisp apples, the first part lingering long after the liquid had entered her stomach. Yuck! she said, grimacing as warmth trickled out from her midsection, leaving her whole body tingling. Go go gadget goat powers. Liam snorted. You're a lot weirder than I expected. Pax lifted one shoulder. I guess that's what happens when you mostly have animals for friends. She squinted at the flag. Great. That's the hall pin for assassins. You have the experience, how do you want to play this? As Liam fit the thick ring around his finger, he flexed his hand and took a deep breath. When he looked at her, his eyes were dilated big black saucers. Stick together. Don't rush. Keep your head on a swivel. She nodded. Got it. He paused with a grin twitching to his lips. And try not to charge the manticore again. Pax rolled her eyes. The platforms, or more appropriately pillars, were about a meter wide. Pax stepped onto the first platform with Liam at her side. Are you two planning on having the slowest time? I've seen snails move faster, called the assassin mage from atop the pyramid, leaning on her flag. She's trying to goad us into making a mistake, said Liam as they ascended to the next platform, moving carefully, even though Pax itched to bound up the crenellated mountain in huge leaps. You're already making a mistake, said the assassin mage from atop the pyramid. Damn she can hear us, whispered Pax. After the sixth platform, Pax leapt up a few seconds faster than Liam, and before either of them could do anything, the whole thing lurched to the side, knocking her to her knees. Before he could reach her, the platform separated, leaving a gap of two meters. The structure had shifted, and not just her platform. All the platforms had a gap between them, and they were constantly shifting as if each pillar was a stalk of grain drifting in the breeze. Pax wasn't ready to make the leap to cross the empty space between them, and Liam, by the way he was staring down at the floor of the chamber, hundreds of feet below them, didn't look like he wanted to either. Try to stay to the same side of the pyramid, I guess, he said. No longer feeling leashed by the need to stay together, Pax let the springy energy in her soul release. She took a few quick steps and leapt up to the next platform soaring across the short gap as if it were only a stair step, landing with a grin on her face. Liam's platform moved away as he leapt, and he had to grab the ledge, pulling himself up confidently, then shooting her a wink. But now they were even further away from each other. 
The moving, shifting platforms gave Pax a touch of vertigo. Let's get this over with, she said. Pax ascended the stair-step pyramid in graceful leaps, glancing to her right to check Liam's location occasionally. Before long she could no longer see him, and the platform gave her no path to reach him, but she was almost to the top and took leaping strides to make the last ascension. When she reached the top, she expected to find the assassin mage and the flag, but it was empty, no sign of either. Pax spun around in time to see the dark-haired girl speeding towards her from behind. The eager look on the assassin's face told Pax she had no business attempting to fight, so she fled the other way. The assassin girl was right on her tail, landing on her platform the moment Pax leapt, so she started taking chances, leaping to a spot two away, but her pursuer made those jumps as easily. Pax bounced off the wall of the platform, rather than making it to the flat spot, immediately heading in a different direction. The assassin girl flew right past, laughing when she realized what Pax had done. Oh, you're fun, said the assassin mage. Pax expected the pursuit to resume, but the girl winked before speeding the other way around the pyramid. With her breath laboring in her chest, Pax checked her surroundings. The assassin mage had hidden the flag while they descended. Pax didn't think the flag could be on the lower platforms, there wasn't enough time, so she kept moving higher, hoping that Liam had found it during her evasion. But not knowing where the assassin mage was lurking made moving across the platforms twitchy. Pax kept glancing around, prepared to leap in a different direction should she see her. When Pax heard a shout, which sounded suspiciously like her own voice, she sped towards the source at the same time she recalled that mages from the assassin hall were masters of mimicry. Pax arrived at the end of a tussle, with the assassin girl easily overcoming the larger Liam, even with his enhancement ring. She held him with a knife to his throat while the flag was on the platform directly behind her. You gave me a good chase back there, said the assassin mage. I usually don't lose those, which is why I'm going to give you a chance. Meatbag here fell for my ploy so he's not moving on, but I'll let you move around and capture the flag. The devastation in Liam's eyes was complete, total. He looked like a forest after a bomb had gone off, every tree ripped from the earth, knocked down. The assassin mage nodded in the direction of the flag. Hurry up. I need a bathroom break before my next match. Sorry said Pax as she leapt to the platform above the one they were at, which was only two jumps away from the flag. Liam had gone completely still. She guessed he was numb from shock, as years of trying to get into the hundred halls were now officially over. As Pax pivoted on her heel, slamming her foot against the side of the next platform to speed her misdirection, she hoped that Liam's slackness would help him when she charged, much like a sleeping passenger in a car wreck usually didn't get hurt. The assassin mage hesitated with the knife, looking up briefly as Pax flew down from above, lowering her shoulder into Liam's chest like a goat in full ramming mode. The three of them, Pax, Liam, the assassin mage, flew down to the next platform with the girl on the bottom. When they landed there was a sickening crunch and a forceful exhale, followed by the clattering of a blade sliding across and falling off the platform. The girl assassin groaned beneath their collective weight, while Pax lay directly on Liam, whose rounding eyes were only now registering what had happened. Despite the strangeness of the circumstances, Pax wanted to linger on top of Liam, but the poor mage who'd taken the brunt of the impact was clearly hurt. Pax scrambled off, pulled Liam to his feet, grabbing the flag just in case the girl was playing possum and then knelt back down. You okay? asked Pax. The assassin held her shoulder. Dislocation. I'll be fine. She screwed up her mouth. How'd you know I wouldn't stab him? I didn't, said Pax. But predators are no different than prey when the tables are turned. A lion will flinch if it doesn't know what's going to happen, and that's all the time I needed. The girl chuckled. You're a little wild. As they spoke, the hundreds of platforms all lowered down and reconnected, creating a flat board with no space between. A trio of medics came in with the stretcher. Pax and Liam, waited until the girl was being carried out before leaving themselves. As she went ahead, the assassin mage gave them a thumbs up. Good luck with your last trials. I'll be rooting for you. Chapter 12 Their performance in the second trial, 
kept them at their same respective spots on the leaderboard. Liam had dropped a dozen spots but was still comfortably at the top. Only a catastrophic third contest would knock him out, while Pax still had to perform relatively well to join the hundred halls. When they returned to the dormitory, Liam was rubbing his ribs. I do recall saying don't charge the manticore, he said, chuckling. I figured you'd rather take a knife to the shoulder than not be in the halls, she said. I've done a lot stupider things for less important reasons, said Liam. So thanks, thanks for not just grabbing the flag and moving on. I really need this, my family needs this. When she gave him a look, he continued. Single mom. Just me and my younger brother. She's funded these attempts without a single complaint. I really want to get into the halls, graduate, and then I can pay her back for everything she's done. A pang of jealousy hit her right in the chest at the thought of a parent that cared. While she knew her parents had been changed somehow due to the bad thing, she still craved their love and support. She didn't know what she would have done without Baba's help. She sighed. I really miss Callie. Callie? Pax didn't realize she'd spoken out loud. A thoracic fox that I bonded with. Oh wow that's rare. He screwed up his face. How'd that happen? I work at the Portland Magical Zoo. It happened years ago. Long story. There was a pause as they looked into each other's eyes without flinching. We should focus on the final trial. Don't we need allies? Yep, said Liam shaking his head as if he were coming out of a trance, a slow grin spreading on his lips before he surveyed the dormitory, which wasn't as busy as before. Less people to focus on now, and you're actually alive this time. Split up? Pax headed to the far side of the room, where tables had been set up along the wall for taking breaks. A group of potential students had gathered around a single table, talking excitedly, waving their hands around, clearly telling stories about the second trial. That and then he turned around and realized we'd beaten him to the flag while he was sneaking around. We both stood there laughing. It was fucking priceless, said a guy in a shirt with the sleeves cut off. Pax had no intention of intruding on their conversation. Even approaching the group left a pit in her stomach. It was much easier to connect with an animal, even a dangerous supernatural one, because she knew what to expect. Humans had never felt that way to her. Their laughter at the guy's story continued, until one by one they noticed her standing there. As heads turned heat flashed to her face. This wasn't just the imposition of a newcomer, the way they wrinkled their faces in disgust left her stiff as a statue. It's that one girl. Pax overheard someone whispering an explanation to a potential mage who wasn't looking at her with the same disgust the others were. As usually happened in herds, that final individual quickly conformed to the group mind, their lips souring to a pinched grimace. The guy who'd been telling the story gestured towards her, as if he were sweeping her away with the back of his hand. Move along. You're not welcome. Pax swallowed and slowly moved towards the next group as the conversation continued. She didn't have to stay around to know that it would be about her. While she didn't know what had been said about her, Pax knew the source of the whisper campaign against her, Logan Lovelace. She didn't see him in the room, but his name was on the leaderboard, a few spaces above Liam's name. It would have been much easier if he'd been knocked out of the trials. She would have compared the situation to high school, but it had been easy to ignore the stupid games people played and spend her day dreaming about the moment she stepped back into the zoo, which for all intents and purposes had been her real school during those years. But she couldn't avoid people like Logan in the halls, nor did she know how to deal with him. Approaching the next group felt like walking up on a skunk she didn't quite see at first. She made it ten feet away before the turned heads made it completely apparent that she was not welcome. Across the room, Liam seemed to be doing better. He was at least getting them to talk, though as she watched, a girl pointed in her direction and angrily shook her head. Logan had done his job well. Pax approached a group in the back with her heart in her throat, ready for the inevitable rejection. They were clustered between two bunks, some on the floor, others hanging off the top bed, all laughing. Before she even had her mouth open, a guy on the front bunk sitting cross-legged with a bowl of popcorn in his lap said, you're Pax, right? 
She managed to nod, before the feeling of petrification set in. Look, no offense but it sounds like you messed up that guy Logan pretty good back home. You probably want to find a different group to hang with, he said. No one else would make eye contact. He was going to hurt an animal and Al think so I stopped him, said Pax, hands balled to fists at her side. The speaker glanced at her fists before smirking. Funny thing, he said he was trying to rescue the injured owl thing before you attacked him. But he had a stick, and the poor thing was already cut, said Pax. The guy sighed. I don't know but he said he was trying to coax it out, let it bite the stick so he could pull it out and take it to the people at the zoo. Sounds plausible. Anyway, he showed us pictures of his broken nose. Told us you're unstable, to watch out for you. It was as if the air had been sucked out of the room. Pax opened her mouth but nothing came, mostly because she wondered if she could have been wrong about what had happened. Could he have been trying to coax the owl thing out? The cut in the poor creature's side probably hadn't come from the flagpole, or the stick they'd been wielding. The acidic taste of shame coated the back of her throat. I'm sure it wasn't as bad as he was making out, but on the other hand, we heard about what you did with your partner in the second trial, and how you even survived the first. You're reckless and frankly, we're not here to make friends, just to get through this last trial and make it into the halls, so if you don't mind, we'd like to get back to our conversation. Pax nodded absently. I understand. That's fine. She shuffled away in a daze, intending to go back to her bunk and hibernate in the covers for the remainder of the day, when a touch to her shoulder startled her. Sorry. The girl who'd stopped her had reddish-brown skin, and her afro had been shaved on the sides and styled into a curly mane. Hey, said the girl. You okay? That was pretty shitty back there. Nothing I'm not used to, said Pax, finding it hard to meet the girl's searching gaze. I'm Janelle. She glanced pensively back at the group, which had gone back to laughing loudly, before knitting her forehead. Did you really punch that guy? Pax nodded. Kicked him in the junk too. Good, said Janelle with a menacing grin. I don't know what it is but I don't like that guy. Don't trust him. The unexpected support shattered Pax's entombment, and she let out a shuddering laugh, then thumbed away wetness at the corners of her eyes. Afterwards, said Pax finding herself dizzy from the whiplash of emotions, he found my house, showed up to my shed, threatened to kill the owl thing in revenge. He had a knife, and everything. I knew he was a snake, said Janelle shaking her head. Pax held back the wellspring of emotions pent up behind her eyes, but managed to say in a half laugh half cry, don't be so mean to snakes. Janelle squeezed her shoulder in solidarity. I take it you have animalians as your first choice? First and only, said Pax. Wow, said Janelle. That's brave. I wouldn't know what to do in any of the other halls. I'm actually not that great at magic, said Pax, feeling like a fraud. Janelle screwed up her face. Then how'd you make it this far? I can take a lot of pain and I'm stubborn I guess, said Pax. You? Aura healers first, but animalians is my second, said Janelle. I have some others after that, but I hope they won't be necessary. Assuming I get past this last trial of course. Pax took a second look at Janelle, the designer jeans, the tailored jacket, and the Appaloosa print on her purse. You own horses don't you, asked Pax. Janelle inhaled deeply, clearly awash in private memories, as she tickled the bottom of her teeth with her tongue. I miss Chief so much. She returned from her memory. You have a good eye. Not about people clearly, said Pax rolling her eyes at herself. But show me some animal scat, and I can tell you what it is, what it ate that day, and its relative health. They shared a smile, after which Janelle glanced back at her group. As for tomorrow, I'll try to work on them, and at the very least, you can count on me. Thank you, said Pax, shaking her head. But I have to ask, why? If everyone is against me, it can't be good for you. Janelle tilted her head, her eyes rounding with concern. Oh, I don't believe all this. She gestured at the laughing group. When it comes down to it, everyone here is out for themselves. They're only trying to make it into the halls, and they'll turn on you if it benefits them. And like everyone else, 
I heard about your second trial, but it's the fact that you didn't just take the flag, that you risked your chance to help your partner that stood out to me. That's the kind of person I want at my back in the final round. I know people, it's one of my gifts and you're a good person. A moment of silence ratcheted up the tension in Pax, until she sprung forward and threw her arms around Janelle in a hug before she had second thoughts, which resulted in them both laughing and crying. Janelle hitched her thumb towards the group when the hug finally broke up. I'm headed back. Look for me tomorrow. Pax dared not say another word, fearful that she would somehow break the spell. She strode back to her bunk and buried herself in the covers, hopeful that she might make it through the final day of the trials after all. And to her immense surprise and relief, sleep came quickly, giving her a restful night for the first time in days. Chapter 13 You cannot truly die in this third trial, though you may wish you had, said Instructor Pennywhistle to the assembled group, which was considerably smaller than the original throng the first day. You will be competing in the place we use for the second year games. The excited murmuring from the crowd brought a knowing smirk from Instructor Pennywhistle. The magic or technology of the second year games, no one really knew how it worked, brought worldwide interest, so getting a preview brought the widening of eyes and the burgeoning of smiles. The task of the third trial is to survive. The longer you survive, the more points you score, the more points you score, the better the chance to make it into the halls and specifically, the hall of your choice. Though I would caution you to remember that your actions inside the trials give weight to the selection committee's final choices amongst other factors. She rolled her eyes and wagged her eyebrows, bringing a round of laughter, as everyone knew she was talking about Coterie of Mages, which famously had strict entrance guidelines compared to the other halls. You will be given no tools, no outside help. It will be the collective ability of the entire group, if you are wise enough to harness it, to make it through. Know that potentially, this entire group could join the halls if you perform well enough. We've set a minimum score that if you pass, you're in. She paused, letting the news sink in. But since this is unlikely, make sure you memorize the leaderboard, because we will be taking the top half of the scores, no matter what the final result of the contest. The gazes of every student rotated to the leaderboard. Liam, who was standing beside Pax, muttered, as long as I don't die early, I should be good. We just need to get you into that top half. Or get everyone to survive to the end, said Pax. Liam whispered, You know as well as I do, the chances of that are slim to none. Instructor Penny Whistle held up her hands to get everyone's attention again. Is everyone clear on the rules? she asked, and a smile slowly spread to her ruby red lips. Remember, it is our nature to succeed but also nature never lies. Keep that in mind because the contest begins right now. She slammed her hands down like a race starter, and the lights went out in the room, followed by screams and excited chatter. Before three heartbeats had passed, a small glowing lamp appeared at the center where the instructor had just been. The cold light of the lamp exposed a scene completely different than the one they'd been in only moments before. Pax shifted and felt her boot sliding in dirt, and she smelled something wet and tangy that reminded her of cleaning out the aviary domes. Smaller, warmer lights bloomed into existence, cast by nervous mages as they spread out, examining their new surroundings. The way they appeared, a few at first, then many altogether, reminded Pax of a concert. Rather than an auditorium wood floor, they stood on dirt glittering with old broken glass. As the dome of light expanded, their surroundings slowly filled in. Towers of old junk, piled precariously, formed a makeshift oval wall. The structure was made of rusty sheet metal, old cars, refrigerators, chunks of masonry and other junkyard items. As everyone spread out, Pax grabbed Liam's arm keeping him from following the others. Let the others stick their noses in things that might bite. He wrinkled his nose and glanced around. There's no danger yet. We should figure out where we're at. He skewed his mouth to the side. Didn't expect you to be so cautious. Center of the herd is the safest spot, said Pax. That's where the most vulnerable are kept to protect from the predators. You expecting an attack from a pride of lions or something? asked Liam. You heard the instructor right before the lights went out. Remember it is our nature to succeed, 
but also nature never lies. Keep that in mind, said Pax. What does that mean? asked Liam. I have no idea but she was clearly making a point, said Pax. I just don't feel good about this. Do you have any idea where we're at, explorer boy? Liam crouched down and scooped up a handful of the sandy dirt. Besides in a junkyard, no idea but it's an arid zone. If we're still on our world, or the replica of it, we could be out west, but I only know the states. We could be so many places in the world. If we're on our world, said Pax. A small group appeared out of the gloom, led by Janelle in a black leather jacket. Introductions were quickly made, followed by an inquiry. So what's the plan? What's happening? asked Janelle. We don't know yet, but Pax thinks we shouldn't be wandering far, said Liam. I agree with that, said Janelle as the field of light expanded. What are we looking for, and I hope to all that is good and magical that it is not zombies. I don't think it'll be zombies. Instructor Pennywhistle mentioned nature twice, right before the lights went out. I think it was a clue, said Pax, shifting uncomfortably as the others of the small group nodded along with what she was saying. Pax couldn't figure out why it was so hard to meet their gazes. If she were at the zoo, explaining to a crowd about the disgusting habits of the spotted alpine wendigo, she never got nervous, but now, in the middle of a dark junkyard, the attention of a group a third of her normal zoo group size gave her heart palpitations. Some of the students had wandered out of the walls of the junkyard. Others were digging in the soil or picking through the junk for clues or weapons. The hair on the back of Pax's neck had been standing at attention since they'd arrived, but she couldn't detect from which direction the danger was coming. She kept peering out into the darkness, where a small group of students had wandered, her gut roiling at the worry they were exposing themselves. She finally couldn't take it any longer, and started jogging to the gap to tell them to get back into the safety of the junkyard. Just before she got there, dark shapes dropped out of the sky, catching a tall girl standing by herself picking rocks off the sandy soil and examining them. Within seconds three dark shapes had landed on her, collectively as large as she was, and they made quick work of her with deadly talons. Her screams high and pain-filled, cut through the junkyard bringing everyone's heads around. A glistening force ball, cast by a nearby quick-thinking student, knocked the creatures from her back, sending up a cascade of feathers as they winged back into the eerie darkness above. A small group ran to the motionless body of the girl and dragged her backwards, heads craning upward. Another scream at the back of the junkyard, followed by two beads of flame licking after a winged shape that had dared a strafing run, brought a general sense of panic. Within seconds, dozens of elemental blasts rose into the sky, mostly flame, but a few force and earth, and the rising meteors illuminated the air above the junkyard. The crackling flames revealed a mass of circling shapes, a maelstrom of wings, from which hunks of night tore away, descending with talons extended. Chapter 14 The next few minutes of the trial passed like an old stop-motion video, or a horror scene played to shuddering lights. The blasts of magic rising upwards, flickering electricity and flames and descending aerial assault, turned the junkyard to chaos. Pax choked back a scream, when a gray bird with a ruby throat that she thought was an Adarna bird, landed on the back of a guy in a black hoodie, and turned his forearm to stone when he reached back to grab it. A sputtering flame ball from her quivering fingers went past the bird's head, while Liam, who'd grabbed a piece of steel rebar from a pile of junk, slammed his weapon into the bird, sending up a puff of feathers before it flew back into the darkness. The guy in the hoodie fell onto the ground, holding his stone arm, screaming, while Janelle kneeled over him. Liam and the others of their small group stood nearby, protecting him as the birds made their attacks. Shish, you're okay, said Janelle. A little blood and some minor petrification, but don't worry, you're still alive. The guy who'd been hyperventilating, quickly calmed at Janelle's touch and soothing words. But I can't use magic with a stone hand, said the guy, face ashen with fright. No, but you have a handy weapon now, said Janelle. And we'll protect you. Let's get you up. Stone Arm got to his feet, still shaking and looking like he wanted to puke. Janelle examined the wounds on his back declaring them only superficial. They're retreating, came a cry from nearby, followed by a rowdy cheer from the students. Balls of flame followed the winged mass as it moved away from the junkyard. 
Nearby, a few questions asking if they'd won were met with silence. Pax kept her eyes on the sky, only vaguely aware that motionless shapes littered the group around the junkyard. While the losses were minimal, every death meant one less defender. I don't understand, said Pax mostly to herself. Adarna birds aren't predatory. Not for humans. It is a game after all, said Liam, holding his steel rebar in one hand, keeping his other free for spells. Those were all Adarna birds, asked Janelle. No, said Pax shaking her head. I saw Nergals, devil birds, piasa, other smaller birds that only eat bugs. Some of them are dangerous, but most aren't. It doesn't make any sense. It is a trial of magic, said Liam, shrugging noncommittally. Maybe they were enchanted to attack us. That would make sense, except Penny Whistle said nature, said Pax. Further discussion ended, when a minor explosion brought everyone's head around to find Logan standing on a pile of junk at the center of the group, with a mage light hovering over his head. Pax groaned internally that her tormentor hadn't succumbed to the aerial assault. Gather round, everyone, said Logan. Leave the bodies, they're out of the game, not dead. We need to put up our defense. The potential students crouched by the motionless shapes, hesitated before gathering with the rest of them. Pax had her arms crossed, standing behind Liam so Logan didn't see her in the crowd. Logan shot them a confident smile. Most of you know me by now, but for those that don't, I'm Logan Lovelace. My dad is a big contributor to the Portland Magical Zoo, so I know a lot about supernatural animals. You can trust me. Under her breath, Janelle said, I thought he was trying to get into coterie? These birds are extremely dangerous. The Adarna birds can turn you to stone in an instant, the Gogol birds can like rip your arm off, said Logan. Pax growled in the back of her throat. They're not Gogol birds, they're Gorgolan birds, and they're actually quite peaceful. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He has everyone's attention, and he's speaking confidently, said Janelle. Sometimes people just want to think someone is in charge, even if they're wrong. What I need everyone to do, continued Logan, rotating so his voice would reach everyone. Pax silently wished that a huge griffin would swoop in and rip his head off, but the bird showed no sign of returning is we need to put up barriers. Find sheet metal. We should make shields too. He hesitated, then he brightened, pointing to the sky. We need lights. I need a group to float mage lights high above us, so we can see when they're coming. We don't want them to catch us unawares. No, said Pax, just to the group around her. All those birds are non-nocturnal. Giving them light will just help them see. We should keep it dark. He's going to get everyone killed. Why don't you say anything? asked Liam. Pax sighed. I'm poisoned to everyone because of him. No one would listen to me. Then what should we do? asked Janelle as their small group crowded around her. The others were following Logan's directions, which had expanded. He was yelling across the junkyard, pointing out the items he wanted them to grab. The whole crowd moved about sluggishly. I um, said Pax as her heart jackrabbited around her chest, we need to get out of this light. The birds only attacked when they could see. The group of twelve, which had slightly grown after the battle, due to Stonearm and a few others who had heard her speak. At the back of the junkyard, away from the light, the stacks were shorter, but packed together, creating a narrow passage. Okay, now we can't see, said someone in the group, but Pax smelled phase. Who doesn't know a dark vision spell? asked Liam. I can put one on you if you can't. I'm good, said Janelle. Benefits of a first-rate education. Pax listed about in the dim light, but then Liam moved close. She could feel him only inches away, his warm minty breath washing over her giving her goosebumps. I'm going to put my hands on your face and my thumbs on your eyes, said Liam. Pax didn't trust herself to answer, fearing it would come out too enthusiastic, so she nodded trusting he could see the motion. His calloused hands captured her head gently, a light touch that made her lips tingle in anticipation. His thumbs caressed downward until they rested over her closed eyes, followed by a murmuring incantation. When he finished, light bloomed into her world as he removed his hands, leaving a coolness in their place. Pax examined the space around them, 
seeing the world in distinct blacks and whites rather than the multi-hue of her normal vision. The depth perception is a little different, so you'll have to adjust, but everything's the same. If you move back into regular light, it'll ache a bit, but it's not dangerous, said Liam. After everyone had the dark vision spell applied, Liam said, what now? Everyone's gaze upon her carried a heavy weight. I don't think we should stay here. It looks like we're in canyons, or at least I could see sandstone walls beyond the light. Maybe we could find a cave, or other defensible spot. A girl in the back of the group, a latecomer, said, Wait? You're saying we should leave the safety of the junkyard? What safety? asked Pax. There's no roof, and now Logan has spotlights on the whole place that say, Eat here. We need something solid over our heads. I bet we could find a cave nearby. Liam said, we could grab some supplies here to use like a shield. The others have that much right. The girl who'd spoken up shook her head and said, you guys are crazy. I'm heading back. After a brief hesitation, a guy joined her, reducing their numbers to an even ten. Anyone else? asked Pax. We're moving out in a few. So if you want to stay, here's your chance. The resolute stares were answer enough, so she tapped Liam on the shoulder. You have better outdoor experience. Can you take the lead here? Let's grab some supplies first, said Liam. Get anything that you can use to block off a cave entrance or hit something with. We're not always going to have time for spells. They searched through the piles, gathering supplies. Pax found an old hammer and a pot lid that she could use for a shield. Liam and a girl who looked like she entered bodybuilding competitions collected a pile of sheet metal which they carried together. When they were ready, Liam led them into the sandy field. It was slow going since they were heavily loaded. Away from the junkyard, the canyon walls bloomed into view. The dark vision only seemed to work to a range of about 10 or 15 meters. Everyone kept glancing at the sky as they moved. Pax had the urge to run in a crouch, expecting talons to rake her back at each moment. There's a dark spot in the wall over there, said Janelle, gesturing to the left. They found a shallow cave in the sandstone walls of the canyon. The rear was only about 30 feet back from the entrance. The opening is too high to block off, said Liam. But this is much better than the open-air junkyard. They set their metal down, cringing at the muffled clatter. Liam directed the group, and they used rocks and dug trenches with tools they'd collected to hold the sheets upright. They'd barely gotten a few pieces set into the sandy ground, when a host of screaming rose from the lighted junkyard. The junkyard looked like a sports arena at night, with lights hovering above, illuminating the circular piles. Dark shapes had returned, circling with clusters dropping down, strafing the mages, who defended themselves with elemental magics. Merlin's tits that looks horrific, said Liam his jaw gaping. The work on the makeshift wall halted as everyone stared at the battle for the junkyard. There was no gloating from the cave team, but Pax's heart ached that so many potentials would be eliminated. They should have listened to you, said Janelle. Still doesn't make me feel any better, said Pax. Liam tapped on the rusty sheet metal. Let's get back to work. We don't know if these are the only dangers in this trial. The rest of the team worked, but Pax couldn't help but stare at the behavior of the birds. Even the herbivorous birds were behaving like predators, which made no sense to her. When a crackling ball of electricity knocked a winged shape from the sky, and it landed outside of the junkyard on the side of the cave, Pax approached Liam. I want to go check out that dead bird, said Pax. He wrinkled his forehead. Why? If we stay here, we're guaranteed to pass the trial. If you go out there and die, you'll probably get knocked out. I, I know, said Pax. But I still want to. It all doesn't seem right. The birds, that is. Fine, he said. But let me come with you. Liam explained to the group that they were going to check out the dead bird, which brought looks of revulsion at the thought of leaving the safety of the cave. As Pax and Liam ran out onto the sandy plain, Janelle joined them. Didn't want you to have all the fun, she said. The screaming got louder as they neared the fallen bird, along with the crackle of flames and electricity and the crashing of junk as piles were toppled. The others were making a valiant defense, 
but birds coming from the other direction were filling in for the lost attackers as quickly as they were defeated, while the defenders were never replaced when they fell. The dead bird had a huge wingspan, almost two meters. It stunk of burnt feathers, but had a mustier scent, the smell she'd first detected when they'd arrived in the third trial. This is a Garuda. Native to India, worshipped by some. Can be dangerous if it's hungry. There's a psychic element to its call which can freeze even a human in place under the right circumstances, said Pax, crouching down by the bird. It was reddish with a gray breast, the colors revealed by the lights from the junkyard reaching their position. Using the hammer she'd brought, Pax poked the wing. Leaning down to examine the creature using the nearby light, she found a fuzzy ochre coating on the feathers. Oh shit, said Pax, leaning back. You were both sorta of right about the enchantment and the zombies. But it's not straight magic, it's a fungus. I don't remember what it's called, like brain ooze or something. A collector offered one to the zoo, which it quickly and hastily declined. If the spores got out, they could enslave other creatures. That's why Penny Whistle mentioned nature. This is a wholly explainable event. The birds aren't acting on their nature, but the nature of the brain ooze. So that line of birds isn't going to stop, said Janelle, wrinkling her nose. No, said Pax. Not unless someone destroys the brain ooze. That's the key to the trial. These poor birds are being enslaved against their will. They're being forced to attack, even if it's against their nature. We could tell them, said Liam. They're not going to listen, not now, said Pax. Janelle nodded. She's right. They're in full fear mode. And no offense, but going back in there would only put us in danger. They're holding up for now, but eventually the birds will wear them down, said Liam. We should get back to the cave. It looks like we made the right choice to listen to Pax. But the only thing she could think of was how the birds were being controlled against their will. What if, what if we went and destroyed the brain ooze? We could stay in the darkness. I'm sure we could reach it easily then it would only take a few fire blasts to destroy it. Trial one, said Pax. So you want to risk yourself for them when no one would give you the time of day, asked Janelle. Pax opened her mouth to explain about the birds and how awful it must be for them, but knew they wouldn't understand. Think of how many of them will lose their chance at the hundred halls. Janelle and Liam shared an uneasy glance. The former trail guide looked like he was going to be sick, but he nodded. I'll go if you go. Janelle's sigh was followed by a chuckle. You two are going to make me question my own sanity. Fine, I'm in. Let's go, said Pax, cringing at the high-pitched scream that erupted from nearby in the junkyard. I can't take much more of this. Liam jabbed his thumb towards the cave. Don't we want to see if they want to come? They didn't even want to come out here, said Janelle. You saw the looks on their faces. They about shit themselves when Pax brought up running out here. Biting her lip, Pax said, If I go back there, I'm not sure I'll want to return. Liam took the lead as they skirted the junkyard, circling wide around, staying in the darkness along the canyon walls. If she didn't look at the swirling mass of winged death above the junkyard, Pax could imagine the screaming was an enthusiastic game of sports ball. The flashing lights and staccato noise of the junkyard faded behind them as they jogged across the sand following the line of birds in the sky, the only sounds their foot scuffs and heavy breathing. When the junkyard was hundreds of meters behind them, a glowing bubble from which occasional faint screams escaped, they reached a sandstone tower at the circular end of the canyon. Crouching low, Liam gestured to the edges of the cliffs, which were covered in birds, a black blanket, shifting and squawking, waiting for their time to join the fight. Pax gripped her pan-lid shield and hammer tighter. Despite the cool air, her palms and forehead were sweaty from the run. Liam mouthed, what now? Janelle gestured towards the bottom of the tower, where a dark entrance waited, but the rocks leading up were covered with large birds, including a pair of peritons, though they weren't the enormous versions that lived on the Siberian plains, but the smaller Yukon peritons. Those are peritons, meat-eaters, dangerous they can see at night too, whispered Pax. Liam turned his hands palm up while lifting his shoulders and shaking his head. Pax gestured towards the peritons, miming them flying away. After a moment of contemplation, Liam pointed to himself, 
made spellcasting gestures towards the birds, then acted like he was running back towards the canyon walls. When Pax and Janelle wrinkled their foreheads, he whispered, I saw a crack in the wall back a ways. I can shove myself in where they can't get me. Are we really sure about this? asked Janelle. They all looked towards the lighted globe of the junkyard, then back to the sandstone tower. You don't have to go, said Pax. I'll go in the tower myself. Janelle tilted her head and touched Pax on the arm. And let you do all this crazy ass shit alone. No, I'm coming with you, safety in numbers. She made a little mad laugh, glancing at the stream of birds in the sky. Pax and Janelle crept to a spot along the sandstone canyon wall where they could hide behind a pile of rocks. Here, birdie, birdie, shouted Liam from a spot back a ways. He made a series of gestures, and then a crackling ball of flame and electricity shot from his hands, larger and more impressive than anything she'd seen from the other students. It was like the smoke plasma from an exploding volcano had been condensed and shot from a cannon. The projectile hit the rocks near the peritons, sending fire and sparks over them. The birds, large and small alike, scattered, feathers slapped from their wings at the impact. Pax made a mental note to ask him about this impressive, magical display when they were finished with the trial. Janelle looked equally impressed, but they had no time for discussion, as a dark flapping mass of wings and talons went screaming after Liam. Run, run, Pax whispered, urging him to run faster. Janelle grabbed her arm, pulling her towards the entrance. Together they sprinted across the sandy stretch, bounding up the rocky path as they neared the base of the tower. Pax risked a glance backwards to see the peritons screaming and batting their wings at a spot along the canyon wall. They slipped inside of the dark space, and the musty smell worried Pax that there were avian guardians inside the tower, but all she saw was a spiral staircase leading upward. Oh fun. Stairs, said Pax. They ran side by side up the wide rotating stairs, keeping their necks craned in search of danger. The tower was much taller than Pax thought, and by the time they neared the top, she was out of breath while Janelle seemed only moderately winded. I do those obstacle course races for fun, said Janelle, keeping her gaze trained upward. Freak, Pax said between breaths as she leaned on her knees. My thighs are burning. The only exercise I get is walking around the zoo, which is all flat. I think the roof is right above us, through the hole in the ceiling, said Janelle. What now? We run up there and blast it with fire magic, said Pax. I suck at the five elements, so don't be shy. Don't worry, I've never been accused of being shy, said Janelle. Shall we? Though Pax's thighs still ached, the surge of adrenaline helped her make the final sprint up the stairs. As they neared the final slope to the upper portion of the sandstone tower, a shadow on the ceiling tore free, spreading its wings as it flew towards them. Pax recognized the leathery wings and humanoid shape of a Kamazots, but had no time to open her mouth, not even for a scream or spell. The death bat flew right at her, and she knew there was nothing she could do to stop it. Right before the Kamazot slammed into her, Janelle's shoulder tackled it off the stairs. The two fell through the center of the tower like a rock, a falling star of shrieks and screams. Janelle, she yelled, forgetting where she was. Not wanting to waste Janelle's sacrifice, Pax sprinted up the final stairs to find an enormous pile of fungus on the roof of the tower. The general shape and the folds and convulsions made it clear how the creature came by the name Brain Ooze. But guarding the primordial enslavement fungus was a circle of huge birds that Pax had no time to identify. As they opened their wings to descend upon her, Pax dropped her hammer and pot lid, then fumbled through the spell for fire, producing only a weak spark. Shit. With her heart in her throat and the dark shapes leaving the circle of crenellations, Pax made the gestures for flame a second time. The spout of flame arced through the air, landing on the brain ooze, but only singeing a fold the size of a basketball. Out of time, Pax crouched down, scooping up the hammer and pot lid, then rushed across the tower with a war cry on her lips. As the bird slammed into her, she hit the brain ooze, rotating her hammer into the soft, spongy material, exploding spores and brain fluff. Pax looked up in time to see a talon the size of a butcher knife take her in the throat. Chapter 15 The sense that Pax existed but was not completely aware, as if she were coming out of a deep sleep, ended like a curtain coming back up to reveal the actors on a stage. 
Pax's last memory was wading into the squishy brain ooze while a curved talon took her in the neck. Then she was standing back in the middle of the auditorium, surrounded by hundreds of other students. Her hands went to her throat, expecting to find blood and torn flesh. Other students reacted similarly, grabbing body parts and letting out little screams, the aftershocks of their death wails. Janelle, said Pax, looking around frantically for her new friend. Liam, who was next to her, turned his head to look for her as well. Instructor Penny Whistle, who was standing at the center of the room on a dais as if she'd never left it, clapped her hands to get their attention. Congratulations, everyone. You won, you made it. Everyone here will enter the hundred halls. The tension of the horrific fight broke into whoops of joy as fists and hats flew into the air and students hugged in victory. Pax gripped Liam's arm, still trying to locate Janelle, fearful that her sacrifice before the final moments had knocked her out of the game. Pushing through the chaotic crowd, she made it a quarter of the way around the circle before catching a glimpse of her tall, tight curls and shaved side of the head. Janelle, said Pax, throwing her arms around her, catching an equally ferocious hug. I was afraid you didn't make it, after sacrificing yourself. That was a wild ride down, said Janelle, pulling back, eyes wide with the aftereffects of the adrenaline. Congrats, said Liam, clasping them both on the shoulders. Get in here, you dork, said Pax, pulling him in for a hug. A cocktail of emotions washed through her as she stayed in the embrace of her new friends. When they finally broke apart, Liam gestured towards the scoreboard. What the Merlin? I moved into the top ten, said Pax, barely able to comprehend it. Look who's number one, said Liam with a wink. With all the energy still bouncing around inside her, she punched him playfully in the arm. Nice work. A few spots down from the top, Janelle's name was listed. The excitement Pax felt for her new friend's success was tinged with regret, knowing that the high score would likely mean that they would both be placed in their first choice for a hall, which wouldn't be Animalians. The instructor made a high-pitched whistle, dimming the fervor enough that she could speak to them again. Once again, congratulations. This was the most successful third trial we've had in a long time, said the instructor. From the back of the crowd, someone yelled, Good job, Logan. Way to take it home for us. A host of clapping and cheering followed, centered around a knot of people patting Logan on the back. Shit, that fool didn't win it, said Janelle, crossing her arms. Don't worry about it, said Pax. Now that we're finished with the trials, I never have to see him again. But he's taking your credit, said Janelle. If it weren't for your crazy idea, they'd still be in the junkyard getting their asses handed to them. He's already poisoned the well, said Pax quietly. No one would believe me. After the hollering subsided, the instructor continued. The next and final phase of the trials will be the selections for your halls. We will call you one by one to a room off this main auditorium, where you will learn the location of your new home for the next five years. You will report to your hall in the morning. Good luck. Congrats, Pax, said Liam, squeezing her arm. With only one hall on your list, you know where you're going. She put a hand to her forehead. I know, I can't believe it. Before she could say anything else, her name was called, bringing a rapid dizziness and a general numbness to her face. Oh shit, said Pax. I guess I'll see you guys after. Good luck at Aura Healers, Janelle and Explorers, or wherever you end up, Liam. I'll contact you afterwards. After another round of hugs, Pax was led into a room where Instructor Pennywhistle stood, hands clasped in front, ruby red lips spread into a grin. Pax Nygaard, she said. It is my great honor to welcome you to the Hundred Halls. As you know, you only put one name in the Tome of Record. The Society for the Understanding of Animals formally welcomes you to their family. Congratulations! The instructor passed over a hall pin, a human and primate hand clasping, and shook her hand. Before Pax was led from the room to an opposite door, the instructor said, Nice work on the brain news. I know you didn't get credit with your fellow first years, but those of us running the trials were very impressed. Heat rose to her face. A fellow student helped her to another room, where she signed documents and was given a credit for a hotel that night and a packet of information, 
but she could barely pay attention because now that it was over, she really wanted to see Callie again. Before she left the section of the spire where the trials were performed, the girl with pink hair came out from a side room with the black fox on her shoulder. Callie, said Pax, collecting her furry friend in her arms as the thoracic fox licked her nose in greeting. Thank you for caring for her. I missed her a ton. Callie was great. It was my pleasure, really. I'm Jillian. I'm a fourth year. Congrats on passing the trials and welcome to Animalians. She was petite, reminded Pax of a ferret with pink hair, and based on the warmth emanating from Callie, she could tell Jillian was someone she could trust. Pax dug her fingers into the spot behind Callie's ear, which resulted in a grunt from the fox as her back leg twitched. I'm a little overwhelmed right now, said Pax. Jillian chuckled. That feeling never really goes away, so get used to it. But I'd suggest a walk in the city to clear your head. That elevator over there takes you to the archway that leads to the second ward. It's a little ways or you can take a ghost taxi. There's a special coin in the welcome packet for new students. Pax took a step away before turning back. Do um, you know a hotel that allows pets? Hand me your phone, said Jillian. I'll put in a hotel, it's in the second ward, and my number in case you need anything. After entering the information in Pax's phone, Jillian leaned towards Pax's shoulder, where Callie bumped her head against the pink-haired girl. See ya Callie Pax, she said. Enjoy your day off. It's the last one you're going to get for a long time. Following Jillian's directions, Pax made it to the archway that led over substreets and eventually to a sidewalk on a wide avenue. In the distance, two towering kaiju did battle over the buildings. On her shoulder Callie tensed up at the sight, so Pax said, don't worry, they're just illusions. It's the second ward, the craziest funnest place in the world, minus the zoo of course. The little fox relaxed, resuming her lounging across Pax's shoulders, keeping alert with wide eyes but otherwise staying motionless. The sights and sounds of the second ward kept Pax distracted, as the events of the day catapulted around her head. She was still reeling from taking a six-inch talon to the throat, the thrill of passing the trials, and the comforting presence of Callie around her neck. At the zoo, the supernatural and magical world was one of constant diligence, lest one of the creatures got loose or injured someone. But in the second ward, she was reminded that magic could be frivolous too. Pax passed vendors hawking lipstick that constantly changed colors, or drinks that made you belch illusionary fire. They gawked at the buskers who made vines grow with song, and contortionists that could fit themselves into a box no bigger than a soccer ball. The air crackled with fireworks, kids holding hands as they snaked through the streets giggled, and cars honked at the pedestrians crossing. Children cried at spilled ice cream cones, cars backfired, and a pink and gold balloon floated over her head, directing her to visit Marco's marvelous mask shop. By the time Pax stumbled into the hotel that evening, she was numb from exposure, only remembering before she went to sleep that she hadn't contacted her family. While she didn't think her parents cared, except to know that she was no longer their charge, Baba would probably be sick with anticipation. I made it. I made it in, Pax said breathlessly when her grandmother answered the phone. That's wonderful, Pax. I knew you could do it, said Baba warmly. What was it like? Oh wait, I forgot you can't tell me. It was crazy, I can tell you that much. Nothing like I'd ever experienced. I'll start at Animalians tomorrow. I don't know if I'm going to be able to sleep, said Pax as she paced around the floor of the hotel. Callie had made a nest of pillows for herself and was curled at the center keeping one eye on the conversation. They talked for another ten minutes. Baba told her about her current scrimshaw projects and promised to pass along the news to Esmeralda, though Pax was certain that she already knew. Before they hung up, Baba said, I love you, Pax. Be yourself and take care. I'm going to visit my sister in Sweden for the next few months, but I'll see you in the spring on your birthday. We have a lot to talk about. Chapter 16 The campus for Animalians Hall was the largest in the city, taking up nearly eight city blocks, mostly due to the various animal habitats and the Invictus Menagerie and Cryptozoo. 
The latter was a pale imitation of the Portland Magical Zoo, mostly dealing with non-dangerous supernatural animals like the ur bear and hexalings. While Pax wanted to see the zoo, although small, was the first major crypto zoo in the modern world, she didn't enter on the zoo side. Instead, she entered near the dormitories and teaching halls, which reminded her more of a farm with multiple outbuildings than a formal university. The buildings themselves were well-built, brick or marble, but lacked a cohesive design image, probably due to the expansion of the hall occurring over the last century. A splash of pink hair at the entrance with the welcoming committee brought a smile to Pax's lips. Jillian, hey, thanks again for the hotel wreck. It was perfect. The fourth year handed over a packet of information. I'm glad it worked out. She waved at Callie, who was resting on Pax's shoulder. Hey, little one. Callie stretched out a paw, expanding her claws, before climbing onto the table and bumping her head against Jillian, receiving scratches behind the ears in greeting. The other Animalian members working the table melted at the sight of the thoracic fox. A short guy in glasses peered at Callie. Is that a silver fox, said Pax abruptly. There was a little head tilt from Jillian, but otherwise she didn't contradict Pax. She'd registered Callie as a silver fox, but the fourth year had spent time with her companion. If she suspected otherwise, she kept it to herself. The rest of your class is through the entryway, you'll see the signs, said Jillian, leaning over the table with her arm extended towards the front of the main building, which had a glass exterior. She wagged her eyebrows. Welcome and congratulations. Callie reluctantly left the fawning attention of the other students, leaping back to her shoulders. Away from the tables, Pack said, Don't forget, Callie. You're just a normal silver fox. We don't need complications. A light pressing of claws against the back of her neck was Callie's answer, along with a lemony pepper feeling that made her feel like she had to sneeze, signifying disapproval. I'm serious, Callie. No screwing around here. You're registered as a silver fox. While everyone would be happy to know you here, it will cause more problems than it's worth, said Pax, hating that she had to admonish her furry companion. With Callie sulking on her neck, Pax pushed through the glass doors and followed the signs to the central chamber, where she found a knot of students gathered around an enormous gorilla that she knew was Professor Keiko. While Pax couldn't wait to meet the non-human professor, it was not the gorilla making sign language while a translator spoke for her that surprised her, but the presence of the two friends she'd made during the trials. Janelle. Liam. What are you doing here? asked Pax, feeling a little dizzy. I thought you'd get your first picks for sure. Janelle was wearing a stylish black leather jacket and designer jeans. She lifted a single shoulder. This was my second pick. I don't regret their choice one bit. I'm just happy to be in the halls, said Liam, looking like he was about to go on a hike. Animalians is as good as any, even better with the both of you. Janelle stepped close, putting her hand out towards Callie. And this is? Oh, I almost forgot, said Pax, receiving a light claw on the neck. This is Callie, she's a silver fox. To Pax's surprise, Callie leapt into Janelle's arms. Janelle cradled her like a baby and nuzzled her face. Oh my, she's adorable. There'd never been any doubt for Pax about the nature of Janelle's character, but Callie's complete succumbing to her invitation only reinforced it. I've never seen her take to someone so quickly, but I'm also not surprised, said Pax as they crowded around Callie, while everyone gave her attention, scratching ears, rubbing bellies. The sense of warm apple pie emanated from the thoracic fox, which briefly alarmed Pax, until she realized the feeling was only projected into her. After Janelle passed Callie back to Pax, the black girl frowned. You haven't seen him yet, have you? she asked. A pit opened in Pax's stomach. You're kidding me? Really? How? As she craned her head, she caught the brown wavy hair above the others and heard his confident voice regaling the other first years with the tale of his victory in the third trial. Someone said they saw him after he was given his selection. He was talking furiously to his dad. My guess is they picked him because he was a wealthy alumni, but I think Logan had only put Animalians on the list to please his dad, not because he wanted to join, 
said Liam. Maybe it won't be that bad, said Pax, but neither Janelle's nor Liam's expression agreed with her statement. Yeah, good point. The gathering of first years around Professor Keiko ended when a tall, ebony-skinned woman with a bald head approached a podium on a stage. She had a faraway look in her eyes as if she was only vaguely present, but also carried a substantial weight, the contradiction of which left Pax tilting her head. While she knew who the woman was, seeing her in person was radically different than what she'd expected. During the time Pax had been catching up with her friends, the rest of the hall had filed into the room gathering on wooden bleachers. The woman raised her hand, and everyone took a seat. A bright day to you all. Welcome to the Society for the Understanding of Animals. I am patron Adele Montgomery, she said in a proper English accent. Today we are gathered to welcome new students. For some you know what to expect of our mission, as this was your first and sometimes only choice. But for others this destination was an afterthought, and you may be surprised to find yourself here. Know that it is on purpose that we chose you. Our mission, the understanding of animals mundane and supernatural alike, cannot be performed by a single species, nor a single perspective. If we are truly to fulfill our goals, we must embrace many viewpoints. So if this was not your top choice, know that we picked you because of who you are and value your future contributions. Under her breath, Janelle said, Logan is here to represent the assholes of the world. Your first year, patron Adele continued in a dry tone absent of expression, will be one of change, of great learning, about the animals and yourself. At the end of the year, you will be asked to pick a focus where you will join a specific house. Today, I will introduce the four houses, but you will receive ample instruction from them during the year to help you decide. Four professors stepped up from behind the patron. Two men, one woman, and the gorilla that had been mingling with the first years when she arrived. Patron Adele extended a long arm toward the woman. She had big round glasses that made her look like a bug, and held her arms as if she were a praying mantis. On your far left is Professor Dee Dee Applebrook. She heads the... Patron Adele paused. I would give you the formal name for the house, but I am aware that you students only call them by their nicknames, so I will dispense with the formality. A chuckle from the older students fell upon their ears, but the patron made no acknowledgement of the humor, intended or not. Professor Dee Dee Applebrook heads the shifter's house which is tasked with understanding our more unusual friends in the animal kingdoms. Living as another being in their realm under their rules is truly the best way to learn, but it is not for everyone and comes with risks, said patron Adele as the professor stepped forward to give an awkward wave, the kind reserved for mistaken hellos. Under her breath, Pax said to her two friends, I've heard her preferred animal kingdom is the insects and she's been eaten more times than anyone can count. Liam screwed up his face. How does she do that? You can't turn yourself into something that small, but you can link your mind to it, said Pax, straightening back up as patron Adele began to talk again. On Dee Dee's right is Professor Keiko, who many of you met beforehand. She heads the Keeper's House, which is tasked with managing our zoos and other habitats, to ensure the needs of the animals are being met. Pax's skin tingled, in anticipation of meeting the lowland mountain gorilla, who had been Esmeralda's teacher when she was at the school. The gorilla placed her hand, thumb folded in against her head by her ear and extended her arm out. That's hello, whispered Janelle. To my left, said patron Adele, gesturing towards a man who looked like a human rhino without the horn due to his wide bulky frame. He wore gear, Pax would have expected to see on the African savanna or in the Australian outback. A wicked scar creased his cheek, and his left arm had faint burn marks over old tattoos, but despite the rugged exterior he had a friendly expression. Pax knew nothing about this professor, because of the turnover in this house due to the dangerous nature of their work. Is Professor Cassius King? He leads the hunters, which I believe is not the correct title for their purpose. Despite the name, they do not hunt, not for sport or enjoyment. This house is tasked with protecting against the more dangerous creatures in the wild, the ones that cannot be reasoned with nor tamed. Theirs is a thankless and horrific task, called in when no one else can deal with an unfortunate situation. When Cassius has to remove a problematic creature that cannot be relocated, 
he does it in the most humane way. It is why we are blessed to have a mammoth of a man in the post. While he has only been the head of this house for two years, he has accomplished much in the short time. Liam leaned in and whispered, he's a legend back where I come from. Park people, trail maintenance. Every one of them has a story about him. I've heard he's been stung or bitten so many times, his blood is actually poisonous now. Good day, everyone, said Cassius in an Australian accent. Looking forward to showing you a few things. And last, said Patron Adele, to my far left is Professor Vladimir Konstantin. His charge is the Tamers, a post he has had for nearly fifty years. There is no one more professional, more knowledgeable about the field. When the worlds of human and animal cooperate, he is the one to learn from. The professor had short stubble with flecks of gray, his dour face only modestly modified with sorcery to reduce the effects of aging. He looked like he'd been an executioner in a past life. Esmeralda told me he once took a unicorn horn to the chest when he was younger. He'd been off-realm, fighting as a mercenary. They called him Vlad the Inhaler, because you could sometimes hear a slight wheeze where his chest had been punctured. She thought he was much, much older than anyone thinks, and no one knows why he wasn't a patron himself, whispered Pax. The four professors in charge of the houses stepped back as patron Adele raised her hand. You will get to know each of these professors quite well during the course of the year, but by the end, you must decide which house you will focus your studies on for the remainder of your university career. Keep an open mind, said the patron, her normally expressionless voice taking on an oratory weight. You might find by the end of the year that you've chosen a path that you would never have expected. Chapter 17 There were no classes for the first few days in Animalians, but they were given stacks of tomes to memorize, many of them detailing binomial nomenclature of species, the naming structure of creatures normal and supernatural alike. During this time, the first years were given a chance to move into their rooms and get settled. Pax and Janelle shared a space, while Liam was in a larger room with two other first years. The place they were living in was called the nest by the other students because they were expected to climb out and fly away like baby birds, joining a house in their second year. On the following Monday, a warm day in early September, Pax finally got to attend her first class in the Society for the Understanding of Animals. To her delight, it was with Professor Keiko, the lowland gorilla who headed the keeper's house. They met, not at the cryptozoo as Pax hoped, but at the menagerie, which was the building where keepers lived and attended classes. They stood in the main entryway of the building, which on one side had an enormous salt water tank, in which dozens of colorful fish swam, while at the bottom sat an ochre octopus, who appeared to be watching them enter as it pushed a small rock back and forth against the glass. The other half of the room had a wire cage filled with all kinds of birds, chirping and noisily flitting around the leafy space. Pax leaned against the mesh to see that the cage led to open air above the building, so the birds could come and go as they pleased. At the front of the room, Professor Keiko watched them enter. She had black fur with flecks of gray around her shoulders like silvery pauldrons. She stared at the class as they assembled with wide, expressive eyes, occasionally signing with her interpreter, who chuckled quietly and responded. Next to her Janelle let out a short laugh, but Pax could see no reason for the outburst. She didn't have time to ask her about it, because the interpreter spoke for Professor Keiko as she signed. Good morning first years, I am Professor Keiko. I hope you have been catching up on your reading material. By the end of the year, you should know the eleven kingdoms and roughly fourteen hundred phylum that make up all living things. Pay special attention to the larger physical kingdoms, we will not focus on the cellular kingdoms. The gorilla's arms came to a rest, as she let the weight of their task sink in. Pax was aware of what was expected based on Esmeralda's stories, but actually receiving the assignment felt daunting. But she was determined to learn them as quickly as possible, since Keepers was her preferred house. While patron Adele had said to keep an open mind, that was advice best for the newer students who hadn't been working in a supernatural zoo for the past eight years. But today we will not be discussing boring nomenclature, said Professor Keiko, adding body-bouncing hoots to her signing. We will be working on a simple spell, 
that allows basic intentional communication between yourselves and intelligent species. The spell was listed in your packet, so you should have been practicing it before arrival to class. Within the wire enclosure are many birds that voluntarily live at the hall. They are experienced with human or primate to avian communication, so this will be easier than attempting the spell in the wild. There is a particular group within the enclosure, a number of corvids, specifically the northern raven, that call themselves the gang. It is your task to communicate with one, to ask them to bring you a specific number and color of rocks from the floor. Professor Keiko ambled over to a sliding door on the enclosure, yanking the covering open, which would allow birds to fly into the main room. The gorilla pulled out a small whistle, placed it to her lips and blew. A host of ravens came fluttering down from above. They must have been resting on the roof. Pick a spot along the mesh and find a raven to communicate with. If you are successful, they get a good grade and you get a treat or is it the other way around, said Professor Keiko, adding an excited hoot and slapping her hairy leg. She's quite the jokester, said Liam grinning. Pax picked a spot at the far edge of the mesh with Liam and Janelle. No sooner had she approached the enclosure than a tall raven with shiny black feathers landed across from her on the branch of a tree inside. Professor Keiko ambled behind everyone, handing each first year a piece of paper. The one Pax received had five colored circles, two blue, one green, two red. The floor of the enclosure was covered in stones of various colors. Casting the spell is easy, said Professor Keiko. But opening your mind to another is challenging even for simple communication like number and color. This can't be that hard, can it? asked Liam as he studied his raven, tilting his head in mimicry of the bird across from him. For Pax it wasn't the opening of the mind that worried her, but the spell itself. She took a deep breath before she began, summoning raw phase to her mind. It always made her feel like she was going to sneeze, or was about to get a migraine. The finger gestures and words would help shape the phase into a usable effect. Pax was thankful the casting only lasted about 10 seconds with minimally complex finger gestures. She'd heard of powerful spells lasting as long as an hour, with each motion requiring perfection, or the mage would succumb to an awful death. Animalians didn't save the world, but what they did was important to her. When she completed the spell, the phase didn't hook to the intention as she wanted, so she performed the motions again, painfully aware that everyone else had cast it on the first try. After a second flubbed attempt, the third one had her hands shaking, especially when Liam glanced in her direction with a creasing to his eyes. The third try finally worked, releasing the tension in her mind as the phase was allowed to escape into the effects of the spell. A mist so faint, Pax thought she might have imagined it shot through the mesh and into the raven across from her. The raven tilted its head, observing her with black beady eyes. Her mind was filled with the desire to sort. She almost pulled out the change in her pocket to stack on the ground before her, and had an urge to reach out and snatch the little fly buzzing along the cage and cram it into her mouth. Ending the spell was reflexive. Overwhelmed, she let the trickle of phase required to maintain the spell drop, stepping away to catch her breath. The raven lifted its head with a squawk. Professor Keiko and her interpreter were behind Pax when she turned around. Are you okay? asked the gorilla sympathetically. Pax couldn't help but notice the line of first years craning their necks to see what was happening. Her face bloomed with heat, and she wanted to wave away the sensation but kept her hands gripping the hem of her shirt. I, um, it was a little overwhelming, said Pax keeping her voice low. I just wanted to play with the coins in my pocket. The professor put her enormous hand to her chin, nodded her head, then placed her hand against Pax's upper arm. You must be very open to interspecies communication, unusual for a first year, signed Professor Keiko. This is both a blessing and a curse, and potentially very dangerous. If you don't control it, you might find yourself at the whim of their desires. How, how do I control it, she asked. Remember who you are said Professor Keiko before heading back down the line to help other students. To Pax's relief, no one had completed the task yet so she wasn't behind. She cast the spell successfully the fourth time. The expected backflow of emotion came through the link,
but she was ready for it. The urges were still there, but she let them pass over her and focused on the raven, who energetically bounced on the tree branch. Pax focused her intention on the colored stones at the bottom of the cage, picking a red stone first. Much to her delight, the raven leaped onto the ground, snatched up a red stone in her beak, and flew through the opening to land on the table behind Pax, dropping the stone into a bowl. Pax grabbed a treat from the second bowl and handed it to the raven. Good job. Thank you. As she turned back to the cage, a second round of gawking from her fellow first years had her blushing. While she'd had a terrible time performing the spell, once she had, the intention part was easy because it was similar to her mental connection to Callie. Within a minute, two red, one blue and two green stones were in the bowl. Professor Keiko came by and clapped her hands at the successful task. Good work, Pax. Professor Keiko signed out her name, letter by letter. Thank you, Pax responded. Rest while we wait for the others, said the professor, returning to her slow march behind the rest of the first years. Pax watched her friends stare into the cages at their respective ravens, which was quite boring, since she couldn't see anything happening. She turned around when she heard a slight tapping, the sound of something hard on glass. On the other side of the room, in the massive saltwater aquarium, the ochre octopus was holding stones in his tentacles, tapping them against the glass. Upon investigation, Pax found the octopus had two red, one blue and two green stones. Oh nice work, said Pax. She gestured back towards the bowl. You want a treat? The octopus threw the colored stones back into the floor of his tank, and made complicated motions with his eight tentacles that Pax couldn't quite interpret. I don't understand, she said, exaggerating the lifting of her shoulders. The octopus repeated the gesture, but she had no idea what the creature was trying to impart. After glancing over her shoulder to make sure no one was watching, she cast the communication spell, focusing on the octopus as her partner. As soon as the connection formed, alien thoughts overwhelmed her. It felt like taking a two-dimensional cartoon character and asking them to explain three-dimensional space. Pax didn't know which way was up or down and her limbs felt all wrong. Before she knew it, she slammed into the ground shoulder first, the impact knocking the air from her lungs. The fall broke the spell, but it didn't keep the whole class from staring wide-eyed at her. At the far end, Logan was red-faced from laughter, which only encouraged that side of the class to join in his mirth. Professor Keiko loped over to her, interpreter right behind. Are you okay? Are you okay? The gorilla helped her to her feet. Pax shook her head, squeezing her lips tight. I'm an idiot, she said, staring at her shoes. No, signed Professor Keiko, taking her two first two fingers and snapping them against her thumb like a mouth closing, but Edgar is an asshole. The sign for asshole made Pax chuckle. She gestured towards the tank, in which there was no sign of the octopus. Edgar is the octopus, she asked. Edgar is the octopus, said Professor Keiko. He likes to play games. Pranks. You cast spell on him. Pax nodded. He knows this spell, said Professor Keiko. Probably saw that you are very open. He let you have his full mind. Yeah, I got that. I felt like I didn't know which way was up, said Pax, rubbing her shoulder where she'd landed. Am I in trouble? Professor Keiko patted Pax on the shoulder. No, but you should be careful. Pax nodded as the gorilla ambled away. Pax caught Edgar making the sign for asshole at the professor's back, which only made her chuckle. The octopus swam up, putting a tentacle against the glass. Though the connection had been severed, she had the feeling that Edgar was apologizing. I forgive you, Edgar. In a flash, he sped away, disappearing into the seaweed on the floor of the tank, then appeared again moments later, holding up the discarded end of a shrimp. Let me guess, you like shrimp? she asked, pointing to the half-eaten piece. The octopus made a tentacle into a fist and rocked it up and down. Pax recognized the sign for yes from her brief interactions with the professor. Okay, she said and laughed as she nodded her head. I'll bring you some later. The octopus spun in a circle, tentacles twirling around his body like a wide skirt, before he fled into the deeps of the tank unexpectedly. Edgar. 
she sensed a presence to her left. Talking to sea creatures too. I knew you were a crazy witch. Hello, Logan. You know, we don't have to ever talk. You and I can just do our thing, separately, she said. He squared his shoulders and crossed his arms. You broke my nose for no reason. You were hurting the owl thing, said Pax. I was saving the owl thing. I wasn't going to stick my hand into that hole like a crazy person. Then you came along and just assumed you knew what the hell was going on, said Logan. You showed up to my shed with a knife, said Pax. He loosened his arms and gestured to the side with one hand. Well, I may have gone overboard there, but I was so pissed after what you did to me. He wrinkled his forehead. I still don't know how you did that trick, making me not see anything. I never saw you cast a spell, and after seeing you fumble the spell here, I still don't know. Goodbye, Logan, said Pax, wishing someone other than him had been the second one to complete the task. He checked over his shoulder to make sure no one was near, then jabbed his finger in her direction. It's still not even you and I, he said. What? You getting credit for winning the third trial wasn't enough, she asked. That was a nice bonus but no, he said. We're not even. Not by a long shot. Without thinking about it, Pax made the sign for asshole at him. Logan wrinkled his forehead and screwed up his face. What did? The words barely made it out of his mouth when a sploosh noise came from above. They both looked up in time to see Edgar the octopus leaning out of the tank, shooting a mouthful of water onto Logan. Before he could get out of the way, Logan was covered in salt water. Pax immediately laughed, regretting it right away when he made his hands into fists, his face turning blotchy with rage as he stormed out of the room towards the restrooms. Professor Keiko came over right away, checking inside the tank for the octopus, who had retreated into the seaweed. Pax turned her hand's palm up and shrugged, to which the professor glanced after Logan, then returned to the rest of the class, shaking her head. Oh, Edgar, she said to herself after the professor was gone. I owe you a lot of shrimp, though I expect I'm going to pay for your little trick. Chapter 18 It's not a date, Pax told Janelle, who was lounging on her bed in a rainbow unicorn onesie, reading the classification tome they'd been given to memorize. Callie had rested her head on Janelle's leg, and her eyes were closed, though Pax could tell the thoracic fox was listening. Then what do you call two people who are clearly into each other going out together, where food and drinks are likely involved? asked Janelle, eyebrow raised. I won't deny that he's handsome, but I don't want to get involved while I'm at school. I'm already overwhelmed, and we've only been taking classes at the menagerie. Next week when we start tamer classes, I just don't know, said Pax tugging on her black thigh-high boots. Then why are you even going out, asked Janelle. I need a break from studying, and I wanted to check out the ghost dogs at the zoo. It's a full moon and their howling is glorious, sighed Pax as she stared dreamily at the ceiling. Janelle shook her head. No ghosts for me, thank you. They're not ghosts. Just sound like a banshee when they're hunting, said Pax as she pulled on her acid-washed jean jacket. Same thing as far as I'm concerned, said Janelle. I'll stay here and keep Callie company. Pax snapped her fingers. Speaking of? Callie, you need to be more careful when you're hunting. No eating zoo animals, not even mice. Jillian told me they found a pair of half-eaten ones in the back of the feeding rooms. You need to hunt in the city. Janelle tilted her head. You always talk like she understands you, but the weird thing is, I always get the feeling she does. Are you sure she's just a regular fox? Callie lifted her furry black head, looking back at Janelle. See? Like that. She's special, I'll give you that. Pax winked at Callie. But she's just a fox, a regular fox. Right, Callie? The thoracic fox placed her head back on Janelle's thigh, closed her eyes and ever so slightly stuck out her tongue. Janelle shook her head and made a noise in the back of her throat. Have fun on your date, said Janelle, not taking her eyes off the tome. It's not a date, sang Pax as she left the room. Liam was waiting outside the nest in jeans and a patterned button-down shirt. Despite the dirt on his boots, he smelled freshly scrubbed. He whistled softly when she walked up. You clean up nice, he said with heavy-lidded eyes. 
Are you implying that I'm a mess otherwise? she asked sweetly. Wait what? No, he said emphatically, then bunched up his lips and narrowed his eyes, cocking a grin. Actually yes, a disaster of epic proportions. That's more like it but thank you for the first compliment. It's nice to actually put on my girly clothes for once, she said taking a slow spin which flared the thigh-high black skirt around her waist. So I was thinking we could head into the second ward, he said. Actually, said Pax biting her lower lip, I was hoping to head to the crypto zoo. The ghost dogs will be howling tonight since it's a full moon, and I've always wanted to hear them in person. But we'll be spending five years here. You'll have plenty of time to hear the ghost dogs. I thought we'd have a nice dinner, some drinks. He let his voice trail off with obvious intention. Liam, I'm sorry. I should have been more clear. This isn't a date. Not that you're not, look we're going to be too busy with school, I can't don't have time, she said, struggling to find a resting place for her hands. To his credit, he only faltered for a moment before giving her a sturdy nod. That's fair. I shouldn't have assumed. But I would really like to see the city. There's a place near the Glitter Dome that has great live music, bands who use magic during the stage show, crazy drinks that make you feel like you're floating or make your skin feel like it's wood. He screwed up his face. If that's your sort of thing. Pax almost felt bad about turning him down because of the excited little boy look in his eyes. I'm sorry, Liam. Going all the way into the city, the train ride, drinks, we won't be home until late. I'm heading to the crypto zoo. You can come if you want, but if you head to the second ward, I'll completely understand. I put on my nice shirt and everything, even took a shower, he said. Miss that dirt on your boots. She gestured towards his feet. He screwed up his face. Sighed. I was cleaning out stables in the barn earlier. Missed a spot I guess. They started walking across the campus towards the north side where the crypto zoo was located. He fell in beside her. Need some extra cash? she asked. Yeah, he said. Like I said before, my mom is a teacher. She doesn't make a lot and I wanted to send her some money. She squinted at him sideways, pursing her lips. And buy some drinks at seedy second ward bars. Hey, they weren't seedy, or at least I don't think so, and I wanted to have a little fun while I'm here. He glanced behind them towards the city. Now that they were away from the nest, the spire came into view, a massive lighted pillar at the center of the city. We could still make those bands. There's still plenty of time. Pax didn't respond, continuing to move along the lighted path. Liam seemed nervous next to her, or maybe disappointed about the evening not being a date. When she wasn't looking, he kept glancing back at the city. The air was chilly, so she rubbed her arms. The crypto zoo wasn't open, but the ghost dog pen was on the school side. A small pavilion for picnics provided an observation spot. They were away from the lamps, but the bright moon left the lawn awash in silver. What now? He asked as he sat beside her. She craned her neck at the sky. We wait. Sensing his lingering impatience, she asked, Do you know what house you'll join at the end of the year? I don't know. Probably depends on which one makes the most money. He leaned to the side. Don't look at me like that. It's a real question. My mom has bills to pay. No, she said. It's cool you have a mom that supports you. He arched an eyebrow. Your parents don't? Let's just say that if I were eaten by a giant carnivorous arachnid, they would be relieved, she said. That's awful. He shook his head. I would hate to be eaten by a giant spider. Pax punched him playfully in the shoulder. Ha. Huh. Thanks. She placed her hands behind her and leaned back. Hunters, by the way, if you can take the limited life expectancy, and if you can't, then tamers. Duly noted. No money in keepers or shifters? Not that I'm really interested in them, he said. No. Shifters are your basic PhD student, doing it because they love the research. Same with keepers, really. You're either born to work in a zoo or you're not, said Pax. That's what you want? 100%, said Pax with an emphatic nod. If I get my way, I'll be back in Portland, 
but I would accept Moscow or Belgrade as well. They shared a glance that extended until her face grew warm. She looked back at the sky, which prompted him to follow her gaze. Stargazing sucks here. Too many lights. You should see it where there's no light pollution. On top of the continental divide, you can see so many stars it feels like you can see all the way back to the Big Bang, he said. That would be cool. He leaned near her. I could take you next summer. If you don't mind hiking. His green eyes sparkled in the moonlight. She tried to stop imagining herself pressing her lips against his, but the vision kept resurfacing in her mind. He arched an eyebrow. A question. She told her lips to answer with a firm no, but the warmth winding its way up from her belly silenced her denial. With a playful bite of his lower lip, he leaned forward, and she felt gravity pull her in. A gunshot overhead startled them both into pulling away. What was that? That was near, he said, standing up, alarm on his face. To her right, a dark shape flopped around on the grass. She ran to it, sensing injury. There's someone over here said Liam, running across the grass towards the edge of the ghost dog pen. She was about to shout about the stupidity of running towards gunshots, but the wounded creature on the ground captured her attention. A Virgil bird struggled to make it to its long legs. It looked like a bulky vulture. Pax hesitated to grab the bird because it could spit acid, and wounded animals were extremely dangerous. She took off her jean jacket and threw it over the Virgil's head, but came away with warm sticky blood over her forearm. The bullet had gone through the bird's breast. As she watched, the creature slowed its breathing until it halted abruptly. Liam reappeared moments later, as she pulled the ruined jean jacket off the Virgil bird's head. She plopped onto her rear in the grass. Did you catch them? She asked, wiping the blood on her hand on the jacket as she ground her teeth. He shook his head. They were gone before I got around the pen dead? She nodded. I could kill whoever did this, said Pax, lips squeezed to white. Her vision turned crimson at the corners, and the metallic taste of rage invaded her mouth. I'd rip their throats. She let her words trail away as Liam's eyes rounded and moments after a soft wail rose from the nearby pen, which deflated the fury in her chest. One voice followed by a second and a third. The howl hit Pax right at the breastbone, a funeral dirge. Is that, oh Merlin that's both awful and beautiful, said Liam. Do you think they know the bird's dead? I, I don't know, said Pax, staring at her shoes as a dreary weight settled on her bones. But it feels like they do. The ghost dog's dirge continued for another minute, rising and falling together in a wordless melody. When the song ended, Pax stirred to life. Why do you think someone shot this bird, asked Liam. Valuable, I guess, said Pax. There's a stone in their neck that produces the acid. It's used in some weird alchemy stuff, I think. We had all sorts of procedures for dealing with dead animals at the zoo. Some of them had to be registered with the federal government because their parts could be made into dangerous spells or potions. We should take the bird to Professor Keiko. I'm sure they'll know what to do. Liam stood over the fallen bird, frowning. You can use my jacket said Pax, rubbing her arm with her one clean hand to ward away the chilly air. It's ruined now. Liam used the jean jacket to scoop the bird into his arms. They walked back to the campus in silence. I'll take the bird to the menagerie, said Liam. Sorry about tonight. Me too, said Pax. I need to wash this blood off my hands. I'll see you in class. Thanks for taking the bird to Keiko. Liam made a solemn procession towards the glass menagerie, with the murdered Virgil bird wrapped in her jean jacket in his arms. She watched until the ache of the night caught in her throat, then returned to her room. Chapter 19 The busy schedule of the next few weeks made Pax forget about the murdered Virgil bird. The tome they'd received from Professor Keiko was only the first of many. Each house required extensive basic knowledge before they were allowed to do anything beyond a few minor spells, so on a warm afternoon, Pax and her friends were anxious to attend their tamer's class. I can't believe we're going to be training unicorns, said Janelle breathlessly, eyes wide with the excitement of her inner little girl. I can't believe it's October already, 
said Liam, rubbing the back of his neck as he stretched it. I'm so sick of memorizing information in dreary old tomes. If only Professor Keiko or Cassius taught this class, said Pax, squeezing her arms around her chest as they gathered near the training pens on the other side of the barn. It wasn't like any barn Pax had seen before, more concrete bunker than idyllic wooden structure, but the nature of its inhabitants required more substantial construction. One of the upperclassmen had told them a story about a thief who'd snuck into the barn, thinking they might steal an exotic supernatural animal to sell on the black market. The only thing they found was half a shoe and a torn backpack. The training pens had high walls with a mesh cage overhead. They could watch the proceedings through a thick enchanted window, the same kind they used at the Portland Zoo, but today they were on the grounds. Professor Vladimir put his fingers to his lips, producing an ear-splitting whistle to silence the chatter. He wore a thick leather vest over his bare chest. The edge of a scar in the pattern of a star was visible beneath his left arm. Enough quiet, he said even though no one was making noise. His Russian accent had been worn away by time, but still tainted every word with an underlying harshness. Today, despite your terrible progress in learning the required material, we are going to attempt to train a couple of relatively tame monoceros. Janelle whispered out of the corner of her mouth, I thought we were training unicorns. I think that's what he means, said Pax. Quiet. Why cannot I have quiet? When I grew up in Siberia, if we were disrespectful to our teacher, they would put us out in the freezing cold without a coat. You learned quickly not to step out of line, said Profess Vladimir as he slapped the back of his hand into his palm. Janelle shot Pax a mischievous look, then slowly raised her hand. Yes, Miss Morrison. He never raised his voice, but it always sounded like he was shouting. I thought we were training unicorns today, not whatever it was you said. The comment, despite the sarcasm, came out so sweetly that the professor paused before answering. The name unicorn, the image of the white horse with a horn, is pure marketing. Minoceros, the proper name, Miss Morrison, if you've been reading up on your binomial nomenclature, is not the friend of virgins and purifier of bad deeds that you might have been led to believe. In the 1950s, after the Great War, there was a man who had thousands of hungry monoceros, but had no desire to feed them any longer, so he concocted that terrible lie about unicorns so he could sell them to unsuspecting parents. After a few kids were killed or maimed, they were banned from sale around the world. And that is because they are, without a doubt, the most fearsome war animals I have ever had the pleasure of working with, but have no doubt that if you do not demand their respect, and I mean demand, you will pay the ultimate price. The professor made a slicing motion with his hand, and the fifth-year student who was his assistant opened the doors on a tunnel that led to the grounds. A pair of unicorns, Pax refused to think of them as monoceros, thundered into the riding area. Both were speckled gray, with a dark mane and a spiral horn sticking from the middle of their forehead. The whole class stepped back as they approached, the potency of their power as tangible as a knife to the throat. Kulak, said the professor, pointing to the ground next to him and then to the other side. Voina. The two beasts stomped and shook their manes, looking ready to break into a run. Pax had seen many dangerous creatures over the years at the zoo, but the unicorns embodied the word feral to her. The professor's calm demeanor between the two war beasts brought a grudging respect from the class, who shared reluctant, worried glances. The professor made a symbol with his fingers. The air around him sharpened, as if shone through a condensing lens, before returning to the regular humid condition. The two unicorns stilled, though the will to act rippled across their muscled bodies. He stepped to the beast on his right. Kulak is a male monoceros. Voina, on the other side, is female. There is little difference between the two genders. They are equally fearsome and deadly. To Pax's horror, Professor Vladimir grabbed the spiral horn, shaking it tightly. The horn on the monoceros not only gives the beast its name, but provides it a measure of its power. The spiraling horn material is harder than steel and can pierce through armor, whether that be the plate mail of ancient battlegrounds or the Kevlar of modern times. He pulled back his leather vest, reveling his bare chest and tapping on the star-shaped scar. A monoceros put its horn through a stone wall, 
and through my armor. Only fortune saved me from bleeding out on the battlefield. What war were you fighting in? asked Logan eagerly. The professor gave him a feral grin. That is a story for those who join my house, who wish to learn how to control fearsome beasts. The intensity of the professor's gaze gave Pax the shivers. Only Esmeralda's warning that there was no one more knowledgeable about his field of study, and that despite his methods she should do well to pay attention to him, made her slightly less revulsed. But notwithstanding the warning, she hated the idea of controlling the animals. She and Callie were a team, not bound by hierarchical command. As she thought about her little companion, the sense that she was nearby warmed to her mind. Pax glanced over her shoulder, catching Callie's dark form slinking through the bleachers. The fox was as curious as Pax about the other creatures on the campus, but she was technically not allowed in the barn. Pax sent Callie a mental reminder to stay out of sight. The monoceros horn has a second purpose. Much like a dolphin using sonar, except this is a magical effect, the monoceros can see everything on the battlefield out to a distance of 150 meters. They use this ability to see weaknesses in your defenses, gaps in the armor, even frailties in the human body that you didn't know you had. They can even detect creatures that hide themselves with camouflage, or the ones that attach themselves to others. In some realms they were used to hunt such creatures. But do not be confused, they do not wish to heal you but use that knowledge to kill you quicker. Under his breath, Liam said, nothing like a little pep talk to get you going. Today you are going to learn how to command the Minoceros. When you are training, there is little time for complex spells. You must be able to affect the creature, reminded of its training in short bursts. These are called marks, said the professor when he turned back to the class. Most of them are like a whistle a mundane trainer might use, or the whip of a circus tamer. There are others, advanced marks, that can injure and cause great pain, but you will not be learning those this year if ever. Today we are staying with the simple ones. The mark one used to calm the monoceros, remind them of who is in charge, was called stoi. Today you will learn to use the mark on them. He paused, examining the students with a furrowed brow. I will need two volunteers. Logan immediately shot his hand up, which brought a satisfied nod from the professor. Excellent, Mr. Lovelace. The hero of the third trial is quite welcome as a volunteer. The smug expression on Logan's face brought fists to Pax's sides, especially when he glanced directly at her. Logan joined the professor, standing at a spot in front of him, but not near the unicorns. When no second hand went up, Logan murmured something to the professor. His gaze fell directly on Pax, leaving her to shrink internally. Miss Nygaard, said Professor Vladimir, why don't you join us for a demonstration? Pax trudged to the spot he directed her to, glancing into the stands to see if she could spot Callie briefly before returning her attention to the professor. The two unicorns snorted and stomped their hooves at her approach, but Pax told herself that it wasn't at her just the restlessness of unbridled beasts. The professor squinted at the two unicorns, said something to them in Russian. The two beasts galloped away towards the fifth-year assistants who brought them food. Turn to me, he said. I will show you the mark. It is two small gestures. The professor slowed down the gesture. It was made of a two-finger separated hook and a cross-finger Y. You add a small amount of phase on the first, then double it on the second. If you struggle to make it, say the word stoi which will help you focus the mark. He showed them the gesture two more times while they repeated them. Logan picked it up on the first try, which only made her struggles with getting them right more challenging. The weight of everyone watching left her a little dizzy. Now, said the professor, use the mark with phase. But stand near your fellow students. I would like them to feel the sensation of the effect. Logan strode to the front, shoulders back and chin up. Thrusting his hand forward with flair, he shouted, Stoy. The air around Logan condensed like a sudden air pressure drop. An unpleasant sensation hit her ears. She just wanted to curl into a ball for a moment. Very good, Mr. Lovelace. That was an excellent first use. You don't need to add that flourish, you want speed rather than style, but I appreciate the extra effort, said the professor. He turned to Pax. 
Now for you, Miss Nygaard. Do not disappoint. The effects of the mark still reverberated through her ears, making it hard to focus. It felt like a gong had been rung between her ears. Miss Nygaard, any time. If you would have needed the mark, you would already be dead now. Chop chop, he said, clapping his hands twice crisply. As Pax prepared herself, summoning the phase to her mind, which always was an effort, the lingering effects of Logan's mark made her nauseous. With the weight of everyone's gaze upon her, she thrust out her hand, fumbling through the symbols with her fingers. Stoy. The first attempt did nothing but give her a headache. She looked back to the professor. Again. Pax blew a breath out. Made the gesture. Stoy. Nothing came. It was like the phase had gotten jammed in her mind, leaving her squinting with pain. Miss Nygaard, now you are dead three times over. This is not a difficult mark. If you cannot master this, you will not be long for this hall. I'm sorry, Professor, said Pax, massaging away the ache in her temples. Logan's mark made me dizzy. The Professor guffawed, placing his hands on his hips. You are not a monoceros, Miss Nygaard. And you have not been trained to the mark. Please do not give excuses for your failures. Accept them like a real mage and learn. You could do well to watch the example of Logan here. He is an excellent student. I see great things in him. The teeth-bearing grin on Logan's face made Pax sick to her stomach. Again, Miss Nygaard. She made the gestures. Stoy. Nothing. Again. Pax closed her eyes briefly before trying again. Stoy. A void opened in her chest when she heard the first chuckle from her fellow first years. She knew it was one of Logan's cronies, but it didn't matter. The sound was like a stab to the back. Again, Miss Nygaard. You are dead what six times now? Pax opened her eyes, searching for her friends. She found Janelle in the front. She'd moved forward so she could see her. She gave Pax a comforting nod, as if she were willing her to succeed. Pax summoned her resolve and thrust out her hand. Stoy. The air briefly condensed. No more than a soccer ball-sized displacement, but the release of Faze from her mind brought sweet relief as the tension melted away. Very good, Miss Nygaard. Your corpse is quite littered with holes, but you succeeded, said the professor drolly. Now I want you to form up in two lines and perform the mark. Pax hurried from the spotlight, losing herself in the group. Janelle grabbed her hand, squeezed it. You okay? I swear Logan's mark affected me. I felt like I'd been punched in the gut. I'm not great at magic, but that only made it worse, said Pax. I believe you, said Janelle. Just hearing those words took the foot off Pax's chest, allowing her to breathe easier. As the other students practiced the mark for the professor, Pax stood in back, making the sign without phase. She might be a slow learner, but she knew she could get there eventually. After everyone had performed the mark for the professor, he had them line up again, one before Kulak and the other for Voina. Pax and her friends picked Voina while Logan's group took Kulak. You will now use Stoy on the Monoceros, but not stationary. The Monoceros will run past you, and you must use the mark to make them stop. Fear not, Kulak and Voina are as tame a Monoceros as exists anywhere in the realms, said the professor. The relief was palpable when Pax was not forced to be an early demonstrator. At least the professor knew better than to repeat her performance, but that didn't leave her any less nervous as she waited for her turn. You'll be great, said Janelle. Focus on the details, not the result. That's what my trainers always tell me, and it works. Thanks, Janelle, said Pax. I'm not used to being nervous around animals, even supernatural ones. I don't think it's the unicorns making you nervous, said Janelle, glancing over her shoulder at the professor. Liam and Janelle went before Pax. They both performed the mark well enough to earn a compliment from the professor stopping Voina in her tracks as she trotted past. When it came time for Pax's turn, she approached the designated spot, taking deep breaths to calm her beating heart. She was standing well away from everyone else, alone in the middle of the grounds, and the separation felt like she was swimming alone in the ocean surrounded by sharks. 
Pax glanced into the stands, looking for Callie as she wiped her palms on her jeans. The thoracic fox had hidden herself well, but she knew that she was somewhere nearby. Voina Nachet, said Professor Vladimir. The unicorn had been standing a short distance away. The muscled war beast snorted, shaking its horn, before beginning its trot towards her. While she hadn't been watching every other student perform the test, she'd been aware enough to know the snort and headshake was different than other attempts. She pushed the thought from her mind that something was wrong, focusing on the details as Janelle had said. While she was in line, she'd made the gesture for the mark enough times she was confident about that part of the test, but a lingering doubt shaded her mind as the unicorn thundered towards her with its head lowered. Standing on the dirt, alone at the center of the grounds, Pax lifted her hand, preparing the phase in her mind. But the unicorn wasn't heading past her, as she'd sworn it had for the others, but directly at her. Pax took a step to the side, and the unicorn adjusted its trajectory towards her. Steady, Miss Nygaard, said the professor from the head of the class. Steal your nerves. The unicorn was definitely heading directly at her, shaking its head as if something was bothering it. The creature made stomping gallops, lifting its hooves higher as if it were preparing to smash her head in. With a surge of adrenaline, Pax performed the mark, thrusting her hand at the unicorn. Stoy! The air around her condensed, the mark going off as well as she might have hoped. The dislocation made her right ear pop from the change in pressure. But the unicorn was not daunted by her spell, only momentarily slowed, then it reared up, forcing Pax to throw herself to the side to avoid getting kicked in the head. From her back, she made the mark again. Stoy! The effect was even more powerful than the first, the sphere of change stretching as wide and tall as a car, but the unicorn was not stopping. She was aware that the professor was running towards her, shouting at Voina in Russian, but there was no way he would reach her before the unicorn would stomp her brains out. Then she felt the cool presence of Callie. It wasn't in her mind, but she was psychically connected to her companion, so she felt the intention as the thoracic fox stopped Voina in her tracks. The unicorn shook her mane as if trying to dislodge an unpleasant rider, then turned and sped away, running around the outside of the grounds. Professor Vladimir extended his hand to pull her from the dirt. His jaw pulsed with thoughts. He studied her briefly, then looked around the barn as if he suspected something. My apologies, Miss Nygaard, said the professor with unexpected softness as he searched her with his eyes. Voina has never reacted like that before. Your marks were correct, but she did not stop. The fault is mine, though I am not certain what transpired. He paused, releasing her hand. Are you injured? Do you require medical attention? No, she said, knocking the dirt from her jeans while keeping a wary eye on Voina, who was being calmed by the student assistants. The wild eyes of the unicorn brought doubt to Pax. What did it see in her that had enraged it? In her heart she knew it was the bad thing, the part of her that was rotten, that she had to fight against, always. The professor brought the students together near the exit. Everyone was staring at Pax with concern and curiosity, as if she'd suddenly grown a second head. She looked away before their scrutiny brought tears. Today's class is complete. Before our next lesson, you must memorize and practice the 15 comment marks. You will be given the tome on your way out. I suggest you find a patch of grass in the common areas for your practice, as some can be quite unpleasant for those nearby. As they filtered out of the barn, collecting tomes from an upperclassman along the way, Janelle and Liam crowded around her. What happened out there? It looked like Voina tried to kill you, said Liam. Felt that way too, said Pax, squeezing the thin tome to her chest. Do you think Logan sabotaged you somehow? asked Janelle as she nodded towards the group that was laughing and pointing at them on their way out. No, I don't think so, said Pax after a moment of thought. Even if it's something he would do. He's still pissed about what happened in Portland, and probably about Edgar too. It was easier to think about Logan as the cause, and not herself, but those thoughts stayed near the surface ready to bubble up. They had a bit of free time that afternoon, so everyone went their separate ways. Pax went back to her room, wishing Callie was there for comforting cuddles on the bed, but the space was empty. 
Chapter 20 The Invictus Menagerie and Crypto Zoo was closed on Mondays. The school used that day to work with the animals, so the grounds were filled with scattered students, some working with individual animals, others in groups, like Pax and fellow first years with Professor Didi. The professor led them along the concrete pathways on the gray November day. Clouds covered the tip of the spire, which made it look like it was a pillar holding up the sky. But the gloom could not detract from Pax's mood. Her heart burst with excitement at finally getting to enter the zoo. The professors had lectured them constantly that they had to master the basic work before they would be allowed around the animals on a regular basis. Pax understood the precaution. Her experience with the unicorns had been quite instructive, but that didn't make it any less exciting to finally have the reins loosened. Those are the ur bears said Pax, bouncing on her heels as she pointed into an enclosure where bear-sized creatures with wide front-facing eyes and glistening black beaks roamed. Whoa, oh, freaky, said Liam. They look like giant owls with fur rather than feathers. Bet they'd rip your face off if they could. Probably not, said Pax. Most of the animals in this zoo aren't really that dangerous. That's why it's so open and easy to move around. The Portland Zoo uses domes and enchanted glass and all kinds of wards to keep the animals and the patrons safe, but that requires a lot more money and security. You'd think animalians would have that, said Janelle. This poor ass hall? I'm not sure about the women's bathrooms, but half the sinks in ours are cracked or the hot water doesn't work, said Liam. I mean, does it really matter that much, said Pax sprightly. Her friends shared a glance. You're practically jumping out of your shoes, said Janelle. Floating above the concrete is more like it, said Liam. Professor Didi stopped them at the charo cages. She kept her hands clasped before her upper torso, and her thick glasses made her eyes larger than normal. Today we are going to learn the art of scraping. This is the practice of borrowing certain abilities from animals for a short time, but there are many restrictions to this practice. The first is that you cannot use an ability that you do not physically have said Professor Didi. The pace of her diction implied a pause between every word, giving the flow of her explanation a meandering feel. If you do not have gills, scraping from a fish will fill your lungs with water. If you cannot breathe fire, scraping from a dragon will only give you a sore throat. Instead, using scraping you might borrow the dexterity necessary to climb into a tree during your studies. Assuming you have the upper body strength, to accomplish such a task. Be careful not to stretch yourself too far, or you might pull a muscle or damage yourself in other ways. From the right side of the group, Jackson raised his hand. He had russet brown skin and a constellation of freckles across his nose. Pax had practiced her marks with him on days when Liam or Janelle were busy. If there are so many limitations, asked Jackson when the professor called on him, how is it even useful? Aren't there better methods for climbing into trees? Potions, whatever. An excellent question, Jackson, said the professor. There are always better methods. This university is filled with halls that can teach you ever more powerful ways to accomplish a task. There is an attraction to such methods, whether it is a god fetish or simple hubris, but know that power comes with a price. The scholar mage Ali Al-Hedi said it best as Istikdam Al-Takat Bikafa, which translates loosely as use power efficiently. As a mage you should treat your craft like a martial artist, applying pressure or magic in this case only as much and in the right quantity as necessary. The dangers of spells gone wrong by overexuberant mages could fill a thousand libraries. So yes, you could drink a potion that would give you super strength to climb into the trees, but the safer version is to scrape the ability from a nearby charo. And while some might decry this as cowardice that mages should expend their power if they want to, know that the nature of our hall, dealing with supernatural creatures, comes with its own dangers, so minimizing the ones you might cause yourself is best. The professor paused to let her message sink in, before opening her hands briefly as she asked, Now who would like to tell me what a charo is? Pax flung her hand up right away, catching mirthful tugs of the lips from her friends. Yes, Pax. She cleared her throat. Acharo is from the Chimeratic Kingdom, a magical creation, full name is Ursus Volantes. The origin is thought to be from the 5th century AD, 
when a black bear was combined with a Karchira. They are partially nocturnal, herbivores and insectivores, can climb extremely well, and can make grand leaps between trees as if they were a sugar glider. Their supernatural abilities allow them to balance on high places despite their medium size, and they have natural psychic camouflage when they sense danger. Very good, thank you Pax, said the professor. The nervousness Pax felt in the barn was nowhere to be found. The zoo was her native environment. Today, said the professor, we're going to scrape the climbing ability from the charo. The simple task is to borrow from our furry friends and ascend into the trees. After entering a code into the touchpad by the entrance, Professor Didi led the class into the enclosure. A tall fence with minor runes across the top surrounded a dozen wide canopy oaks that had lost their autumn leaves. As the class crunched into the charo cage, Pax spied the charos huddled in the upper branches, staring wide-eyed at the students who had invaded their humble territory. They were no bigger than a small child, maybe sixty pounds with slick brown-gray and black speckled fur that blended in with the oak bark. Now you all should have learned the spell before coming here today, so I won't bother with testing your knowledge. Please spread out amongst the trees, find a charo to scrape, they only need to be within thirty feet, and climb into the oak tree when you are ready. From the back half of the group, Logan muttered, this is lame. We should be scraping something cooler than magical pandas. Professor Didi either didn't hear Logan or chose to ignore him. Everyone spread out. No more than three to a tree. Pax and her friends hurried towards the back of the enclosure, kicking up dead leaves as they ran. Let's pile these up to jump in them from above, said Pax laughing. The oak tree in back had a big knot on the side. The trunk extended ten feet overhead, before the first branch was available. A pair of charo clung to the middle section staring down at them but not making any move to escape higher. Can I go first? asked Pax biting her lower lip pensively. I wouldn't dare make you delay any longer, said Liam. Janelle flourished her arm. I defer to the lady with red hair. The spell was simple enough. The hardest part was keeping her focus on the specific charo in the trees she wanted to borrow from. It would be a hilarious mistake to accidentally scrape from a beetle on the trunk below the charo. Pax felt no resistance when the spell completed, only a desire to crunch down on a grasshopper that she saw flinging itself between the trees. Rather than place her hand on the knot, which her human brain would have thought would be the logical place to pull up on, she wedged her hand in a fold in the trunk and jammed her foot atop a root. During the following seconds, Pax scrambled up the trunk. Her hands and feet found purchase in unexpected places, and before she could even comprehend it, she was standing in the second level of branches about thirty feet high without holding onto a steadying limb. The charo across from her ambled higher, moving through the tree like an agile lemur, constantly glancing back at her to confirm she wasn't following. Inspired by the furry critter, she leaped through the branches, swinging upward, knowing that her shoulders would ache tomorrow from the effort, but wanting to enjoy the freedom in the trees. When she was seventy feet in the air, Janelle called up, You're making me anxious, Pax. I feel great, said Pax, balancing on a limb the width of a baseball bat. I can't put a foot wrong. Her weight bowed the branch, but even the gentle swaying couldn't upset her balance. In a fit of exuberance, Pax circled the upper branches, leaping from branch to branch, ducking under limbs while balanced precariously. She was having the time of her life. As Pax came back around the oak, thinking it might be time to return to the ground so her friends could have a turn, she caught sight of Logan, who was in the oak across from her, peeking around the trunk. She lifted her arm to flip him off as his lips moved, and his fingers executed a spell. The scent of burnt ozone hit her nose, and the branch she was standing on cracked. Had she been on the inner ring, she could have easily grabbed a nearby limb, but she'd been pushing the edges of her ability, and was on the far edges of the canopy. There was nothing but empty air around her. As her solid footing evaporated, instinct kicked in, and Pax found herself against her human judgment pushing off, leaping outward rather than trying to control her fall. For a brief terrifying moment, she was between the trees. As most of the class had their heads turned upward, she heard a collective gasp as she flew through the air. Time stretched out. 
The ground was sixty feet beneath her. But then she was careening into the oak across from her. She landed on a thick branch heavily, compressing her legs to absorb the impact. Adrenaline flooded into her the moment after she landed. Her hands shook but still she balanced effortlessly. Multiple exclamations of incredulity floated up from below at her display. She looked back at where she'd come from, only to find that rather than a ten-foot gap as she first thought she'd leapt, it had been thirty or forty feet from branch to branch. She could have died. He'd almost killed her. Pax's first thought was to bound back up the tree, grab him by the scruff of the neck and toss him headfirst to his death. It would feel good, it would feel right. She knew she could do it too. He'd be shocked by her advance, and he'd be flying towards the ground before he could do anything about it. But the rage that brought her vengeful visions came with the shame of lost control. When she looked up to where Logan was hiding, she saw a strange mixture of awe and relief, which quieted her rage at what he'd done, because she could tell he hadn't meant to throw her out of the tree. Pax easily climbed down to the ground to the applause of her classmates, with the bad thing firmly in her thoughts. Well done, said Professor Didi. I've never seen such a magnificent display of scraping in a first year. That level of transference is something I might expect in a fourth or fifth year. What happened? asked Janelle as she ran up eyes wide with worry. Pax bit her lip. The branch broke. Both Janelle and Liam glanced up at Logan, who was making his way down from the upper branches, frowns deepening. I do hope that you will consider shifters for your eventual home, Miss Nygaard, said the professor when she approached. I think you would do well in my house. Pax smiled but said nothing, only giving a slight nod as acknowledgement. The professor continued through the grounds, speaking to the other students, leaving them alone. When Logan got to the ground, Liam grabbed him by the shirt, causing a confrontation between the two groups. You almost killed her, said Liam, lips curled in rage. Logan had his mouth screwed to the side, but made no effort to stop Liam. I was only messing with her, said Logan, forehead hunched. I swear. I didn't think the branch would break. Only give you a scare. Assholes like you never think about the consequences, said Janelle, crossing her arms. Logan shook off Liam's grasp, moving back with his friends. Sometimes jokes go too far, isn't that right, Pax? That damn octopus keeps leaving dead fish in my bed, and you broke my nose once over a misunderstanding, so the way I see it, we're both to blame for our actions. The momentary remorse was replaced with smugness as Logan walked away. It's okay, said Pax, thinking about her own mental loss of control. Let it go. School is hard enough without stupid rivalries. He almost killed you, said Liam, opening his palms. I survived and maybe this taught him a lesson not to pull pranks, said Pax. Janelle gave her a look. Do you really think that? As she watched Logan go back to laughing with his friends, gesturing over his shoulder at them, the feeling that it was over dissipated and was replaced with regret. Pax sighed. Do animals ever really change their nature? Chapter 21 it really tastes like that feeling you get when you see someone you really like for the first time, said Janelle, wide-eyed as she kept licking the ice cream sitting precariously atop her cone. Like even the weird squishy sensation in the gut. Pax held her ice cream up to Callie, who was curled around her shoulders as a furry fox scarf, but she shook her head, which was unusual because she loved sugary treats. Mine tastes like a warm summer night when the fireflies are out and nothing seems like it can ever go wrong, said Pax with a sigh. Janelle spread out her arms and made a joyful spin as they meandered down the sidewalk. City of fucking sorcery, Bobby. I can't believe I'm actually here. Pax held onto her ice cream cone with both hands, protective of every last drop of the experience. I could order a gallon of this stuff, buckets of it, said Pax. If it wasn't so expensive. Thanks again. My parents didn't give me much of an allowance. Or at all, she thought to herself. Janelle shot her a wink. Any time. My parents have the money, and loads of upper-middle-class guilt. What are they like? asked Pax after she licked a drop of ice cream off the back of her hand. The way back to the campus from Psychic Cream was nearly a straight path, 
but it was long enough that they could enjoy their desserts while taking in the night views in the city. While she'd spent plenty of time in Portland, Baba liked to treat her with voodoo donuts after bad spells with her parents. A single ward of Invictus was like her home, which made the total size of the city bewildering. Janelle wrinkled her forehead. Demanding, dot but in a good way. Made sure I had the best education, private schools, magical tutors. There was something more in the way she said it, a faraway look, so Pax asked, why did you choose aura healers and animalians for your halls? Usually those kinds of resources get thrown at kids wanting to go to the big five. The way Janelle pulled away from licking the ice cream, as if she didn't want to taint the magic of the dessert with a memory, told Pax there was a lot more to her decision. She didn't get a chance to ask more questions, because a sharp stab of Callie's claw in her neck brought her to attention. The thoracic fox shifted on her shoulders and sent a sensation of anise, which was a signal for danger. Pax feigned a look at the lighted spire to have a reason to turn around, catching that two men were following them from half a block away. Janelle, said Pax. What's wrong, she asked right away. Pax kept herself facing forward, relying on Callie to warn her if they needed to flee. There are two men following us. They mean us harm. Janelle wrinkled her forehead. How can you know that? I, I just do, said Pax as a second deeper flash of Annis pulsed into her mind. Run. Callie leapt from her shoulder and they broke into a sprint. The two men were pounding after them, and two more she hadn't seen at first matched them on the other side of the street. Pax turned down the next street, away from the other men. Her legs burned as they pushed themselves, hoping to see a car passing or other pedestrians, but it was late, and the streets weren't as busy as they were before they headed to the ice cream shop. Allie, said Janelle, cutting behind some three-story brownstones. They ran another half-block before cutting up the next side street, hoping to confuse their pursuers. Janelle stopped them at a blue dumpster and checked inside. Let's hide in here, it's almost empty, she said. Pax helped Callie into the tall opening, then scrambled in herself, hoping they were quick enough that the men hadn't seen them sliding into the blue box. The inside of the dumpster stunk of old diapers and moldy trash, but at least there were only two or three bags on one side that they had to avoid. Pax stayed crouching on her heels, not wanting to put her rear against the gritty floor. Even before she heard the footsteps, Callie sent the danger signal, though not as strong as before, suggesting that their pursuers didn't know where they were. Pax tapped on Janelle's leg to warn her they were coming. I thought they went this way, or was it the next alleyway? Couldn't have gotten far. Damn it, Jakob, how could we lose them, and I bet that fox is worth a pretty penny. The voices faded, leaving them in darkness. A little bit after they left, Janelle put her fingers on Pax's forehead, and the world bloomed into view. Janelle placed a finger against her lips, then cast another spell, rubbing her fingers on the inside of the rusty dumpster. Okay, said Janelle in a whisper, we can talk. I put a silent spell on the walls, so they won't be able to hear us. Nice, said Pax. Where'd you learn that one? Janelle coyly glanced to the side. I used it on my room when my boyfriend would come over. Pax couldn't imagine bringing a boy or even a friend to her house, which was why she stuck to her animal friends since they could stay in the shed out back. Now the bigger question is why those dudes were chasing us, said Janelle. They're after Callie, said Pax which brought the fox's head up. They must think she's supernatural, or something. I hate to think what they'd do to her. I wish I could do real magic, like Coterie or Arcanium. Then those guys wouldn't have bothered us. Janelle tilted her head. Must think she's supernatural, said Janelle. Pax, if we're going to be friends, you're gonna have to be honest with me. I don't know what kind of fox Callie is, but she's not a regular run-of-the-mill silver fox. Sometimes when she's cuddling with me, I get these sensations that I know are coming from her. And how did you know those men were following us without even looking back? Plus the comments you make to her. You might be fooling everyone else, but you're not fooling me. Pax wanted to tell Janelle, but there were so many things they didn't know about each other, and Callie had been with her for so long, she didn't want to risk the discovery that she wasn't just a silver fox. I am, um, it's complicated, said Pax, grimacing at the need to evade. 
Janelle's lips had come to a severe point. Pax. We are hiding in a dumpster, because men we don't know want Callie. You've put my life in danger, which I can accept if I understand why. Stop bullshitting me. I'm your friend. A wave of emotion crashed into Pax, leaving her to thumb away wetness at the corner of her eyes. She offered a quivering smile, as apology. Callie is a Volpe's thoracic. She's psychic. That's why you feel certain ways around her. She can project her feelings into your mind. When I tended the dangerous animals in my shed, she would help calm them so I could work on them safely. She's my best friend. Please don't tell anyone, said Pax. Callie placed her paw on Janelle's bent knee. I would never, she said with a knotted forehead. I can keep a secret. No one else knows, well maybe Esmeralda suspects but the few times she met Callie she never said anything, said Pax. Janelle grabbed Pax's hand and squeezed it tight. I won't say anything. Merlin it stinks in here, said Pax wrinkling her nose. Better than being out there, said Janelle, then leaned down to Callie. Are they still out there? The little fox sent Annis, which brought revulsion to Janelle's lips. Ow, I hate black licorice. That means bad, right? Pax nodded. I guess we're waiting it out. Probably best, said Janelle. But my thighs are burning from being crouched like this. You know my secret now, said Pax. Tell me something about you, like why you only picked aura healers and animalians. It seemed like there was something more to it than just a preference. Janelle closed her eyes for a moment, memories painful memories clearly passing through her. She swallowed and looked away. When I was younger, I adored my older brother, Lamar. Worshipped him. We were on the way to his lacrosse practice. I loved to watch him play. She paused, the corners of her mouth wanting to tug upward but the weight of her thoughts kept them down. As she summoned the will to speak again, her expression contorted until she seemed in great pain. Her voice, normally warm in tone, rose and cracked. We were laughing. He was always teasing me about my grades. He was a really good student, honor roll and everything. Wanted to be a vet or sports medicine, but not a lick of magical ability. He was always challenging me to do better, like a big brother should, but it wasn't mean, never mean, he would sit with me at night, help me with my homework. Boring ass stuff. I hated it. I'd been tested early for magic, thought I was destined to be some great mage, and that I didn't have to worry about regular schoolwork. He called me just Janelle, as in, if you don't study, you won't make it into the halls, you'll be just Janelle. She went perfectly still, staring at the rusty interior of the dumpster. Callie whined in sympathy, pressing her head against Janelle's chest, and Janelle absently rubbed it. He ran a stop sign. I was calling him Lucky Lamar, poking him in the side. He was ticklish. Lucky Lamar loves lacrosse. We were laughing hysterically. Never saw the dump truck. She stalled. Flipped us a bazillion times. We landed in someone's yard. His side of the car was crushed. He was covered in blood, so much blood. Her eyes were the size of moons. Pools of memory. I held his hand. He was choking on his own blood. I couldn't do anything, I was trapped in the car with him. I wanted to be out. I was afraid to be with him, until the end. How do you deal with holding someone's hand as they die, when you're only ten? Your only brother. The one you look up to, would do anything for. The dumpster was as quiet as a tomb for a long time. Pax held her breath until it burned in her chest. When Janelle finally spoke again, it was in a whisper. I couldn't do anything for him. I'd been so proud of my magical ability. My potential. She said the word like an insult. But I could do nothing, nothing for him. Janelle sniffed and wiped her nose on the sleeve of her shirt. Pax matched her gesture. When I asked my parents for tutors or really anything, they never balked, said Janelle. I never told anyone else that he actually died while I was there, well, except my therapist. But they didn't need to know that, to know why I wanted to be in aura healers, or animalians. I don't ever want to be in a situation where I can't do anything about someone or something dying.
I don't want to feel that helpless again. Not ever. Though she had to put her knees on the grimy bottom of the dumpster, Pax leaned over and put her arms around Janelle. As soon as she heard a sob, she responded with her own until they were both crying. After a few minutes, they pulled away, and Janelle pointed to her jeans. You're going to have to burn those now, she said, laughing with tears in her eyes. Callie stretched herself up the side of the dumpster. Free to go? asked Pax. With the all clear given, they climbed out of the dumpster and made their way back to the street. The rest of the way back to Animalians, they kept checking over their shoulder. When they got to the campus, Pax let herself relax. Do you think we should tell someone about it? asked Pax. I have a meeting with Professor Keiko tomorrow, said Janelle. I'll tell her. Back in their room after a shower and a trip to the campus laundry, Pax tried to study, but the events of the night kept her from focusing for long. She was going to curl up with Callie on the couch, but the fox had left for the nightly hunt. Pax slept alone. Chapter 22 Professor Cassius wasn't standing on the pendulum beam or atop the cadaver slide like he normally was at the beginning of class. Instead he stood behind dozens of pairs of rubber shoe coverings, which sat in a line in the dirt, resulting in curious glances from the students. G morning class. As you can tell, we're not going to be having our normal funsies with the training equipment," said the professor in his cheery Australian accent. Others like to describe the professor like a human-sized rhinoceros without the horn given his girth and density, but Pax liked to think of him as a mountain goat because he never stayed still and liked to balance atop the various yard equipment. Oh, thank Merlin, said Janelle under her breath. My ribs still hurt from falling off the spinner last week. Not a member of the class had escaped a bruise or minor injury. The second years had warned them they'd be lucky if there were only a half dozen broken bones during the year. I have a special treat for you, said the professor in his safari gear, hands on his hips in a wide stance. We're going on a field trip, right beneath the bits of this old city. We're going into the Undercity? asked Linus Froth, a pale fellow first year who had a knack for their shifter classwork. Oh no, not yet, bloody hell, no way would I take a group of first years into that place. No, we're heading into the sewers, said Professor Cassius. A friend of mine in the sanitation department said they'd been finding body parts in the tunnels beneath the seventh ward. They've had to curtail maintenance of the equipment while the creature is hunting, which is why he called me. What's hunting there? asked Jackson from the back. The professor cocked a grin, looking like a ten-year-old boy on Christmas morning. That's what we aim to find out. Should be a beauty of a trip. Get your booties on, it's going to be messy. The journey to the nearby ward on the rail line brought a lot of stairs, because they were obviously hall students. The tourists moved away from the group, as if they were expecting a battle on the train, while the locals smirked. A guy in a dark blue maintenance jumper with dirty brown hair greeted them at a squat concrete building in the seventh ward, which was known for its bars and nightlife, but had a substantial residential section. It was a popular place to live if you were a young mage. Sanchez, bloody hell, good to see you, said the professor, throwing his enormous arms around the sanitation worker. The hug looked like Sanchez had been swallowed by a kraken. The attention seemed to embarrass Sanchez. I opened up the gate for you. Here's a map to the local tunnel system. I marked where the body parts have been found and um, the new one isn't far from here. A right, there was half a chewed foot down along this curve, mate, he asked as he poked a big finger into the map. Yeah, that was the last one, said Sanchez. Lost my lunch in the water, then got the hell out of there. At least it hasn't been any of my team, but still. That's all right, said the professor. We'll take care of ya, beastie. Sanchez nodded, then walked off shaking his head, as if he couldn't believe that they were all willingly heading into the sewers after the creature. All right, everyone, said the professor as he handed them a backpack full of flashlights. When we step inside the structure, no enchantments for now. We don't yet know if the critter can smell phase or other nasty business. Great, muttered Janelle. We're going down unwarded into the sewers with a monster that doesn't like feet. This is usually the part of the horror movie where I'm telling myself, 
No way I would go in there, said Liam. Yet here we are. I'm sure it can't be that bad if he's taking us as a group, said Pax with a shrug of the shoulder. Safety in numbers. The sewer tunnels consisted of an eight-foot-wide trough of dirty, flotsam-filled water, with two concrete paths wide enough for single-file travel. Every fifty feet or so, a short bridge crossed between the two sides. Pax and her friends traveled at the front of the group, right behind Professor Cassius. About three hundred feet from the entrance, an open door to a maintenance room had caution tape across it. He pulled a knife from a sheath and sliced through the yellow plastic tape for the class to enter. Everyone gathered in the room, which was large enough they only had to stand too deep. The high ceiling and crisscrossing pipes with numerous shut-off wheels suggested the area was frequently used by the sewer maintenance staff. Interesting, said the professor as he examined a bloody hunk of flesh with his flashlight. That's a human foot all right. A piece of bone stuck from the bloody meat, which had been torn from a leather shoe that lay a few inches away. The area was smeared with muck dark enough to be confused with blood. The professor motioned for them each to come close and examine the half foot. A few people had to stifle retching, but no one threw up. Pax found the serrated marks on the bone a little chilling, but looking at it up close wasn't as bad as she thought. As you all know, the first thing you do when hunting a critter is to try and identify what sort of pretty beastie you're after," said Professor Cassius as he stood over the half-chewed foot. What did we learn in looking at this tasty little snack? A voice from the back, Brianna's by the high inflection sang out, could use a few more minutes on each side. The joke brought laughter. The professor with his hands on his hips asked, anyone else? The bone has jagged marks on it, said Janelle. Either it was a messy serial killer with a hacksaw, or the creature has serrated teeth. That was a ripper, Janelle, said the professor pointing at her. Nicely done. Anything else? That's a Bertoli leather shoe, probably run you 300 easily, said Logan. Not the usual take I was expecting, but useful in this situation. Makes you wonder why this bloke was down here. Not like he was on a Sunday walkabout said Professor Cassius. Liam gestured towards the concrete doorway. There are scrapes along the frame. Whatever did that was probably as tall as a Labrador retriever. Good mate. Where'd you learn that piece of tracking? said the professor, clearly impressed. I do trail maintenance out west, said Liam with his thumbs hooked into the top of his jeans in an unassuming manner. Picked up some tracking tips when we had to find lost hikers. So it seems I have quite a crew of first years. Not your usual duds, said the professor, shooting them a wink. Another thing to notice is the swish marks in the muck, heading towards the water. Whatever our not-so-little friend is, he's got a tail or something he uses for balance outside the water. Could it be a regular crocodile? asked Linus. Not likely, though I like what you're thinking, said the professor as he crouched down, pulling a knife from his hip sheath and dug out a hunk of gooey translucent material that looked like snot. Some sort of gunk here smells like rust. Not the sort of thing that comes off a crock. He flung the snot against the wall, wiped the tip of his blade off on his cargo pants, and shoved the knife back into its sheath. But a fair question. Now we need to apply what we've learned to our environment. Sewer, water. Dark tunnels. Not a lot of food for a big critter. Maybe unused reagents in the water, old potions or elixirs flushed down the toilet, that sort of thing. Anyone have any guesses about what our pretty little beastie might be? A changeling lizard, said Jackson, screwing up his face. I think it's, um, Mobian leechethok. People like to keep them as pets because they change colors when they're small, but the bigger ones become dangerous and they get dumped into sewers or country ponds. Good, Jackson. Expand on that, said the professor. Let's hear more about bachelor number one. Jackson put a hand to his forehead and closed his eyes as if he were reading a book in his mind. I think they're warm-blooded, have a short lifespan, five or six years, and are asexual. The professor tapped on his exposed teeth. What about the chompers? Oh yeah, flat, not serrated. They swallow small animals and digest them in their four stomachs said Jackson, screwing his face up with disappointment. Anyone else? asked the professor. 
Ithacus Draglon, Pax blurted out. She continued, when the professor made a rotating motion with his hand. It's a tentacled slime fish. Prefers polluted waters, can live on waste while it's waiting for a carnivorous snack. Has eight limbs or foodlings, which it can use for land mobility, and like a prescale, which is both soft and chitinous and gives off a white milky mucus when molting. Pax snapped her fingers. Oh, and serrated teeth. Nasty looking ones. Might be a good candidate. We'll keep bachelor number two in the game, said the professor. But don't forget, the Ithacus draglon has a big appetite, and is native to cave systems in tropical regions. As other students threw out new ideas, Pax silently berated herself for not remembering those facts. Nice job, said Janelle, offering a low fist bump. Yeah, but he's right, I forgot about those other parts, said Pax. Should have kept my mouth shut. You say bachelor number three is a gethy etheric, Mr. Lovelace, said Professor. Care to expand? Commonly known as a bloat belly. They're omnivorous scavengers. Will eat anything, even an old tire or a body if it gets dumped into the sewer. Relatively harmless to humans. Some East Asian countries use them in their sewer systems to keep the waters from clogging up. Has serrated teeth, but they're not as sharp as they look. Made for scraping algae from walls, and they look like manatees but have a weird tail thing. I like what you're brewing there, Logan, said the professor, giving him a thumbs up. Maybe bachelor number three is in front. Could be a snogging good time, unless we have any other contenders. What about a ghostly hagfish? asked Brianna. And what is bachelor number four like? asked the professor, pulling out his knife again and holding it as if it were a microphone. Brianna bit her lower lip and closed one eye. They, um, are an ectomasorana. Phase mutated from the hagfish. I can't remember the rest. Oh, said the professor. Bachelor number four doesn't know where he wants to take our lucky lady. Can anyone help her? The ghostly hagfish is actually the ectomyxini gargantuan, but she's right about the phase mutation, said Pax. They have hundreds of tendrils which they can clump together like a tail or use like a limb. They can be a problem for small animals, but not really known for going after larger prey like humans. Not usual, but it's been known to happen, said Professor Cassius. Nice save for bachelor number four. I think this is a good lot. We'll consider the Ithacus draglon, Ectomyxini gargantuan, and Gethi Ethric. Now that we know who you might be going on a sewer side date with, the question is, what do we want to wear? How can we assure ourselves a long night between the sheets with our eligible bachelor without ending up his late night snack? Alaska 47, locked and loaded, said Logan, over his shoulder to his friends, gave him fist bumps and back pats. Seems like a good idea, until you hear something go sploosh in the water and accidentally spray your friends with a chest full of hot lead said Professor Cassius. Logan's lips squeezed white as he stared back at the professor. No worries, mate, said the professor. It's not that a gun can't be useful when hunting critters. I've used my fair share when the situation called for them. But they should not be your go-to tool. First and foremost, we do no harm unless we can confirm that the creature truly poses a danger to others. As we've discussed, one of our three bachelors is a scavenger. We could be dealing with a serial killer, as our horror-minded Miss Janelle suggested, who throws the body in the sewer where he knows his friend, Mr. Bloatbelly, will tidy up his business. We could end up killing a creature that poses no danger, or worse yet, something intelligent. Doesn't that put you at more risk? asked Jackson. It does, lad, it does, said the professor. But that's the deal. If you sign up to be a hunter, understand you're not going to be guns or spells ablazing. He glanced to the side. Well, mostly. There was this one time in the Eternal City, but that's a story for another time. He winked. The second problem with most guns is they are ineffective against the kind of critters we hunt. If it can be shot, it's probably already been dealt with. But let's say our date is bachelor number three, the Ecto Mixini Gargantuan. Shooting it won't do much more than give it a lead rash, as it has few internal organs, and it might convince it that you're dangerous enough to drag you in the water and drown you. 
hunters need to utilize the spells, potions, and enchantments specific for the target. Worried about a burrowing basilisk? Then use a rock skin enchantment, drink a coagulated antigen, and use a steel spear with 35.5% hardened copper nodules that will paralyze the critter when you stab it in the mouth when it tries to bite you. A bullet wouldn't get through its armor, and you'd be paralyzed as soon as you sighted it for a shot. Logan had slipped into the back of his crowd, silently fuming. Even in the quivering illumination of multiple flashlights, Pax could see his face was blotchy red. Before we move out, I want you each to apply a dark vision enchantment. We'll put the flashlights away now that we know we're not dealing with any phase sensitive creatures, said the professor. What about protections? asked Linus. No worries, mate. None of our bachelors is good in crowds. But if you want to fire a warning shot, use one of the five elements, fire or earth would be best. Just be careful where you aim, said the professor. Pax applied the dark vision enchantment on the first try. She was getting better at spellcasting. Janelle had been working with her on the five elements to help her finger articulation when they were bored from studying. The class finished their spells, the smell of burnt ozone lingering over the sewer water. Professor Cassius was at the doorway when they heard a man's scream echo through the tunnels. Crikey! He held a flat hand out towards the class. Everyone stay here. It sounds like our bachelor is on the hunt. He disappeared into the tunnel, leaving the class bewildered at the sudden change. Oh, don't look all worried, everybody, said Logan, striding into the center of the room. A fourth year told me he's a practical joker. I bet this whole thing is a setup, even that maintenance guy Sanchez. Probably a hunter too, and they get off on scaring us. I don't know, said Janelle shaking her head. That sounded pretty real. Scream gave me the shivers. Come on, said Logan, crouching by the half-chewed foot. Who leaves a body part? Wouldn't the police have been called already? Logan, this is the city of sorcery, the professors can do just about whatever they want here, said Brianna. He stood in the doorway, leaning out into the tunnel. I bet I know how this plays out. He's going to come rushing back, he'll have us follow him, and then his buddy will jump out at us, or they have some wooden contraption in the water that makes it look like there's a creature in the water. Come on you scaredy cats. This is all a ruse and you guys are the rubes. But as Logan wandered into the tunnel, none of his friends ventured with him. He stuck his head back into the room. Come on, said Logan. Don't be assholes. There's nothing to worry about. No way, said Chester. Joke or not, wandering around sewer tunnels is not my idea of good time, and he told us not to leave here. When it appeared none of his friends would go, Logan said, fine. I'll go bust this prank myself. After he left, the whole class stared at the empty door. Maybe we'll get lucky and he'll be eaten, said Liam. Pax elbowed him in the ribs at the same time Janelle punched him in the arm. Don't be a jerk, Liam. Logan might be an asshole, but we don't want him to be eaten, said Pax. Maybe just nod on a little nibble or a lost toe, said Janelle. Pax moved to the doorway and faced the class. Come on. We can't let Logan go out there alone. No way, said Chester. Cassius said to stay. I'm staying. The resounding line of nods made the class's intentions clear, so she motioned to her friends. Come on, said Pax. Janelle joined her right away, while Liam came only grudgingly. Pax led them the way she saw Logan go, which was in the same direction as the professor. This feels like a mistake, said Liam. Maybe I just want to see the dumbass get what's coming to him, said Pax shaking her head. But the reality is, that Logan will probably jump out from behind a corner, and I'll fall into the shit water. The tunnel split and they had to decide whether to continue straight ahead or take a bridge. Pax didn't know which way to go so she said, OK Mr. Tracker, come up here and tell me where they went. Liam, who was in back, slid by them on the water side. When he was at the front, he crouched down for a few seconds before pointing at the bridge. He went that way, said Liam. I see the print of his arcane trickster sneakers. You can tell them by the print, asked Pax. What is it with you guys and your sneakers? 
Hey, what can I say, he's got good taste in shoes. Poor kid like me is a little jealous, said Liam. The further away from the maintenance room they got, the more Pax worried she'd made a mistake in leading her friends into the tunnels. She was about to tell them they should head back when a flash of flame illuminated the room ahead, followed by Logan cursing and a hefty splash. They ran down the tunnel to a larger circular chamber, an overflow room with pipes and a rusted metal staircase that went up to a second level. The concrete was thick with white mucus and muck, making travel treacherous. When they arrived, Logan was hanging off a pipe barely sturdy enough to hold his weight. As the water shifted towards him, he lifted his feet, which only made the pipe sag further. Oh fuck, it's in the water. It's in the water and it's fucking big, said Logan, his face etched with fear. The pipe he clung to shifted, the structure groaning as the dirty brown water moved as if something was inside. Liam, who'd been in front, backed out of the room as a bulge in the sewer water moved towards them. He raised his hands, fingers articulating through the spell. A solid ball of earthen energy blasted from his hands, hitting the lumpy ridge that had risen from the water, diverting it back into the circular chamber. We need to get him down before he falls in, said Pax. Maybe we can reach him from that second level, pull him up, said Janelle, gesturing towards the rusty stairs. But we'll need to go into the chamber, said Liam. That thing could easily snatch you off the wall before you made it there. Distract it, said Pax. Step in, shoot it with earth magic, then when it comes back to you, I'll run along the other side. Are you sure, asked Liam. No, but do it anyway, said Pax. To get to the other side, she had to run back to a bridge that crossed the tunnel trough, then run back, pausing at the entrance. Where's it at, asked Pax when she returned. Janelle's face was bunched up. We lost it. Either it left the room, or this pool is deeper than we thought. Great, said Pax. The pipe holding Logan snapped a retaining wire, shifting him a few inches lower. I don't think this is going to hold me much longer, he said. Pax grumbled under her breath, then turning to her friend said, I'm headed around. Distract it if it surfaces. Before she lost her nerve, she ran around the two-foot-wide concrete path, holding her right arm out for balance on the slippery surface. Pax watch out! yelled Janelle. The surface of the dirty water bulged towards her, but she was only halfway around the curve, nowhere near the rusty stairs. Liam shot his earth magic into the water, but the creature was deep enough that it didn't impact. When she knew she'd run out of space, Pax leapt, grabbing for the overhead pipes, as something long and slimy reached out of the water where her feet had just been. The structure held her weight for a moment, but since she was on the same lines as Logan, after a few seconds there was a heavy snap, followed by steel busting away from concrete. She tried to swing herself away from the creature, but the momentum from the pipes threw her directly at it. As pipes cracked and steel sundered, Pax lost her grip and went into the water. Chapter 23 the water was cold, despite the muggy warmth of the tunnels. It was November outside. As she bounced off the slimy creature in the water, the odd thought, I'm going to die in November, ricocheted through her mind. What the hell did it matter which month? But then the chilly gross water went shooting up her nose. She managed to keep her mouth and eyes clamped shut, but the direction of up lost all meaning once she was beneath the surface. The only thing that saved her in those first few seconds was the pipe structure that collapsed into the dirty pool. She heard the creature's impact against the section of steel that had fallen around her, a teeth-rattling smack, a hard surprise that it hadn't expected. She kicked away from the creature, pulling herself through the pipes as the air in her lungs burned. She surfaced briefly to shouts and thrashing, before the metal slipped again, trapping her beneath the water before she could gather air. I'll die to drowning not the creature, thought Pax. She desperately wanted to open her mouth, as she struggled to find the surface. It ached burned, to not be able to breathe. The muddy concrete slammed into her knuckles as she fought forward. She thrashed beneath the water trying to find a way up, a way out. Something grabbed her by the arm, and she nearly opened her mouth to scream. Pax was pulled up onto the ledge by a wet Logan covered in muck. The cool inrush of air to her lungs was sweet relief. The metal structure had fallen around them both. They were on the far side of the pool. 
The creature was trapped under the pipes but was straining through them. A pale appendage slipped through the gap and wrapped itself around her ankle, pulling her back into the water. Logan snapped a piece of pipe that had already been bent in half and swung it into the appendage. It released from her leg, and she scrambled through the opening into the tunnel beyond the pool, but they were cut off from Liam and Janelle on the other side of the wreckage. We need to keep moving, she said, glancing worriedly at the dirty water. She climbed onto the path, followed by Logan as the creature pushed through the fallen steel. She ran ahead. Before they were twenty feet further down the tunnel, the structure snapped, and the creature splashed into the water behind them. It might have caught them quickly, had the width of the tunnel not been so narrow. Water spilled onto the pathway as the creature pushed ahead, forcing its bulk through the gap. Pax led Logan down the tunnel, hoping to find a cutoff that could lead them back around the other way, or a set of stairs heading up and out, but no exit appeared. They ran for a minute before the path opened up into a huge room, at least a hundred feet across. On the far side, a spillway went over, but there appeared to be no way out. We're trapped, said Logan as he craned his neck. There was no ledge that went around the room like the others. Only a large pool that led to the spillover. We have to go for the spillway, said Pax looking behind them. Are you insane? It'll catch us before we make it, and even then, why won't it just follow us? Do you have a better idea, she asked. Don't you know some magic that can deal with this? You're the zoo girl, he said. I am shit all with magic, said Pax. I'm a depository of useless knowledge at this point. The Ithacus Draglon is going to have us as a nice dessert after whoever else it ate. That's a ghostly hagfish, not a Ithacus Draglon, said Logan. I saw its weird appendage. It wasn't a tentacle. If it was a hagfish, then we might be able to scare it off by hitting it with that pipe. It might have just been trying to escape the falling metal, not trying to eat us, said Pax. But I don't think it was a hagfish. That appendage looked solid, not like hundreds of fleshy strands. He looked down the tunnel. Whatever it is, it's moving this way. I'll stay here and hit it with the pipe. If it's a hagfish, then we're good. If not, then what a fucking way to go. The idea was appealing to Pax. It would give her a chance to escape, and maybe the creature would be too full to come after her too. A surge of elation at the thought of Logan's demise was followed by shame, as she berated herself for even allowing that thought inside her head. This is what the bad thing is, she thought as she dug her fingernails into the palms of her hands. Wait, said Pax remembering what Professor Cassius had said about the Ithacus Draglon being native to tropical cave systems. If this thing lives in caves, it might be light-averse. It has eyes, but maybe a bright light will blind it, drive it away, or at least keep it from eating us. Pipe or light, he asked. The water in the tunnel was rising, suggesting the creature was getting closer. Pax dropped into the water of the large room. As she'd hoped, it was only up to her waist. Come on, she said as she waded toward the spillway. We can't fight it there. It'll just grab you with a tentacle and pull you in. But it'll just eat us, he said. It's big enough that it'll come out of the water. We can blind it with a light spell when it does, she said. Logan looked back into the tunnel before leaping into the water after her. I hope you're right. Me too, she said quietly. They were about halfway across the pool when the creature made it through the narrow tunnel. For a moment, she thought it might just stay at the entrance, content to be free of the confining space, but then the bulky creature sped towards them. The light spell sprung from Pax's fingers. Her enthusiasm brought a brilliant white flash that made her squint, but the enormous creature only slowed briefly, pushing through the water towards them, leaving her with inevitable dread. As it neared, it raised its head from the water revealing a circular mouth of jagged teeth. Logan had the pipe raised above his head to strike, but the size and speed of the Ithacus Draglon left little doubt to the conclusion to the encounter. The pipe strike would only be a minor bump against the tentacled slime fish. Before it reached them, a flash of green light filled the room from an unexpected source. The enormous toothy maw of the Ithacus Draglon emitted a screech of pain as it dove back into the water, 
giving them both a chance to throw themselves out of the way. The creature passed between them, its bulky body sliding past her hip. Get to the spillway, yelled Professor Cassius from the tunnel mouth as he jumped into the water, pulling out his knife and wading towards the slime fish. Come to me, you little beauty. Let me show you who you really need to be picking on. As Cassius pushed through the water, Pax and Logan made their way to the spillway. The Ithacus Draglon headed towards the professor, who was slapping the water with his free hand to get its attention. They reached the edge, at the same time the creature met the professor. Pax feared for his safety since the enormous toothy mouth could easily rip off his arm, but the professor dove to the side fast enough that it was like he was in two places at once, slamming his knife into the side of the creature. The Ithacus Draglon shrieked as the professor clung to the side of its head, holding on by the knife that had gone up to the hilt in the slimy pale flesh. A second knife from an inside pocket was shoved into a spot at the crown of the slime fish, and the thrashing ended with a polite shudder and then a slow sinking into the dirty brown water. After the professor dealt with the creature, he waded to the spillway. Pax and Logan were sitting on the edge, breathing heavily as moving through the water had drained them. Everyone okay? No bites or other wounds, he asked. They shook their heads. Good mates, said the professor, patting them both on the legs from his spot in the water. Are we in trouble? asked Pax. The professor glanced back at the floating corpse of the Ithacus Dragon. Trouble. No. This isn't high school, or even the regular mundane colleges you might have been at had you not come here. You made a decision and you paid the price. The consequences for a mage are a greater teacher than a pointless punishment. For what it's worth, said Logan, hanging his head, it was my fault. I left the group. Pax and her friends followed me to make sure I was safe. The admission surprised Pax, as she'd half expected him to blame her. When she looked his way, he even gave her a shrug as if to apologize for not playing into his type. A lesson survived is a lesson learned, said Professor Cassius. Now let's get the hell out of here. The three of them waded towards the tunnel. I can't wait for a shower, said Pax. I've never felt so gross. Oh, this isn't even the best part, said the professor, winking at them. The best part? asked Logan. You've been exposed to all sorts of nasty bugs in this water, not to mention that goo from our slime fish is toxic if consumed, and I'd wager a good bet that you've both gotten a good dose, said the professor. You'll feel it in your lips first, they'll feel tingly like they're going numb. Pax touched her lower lip, and now that he mentioned it, it felt like a piece of wax on her face. I'm still not understanding the best part, said Logan. Are we going to die from the toxic slime or sewer water? No mate but you'll wish you will, said the professor. Once we get you back to campus, we'll fill you up with some nasty elixirs that'll drive out the bugs, but you won't enjoy the experience. Great, said Pax, then passing the floating corpse of the tentacled slime fish she added, the green light. I was right that the creature was light averse, but its eyes have evolved differently in those cave systems. Aye, Pax, said the professor. It's the little details that matter if a hunter is going to live or die. Goes the same for mages in general, too. The caves that the slimefish live in have phase tainted fungi that put off a strange crimson light. They've evolved to see in it, but are vulnerable to the green spectrum. We're slaves to our evolution, said Pax. The professor grunted an acceptance of her melancholy as he wiped his knife off on his sleeve before shoving it back into the sheath. Some more than others. Chapter 24 In the weeks after the sewer incident, Pax had to take drafts of healing medicine every evening that tasted like charcoal and left her curled into a ball as her body expunged the toxins. Afterwards, she had to throw her clothes in the wash and spend another hour in the shower cleaning away the snot-like goo that had come out of her pores. Callie usually spent these times away from the nest due to their psychic connection. No reason for her companion to suffer as much as she did. The extra work on her spellcasting with Janelle was paying off, as it had in the sewer when she managed the light spell on the first try. While she wasn't about to pull off a complex binding or protective charm, she could at least manage the simple spells that most mages mastered before they even arrived at the school. 
She even had enough time to take up a job at the menagerie for spending money. It wasn't at the crypto zoo, which she would have liked, but at the campus building, usually feeding the birds that lived in the aviary, or Edgar and his aquatic friends in the giant saltwater tank, who spun with joy every time she approached with her bucket. The work afforded her a ring of keys and the passwords for the anti-lock enchantments, which would give her access to the low-level areas, which included the zoo grounds, so she could visit the ghost dogs or ur bears whenever she wanted. When the winter break came, Pax decided to stay in the city, partially because she didn't want to spend time at home with her parents. Being reminded of the bad thing that she'd done as a child only left her with a stomachache, so it was easier not to return. Even though Baba always told her that it hadn't been her fault, Pax had a lingering suspicion that her grandmother was merely trying to protect the emotions of a child, and that once she was free to tell her the truth, the real pain would come. She would use the time instead to make a little extra money, with additional shifts. So she was surprised when Esmeralda contacted her about having lunch. She was in town meeting a client and wanted Pax to come along. There'd been no mention of whether or not Callie could attend. So Pax decided that it would be mean to leave the little fox on campus since almost no one was around. Plus, she made a great neck warmer, as the city had been blanketed in a healthy layer of snow. Lunch was in the third ward, which required a train ride on the green line before switching to the red line. It took longer than she'd expected, so she was running late, but it didn't take away from the sights as she crunched across the snow to reach the restaurant, the Laughing Squid. The hostess barely batted an eye at Callie around her neck as she was led to the table. Esmeralda immediately rose in greeting at her arrival. There were two others seated, but they had their backs to her and she only had eyes for her friend. Pax? Essie? They threw their arms around each other, Esmeralda careful not to knock Callie from her perch. The thoracic fox licked her nose in greeting. Pax, I believe you remember Alfred Lovelace and of course you know his son Logan, said Esmeralda after pulling away. Pax stifled her grimace and Logan did the same, but Alfred rose and shook her hand heartily. The excitement that she'd enjoyed knowing she would get to spend time with Esmeralda was tempered by Logan's attendance. Lovely to see you again, Miss Nygaard, and congratulations on making it into Animalians, said Alfred, gesturing for her to sit next to Logan. Thank you, said Pax who let Callie down from her shoulders to sit on a fifth chair she pulled up, keeping herself between Logan and Callie. When Essie said she was meeting a client, I didn't realize how important. I assume it's Sue business. Of course, said Alfred shooting Pax a wink. She mentioned she was going to be in town, and since I have a place in the city, I thought it would be lovely to get together for a bite to eat, especially because the Animalians Hall has notoriously bad meals. And I thought it'd be fun to treat one of Logan's friends. Pax turned towards Logan, who at least had the decency to roll his eyes at being mentioned as a friend, while Alfred centered his attention on Callie, who was sitting attentively on the extra chair. And who is this little piece of magic? asked Alfred, grinning at the fox as he leaned in her direction. That's Callie. She's a silver fox, said Pax. Alfred squinted. It's lovely to meet you, Callie. Pax worried that she would react as if she understood him, but to her great relief, the fox lowered her head onto the chair, curling up into a ball with disinterest. She sleeps a lot, said Pax with a single shoulder shrug. Now before we catch up, said Alfred, placing his hands on the table as if he were about to tell them an important secret. Know that this restaurant is vegan, but don't be worried, they've got these spectacular techniques that fool you into thinking you're eating real meat. It's really delicious. This is one of Logan's favorite restaurants. You're vegan? asked Pax incredulously. Why so surprised? asked Logan with a curl to his lip. Aren't most students vegan in Animalians these days? In my time there were a good portion, but I thought that was pretty standard, said Alfred. She was sure she'd seen Logan eating meat in the cafeteria, which told her that he was lying to please his father, but not wanting to upset the table, she muttered, my mistake I guess. Though I will admit, I've had a hankering for octopus this semester, said Logan flatly. She stared back at him, as he met her gaze without blinking. I thought it might be old fish, 
she said eventually, then turned to Esmeralda. How's the zoo going? Her friend's eyes brightened. Really smoothly, actually. It's nice for a change. The Miss Dracons made it successfully this fall, and the terror bats molted without any psychic blowback. I even got to hold a baby arachne when it hatched from its mother's carcass. That's not even the best news, said Alfred, wagging his eyebrows. When the waiter arrived, it ended whatever news he was about to deliver, and after asking for their permission, Alfred ordered meals for the whole table, Callie included. While he was discussing the variety of options with Esmeralda, Logan leaned over. What's with the fox? he asked with a cocky head nod. She's my pet, said Pax, catching an ear twitch from Callie. I'm sure you've seen her around campus. He flattened his lips. That's not what I mean. Where'd you find her? Why? You want one for yourself? she responded with a touch of nastiness. That's not what I meant, he said, crossing his arms. I was just, you know, curious. How'd you befriend a fox? Portland is teeming with abandoned animals. I assume she was someone's pet before, she said. Logan got a strange look before he reached over his shoulder and touched his back. It was the same place that Callie had scratched him when he'd been in her shed. She could sense him putting two together. The owl thing recovered, she said. I'm sure you'll be pleased. He smiled. I am. The wound was deep but easy to mend, she said. Logan screwed up his mouth. That's good. Sitting next to Logan made the hackles on the back of her neck go up, as if she were sitting next to a hungry hyena. While he was mostly behaving at lunch, animals didn't change their stripes, and people didn't either, so she didn't want to let her guard down. How are classes? asked Esmeralda after touching her arm. Everything I hoped they'd be, said Pax. I'm even sucking at spellcasting less, so I'm not the worst student anymore. She's being modest, said Logan. She's more knowledgeable about supernatural animals than even some of the third years. He cocked his mouth to the side. She does suck at spellcasting though. Because his father was at the table and was a major donor to the zoo, Pax kept from reacting too severely, but she really wanted to kick him under the table. Callie added a sharp lemon and pepper disapproval for good measure. Thanks, she said, squinting at him. So what house will you both be joining after your first year? asked Alfred as he rested his hands in his lap with his chin up, clearly missing the undercurrents at the table. Keepers, said Pax without thinking. One hundred percent. I'd really love to return to the Portland Zoo, but I'd be happy in Belgrade or Moscow too. Well, I might know some people with some pull, said Alfred with a wink. I bet I could get you an interview at the least. Thank you Mr. Lovelace, she said blushing. Please call me Alfred. Esmeralda tells me you've been an accomplished volunteer for many years. I always tried to get Logan to join the zoo, but he was always running around screwing off with his friends, he said. Pax didn't even have to glance to her left to sense the tightening of Logan's expression. His lips had pulled to a point. I love working at the zoo, said Pax. None of the other houses interest you, asked Alfred. I know I thought I was going to be in Hunters for certain when I arrived, I was a cocky kid, full of myself, but after my first shifter classes I was hooked. Shifters? I wouldn't have guessed, said Pax. I don't know why but I sort of assumed keepers, or maybe hunters. Alfred laughed. I might have done the same. Esmeralda leaned forward. He owns the largest pet supply company in the world. Being able to learn what people's pets truly wanted, design products for them that could make their lives better, made me a considerable fortune, said Alfred. I guess I know what Logan's going to do when he graduates, said Pax. Alfred laughed as Logan's cheeks turned crimson. Only if he wants to join the company as an intern. No, in fact, that's what my news is about. I'm planning on selling the company and giving the proceeds to various supernatural zoos around the world. Logan's not getting a thing. I figure a healthy upbringing and having his schooling paid for is as good a gift as he deserves. Better to find his own way in the world, earn his place, rather than have it given to him, said Alfred as he looked down on his son. Pax turned to Logan, 
but he was staring at his menu. She couldn't believe it. The news explained his anger. He must have expected that he was going to inherit his father's fortune. The awkward silence continued, so she said, I bet the Portland Zoo will be really happy. Pax regretted her comment as soon as it left her lips. Logan stiffened and crossed his arms. If he would have kicked her under the table, she would have understood, but she knew he was smarter than that. He'd get her back later. Esmeralda made an exaggerated grin. You wouldn't believe what we're going to do with the funds. We're going to be able to open up five more domes, acquire that hydro we always wanted, add more security so the insurance company will get off our backs about risk tolerances. That sounds amazing, said Pax while Logan sunk further into his seat, his cheeks blooming crimson. He probably thought she was rubbing it in. What about you, Logan? What house do you plan on joining? asked Esmeralda. His first glance was filled with repudiation. His mouth was wrinkled as if she'd asked him to eat a bug, but he seemed to remember that his father was at the table, attentively listening, and responded flatly, probably tamers. It's the one I seem to do the best at. Oh yeah, I should have guessed that. Pax turned to Alfred. Professor Vladimir compliments Logan regularly during class. She hoped to diffuse his anger, but he barely acknowledged the compliment. That's great, Logan, said Alfred. You should have told me that. I was really worried if you were enjoying your first year. It can be overwhelming. From the other side of the table, Esmeralda giggled. Vlad the inhaler. Does he still have a rasp in his throat from when the unicorn, I mean Monoceros, stabbed him in the chest? The brief attention Alfred was showering on Logan had brought him up in his seat, but as soon as Esmeralda made the comment, the older man slapped the table with laughter, turning towards the beautiful zookeeper. Oh, that's a good one. We just called him Bad Vlad in my time. He was such a cranky old man. Hopefully the years have softened his mood, said Alfred, sharing a smile with Esmeralda. The degradation of Professor Constantine visibly annoyed Logan, and he sighed heavily, angrily glaring at his father. Pax opened her mouth to drag the conversation away from stories about Professor Vladimir, but then Callie sat up in her chair, followed by a shock of black licorice, the sign for danger. Even before she felt the mental signature, Pax heard a familiar voice, one of the men who had chased them through the streets in November until they had to hide in a dumpster. The man had a slight Boston accent that she hadn't caught the first time since she'd been running for her life. He was leaving the restaurant, he must have been in a back room. Esmeralda put her hand on Pax's arm. What's wrong? She almost spit out the truth, but knew that would only lead to more questions, especially from Logan, who watched her curiously, glancing the way she'd been looking. Nothing, maybe Callie heard a squeak, probably sounded like a mouse, said Pax. Esmeralda wrinkled her forehead as she stared back at Pax as if she didn't believe her. But then the waiter arrived with appetizers, a tray of jalapeno stuffed olives marinated in a lemon brine. The waiter's arrival blocked Pax from seeing who her pursuer had been, and possibly who he'd been with, but it also ended the questioning stare from Logan. By the time the waiter left, the conversation had moved on to discussing how delicious the food was, and the guy from the dumpster night was long gone. The mood of conversation shifted, bringing Logan out of his shell, but he kept glancing her direction, then to Callie. Her gut sank as he seemed to enjoy himself more and more, which Pax only interpreted as a warning of danger. She would have much preferred the awkward silences that had dotted the beginning of their lunch. Eventually they finished their meals, and after a long goodbye with Esmeralda, and a polite one for Alfred and Logan, Pax took Callie back to campus for her shift at the menagerie. Since it was the holidays the place was deserted, but Pax didn't mind. It meant she got to spend the time with the animals, the creatures that understood her best, but even as she did enjoy it, she couldn't help but worry about what Logan might do next. Chapter 25 On a warm day in January, a few weeks after classes resumed, Pax was on the lawn in front of the menagerie with Janelle and Liam. Callie was playing in the grass, scampering after a toy mouse that Liam had bought her. Pax wasn't entirely sure that Callie was humoring Liam with her play. 
Although she'd never been too interested in toys, preferring the hot blood of the real thing to well-constructed plastic, the little fox was pouncing on the gray toy mouse and flinging it into the air with glee. She really loves the toy, said Liam, shooting her a wink. I have a way with animals. I'm sure you do, said Pax, holding a grin between her teeth. Janelle looked up from her tome with an eyebrow raised. Aren't you too worried about the binomial nomenclature exam tomorrow? Liam, who was sitting on the grass watching Callie, fell onto his back, sprawling his arms and legs out. Study, study, study. Memorize, memorize, memorize. My brain is bursting. You had two weeks to recover during the break, said Pax, hicking the bottom of his boot with her shoe. Liam curled onto his side, closing his eyes with a faint grin on his lips. I may have spent a little too much time with some old mates. I'll stay up tonight and finish the readings. Pax rolled her eyes. She knew he was messing around. He always acted like he wasn't studying, but then he usually scored in the top quarter of the class. What about you, Pax? asked Janelle. Shoot me a question, said Pax as she scooped up the toy mouse and threw it across the lawn. Callie tilted her head before loping after the gray squeaker. Janelle paged through the tome, running her finger along the text for a few seconds while humming under her breath. Alrighty, a question for Miss Nygaard. What class is the Canis Hexadegitis Mortem? asked Janelle with a self-satisfied smirk. Pax squinted. I sense subterfuge, but I'll play along. It's really called the falsus canis hexadegitis mortem, or six-toed death dog, or really a false dog. Well, it comes from the demonium kingdom, I believe the Noctura phylum and class class. She tapped on her chin. They're known for tracking abilities, and despite looking like a canine, are not related, probably evolved that way due to some psychic need to appear like a dog. Have red eyes. I think the class is Presidio. Janelle set the tome in her lap and gave a slow clap, nodding her head. Ladies and gents, insects and animals, we have a winner. Pax burst to her feet, lifted her arms into a victory V, and ran a lap around Janelle, who was giggling behind a cupped hand. I am a golden god of the nomenclature, said Pax. I have made that book my bitch. She feigned grabbing an ass with clenched hands and thrust her hips forward a few times. Pax looked up expecting continued laughter from both her friends, but they'd gone silent and wide-eyed. Pax turned, half expecting Professor Vladimir, but was horrified to find patron Adele instead. The lack of expression on her face left Pax groaning inside. I must speak with you, Pax Nygaard, said the patron flatly. Without waiting for an answer, patron Adele turned crisply on her heels and marched toward the menagerie. Her friends gave her shoulder shrugs while Callie slunk back to Janelle. Playtime with the plastic mouse had ended. Inside the glass building, standing near the salt water tank, Pax looked for Edgar who normally greeted her with a spin, but he was nowhere to be found, probably sensing patron Adele's mood. The tall bald black woman made effortless gestures of spellcasting. The casualness, efficiency honed to thoughtless ease, made Pax jealous, though she understood the reason not to take her own emotion seriously. When the spell completed, Pax felt a twinge at the base of her skull. She glanced back to the lawn, where Callie watched intently from her haunches, ears raised with interest. I have placed a privacy enchantment on us both. We may speak in private with no fear of eavesdropping, human or otherwise, said patron Adele. The glance towards Callie at the otherwise tipped Pax off that the patron was aware of the fox's supernatural origins, but she wasn't prepared for what was said next. Pax Nygaard, said the patron hands clasped in front. The seriousness of her mien, the silent consideration, made Pax tremble inside. I must ask you some questions. It behooves you to be as completely honest with me as you can. I will know if you're lying. Please understand that these questions are for your safety. Am, am I in trouble? asked Pax. The patron lifted her chin. Trouble with my school? No. You have been an exemplary, if unusual student in your short time here. Most of the professors have had good things to say about you, and would be quite pleased if you chose their house at the end of the year. Pax knew that most, not all, was code for Professor Vladimir wouldn't trust you to train a pet rock. While her other classes with him hadn't gone as poorly as the unicorn incident, 
she'd never really shined as she did in the others. It is your companion that concerns me, said Patron Adele. Callie? The flatness of the Patron's lips was answer enough. You have named her appropriately. Where did you find this Callie? The echo of Logan's question made her suspect that he'd been the one to bust her, though she couldn't understand how much he might have actually figured out. I was ten I remember that much because it was around my birthday, and um yeah, I found her somewhere, said Pax searching for the details but coming up empty. You are not aware specifically where you found her? asked the patron. No. I remember I was ten or had just turned ten, said Pax screwing up her face. She must have just shown up. It felt like she was always there. I don't know patron, my house has always been kind of a halfway house for random creatures. I couldn't tell you when most of them arrived, but I know they did. Why does it matter? And what species do you believe that Callie is? asked the patron. Pax looked sideways, offered an answer, Volpes Volpes? Miss Nygaard please I ask that we be honest, said patron Adele, hands clasped in front. Pax closed her eyes as her chin sunk to her chest. Thoracic Volpes. The patron stepped close and placed her fingers under Pax's chin to lift it up. The nearness was overwhelming. She'd always suspected that the patrons were extremely powerful, but the intensity of her presence was like choking on dense raw phase. I see, said patron Adele, turning back to give Pax room. You believed what you said. She's not a thoracic fox, asked Pax incredulously. Since you happen to be a golden god of the supernatural nomenclature tome, said patron Adele with a wry glint to her eyes, Maybe you can refresh us both on the aspects of your companion. Thoracic Volpes. They're a mirror species of the Volpes genus, having developed supernatural powers somewhere along their evolutionary path, much like humans. They live 20 to 30 years, less if in the wild. Their emotives can read minds, but only willing subjects and are sweet and faithful companions. Patron Adele's granite exterior softened. Miss Nygaard, I do not doubt your devotion to Callie. But humor me further. Do you remember the day that you had trouble with the unicorns? You mean the Minoceros? Never mind, said Pax with a sigh. Yes, I remember, Voina nearly speared me. I didn't tell anyone at the time, but it was Callie that stopped her. The professor's mark probably helped as well. I see, said the patron with pity in her eyes. What else do you know about unicorns? They have horns harder than steel which double as super sensors are used as war beasts can be quite ill-tempered, said Pax. There was more but she was getting tired of playing patron Adele's game. She wished she would get on with it, whatever bad news she had about Callie. The spiral horn, yes, Miss Nygaard, it's a super sensor. While outside of fairy tales and little girls, unicorns have been known as fearsome war beasts for eons. They were first used as hunters for parasitic creatures as far back as Egyptian times, the most insidious being the Mutatio Emotep Parasitis. I'm not familiar with the Mutatio Emotep Parasitis, said Pax, wrinkling her forehead. Or at least it's not in the tome we're studying. This creature is extremely rare, so it wouldn't show up in normal books. But its common name is Calidus. They psychically attach themselves to a host and as they grow, they drain their host until they are dead. Once the Calidus reaches its final form, it's a devastatingly effective killer, preying on mages with a taste for their flesh. The Latin name of the Calidus includes the first known host, the man who gave us a clue to the existence of this terrible creature, the mage Emotep. Like the Egyptian guy, said Pax. That Emotep. The very one, said patron Adele. Pax took shallow breaths, feeling dizzy. She wanted to sprint from the building, grab Callie, and never return to the school. What, what are you saying? Why are you telling me this? asked Pax, even though she knew the reason. She just couldn't let her mind recognize the truth for what it was. Does Callie have the ability to keep people from looking at her? A psychic camouflage? asked the patron. Yes, said Pax, and as soon as she did, she remembered there was no mention that a thoracic Volpes had that ability. They were emotives only. As a great weight ground down upon her, she turned to the window. Callie sat as primly and perfectly on the lawn 
as if she were a lifelike statue. Is that? Is Cali? A Calidus, mutatio emotet parasitis, yes I believe so. I've spoken with your professors. Each has mentioned events that led them to believe that this diagnosis is correct, said patron Adele. This can't be true, said Pax, turning back to the patron. You're saying that Callie wants to suck me dry, take my life force or whatever as she grows. But she's not growing, she's the same size as she's always been. She loves me and I love her. That's the peculiar thing about the Calidus. Emotep wrote extensively about how he knew that the cat-like creature that was his companion was killing him, yet he took no real action to thwart it. That's the nature of this beast. Callie is keeping you mentally sedated, so you never question her presence, her taking from you. These feelings you have are false. She does not truly care for you, only in that you are her food, said patron Adele. Pax shook her head vehemently. You're wrong. Callie loves me. She'd do anything to keep me safe. Just like I would for her. I'm sorry, Miss Nygaard. I imagine this is very hard for you, said patron Adele and for the first time she revealed genuine emotion, a tightening of the eyes and squeezing of the lips, but Pax was too pained to care. I don't understand, said Pax as she paced across the floor chewing on her fingernails. What are you asking me to do? Do you expect me to kill her? No, not yet anyway, said patron Adele. We can help remove her from your mind, break the bond between you, but it won't be easy. That way you and the rest of the school are safe. And if I don't agree to this, asked Pax. Then you will not be allowed back in school next year, said patron Adele. The pronouncement was like a hammer blow to the chest. Pax stumbled backwards, the air sundered from her lungs. Her knees went weak and she crouched to the floor, placing her hand against the cold marble to steady herself. Animalians or Callie, said Pax. I can't choose that. Yet you must, said patron Adele as the corners of her eyes creased. I recognize the difficulty of this decision, which is why I'm giving you until the end of the year. Not worried that she'd suck my soul out and kill everyone in the school? asked Pax, venom in her tone. Emotep detailed the growth cycle of the Calidus. After a long discussion with the professors, we determined that it was safe to give you this much time, said the patron. If you have no other questions, I will leave you to contemplate this difficult decision alone. Pax couldn't tell when the patron left, as her mind whirled with the impossibility of having to choose. When finally she could stand again, albeit with trembling legs, she moved to leave the menagerie, only to find that Callie was no longer sitting on the lawn. Chapter 26 The days were a paradox of unimaginable slowness, and hazy speed on fast-forward. After the revelation from patron Adele, Callie no longer stayed with Pax though she could sense her on the campus, and had gotten reports from Liam and Janelle that they'd seen her slinking across the roof of the menagerie. Pax didn't tell her friends the truth about Callie, sticking to a simplified story that the fox had killed some expensive magically modified mice, and that she couldn't come back to school the next year unless she severed their bond. Her friends, of course, offered their outrage in solidarity, but she didn't want to make the situation worse, so she asked them not to make a fuss about it. When February rolled in with wintry storms, icy blasts that made going outside, even with protective enchantments, painful, Pax spent her days in her room, lying on the bed, leaving a spot where Callie would have curled into a furry ball. Her schoolwork faltered, as she cared little for learning when an important part of her was to be ripped away if she wanted to stay. What would it matter if she was at school, if Callie wasn't at her side? Pax couldn't believe that the fox, her companion for the last eight years, supposedly would suck out her soul eventually. So much of her days were spent mining the depths of her thoughts, looking for signs that Callie meant her harm, but she could find nothing in all their time together. Patron Adele was mistaken, she knew that much, but she knew there was no way to convince her, especially when she found the readings on the Calidus beast, which made Callie's kind out to be a supernatural predator, or a sinister serial killer, but maybe that was the case because the mages hunted them down, killed them without remorse. Towards the end of the month, when the frigid temperatures faltered, leaving the semblance of a normal day, Pax and her fellow first-years were summoned to a special class with patron Adele. 
The leader of the hall didn't teach classes to first years, except the occasional lecture. So the rest of the group was excited as they traipsed across the crunchy frozen ground to the crypto zoo. Is it really Monday? Pax asked Janelle, who wore a short black skirt and a crimson tank top with gold edgings despite the cold weather, showing off her mastery of personal enchantments. Janelle shifted her mouth to the side. We can call it whatever you'd like. I'm partial to Fridays. Pax hoisted up a smile to show appreciation for her friend's solidarity. When they arrived at the crypto zoo, she was surprised to find Liam and Logan huddled together in discussion near the Zaduhachi cages. The silvery feathered birds with their azure breasts always reminded Pax of flying paladins, especially when they emitted their upright shrieks which sounded like a war cry. They ended their discussion but Pax cared little since her feud with Logan had ended and she wasn't sure she'd be at the school next year to care. A bright day to you all, said Patron Adele from the side of the cage. Can anyone tell me what kind of bird this is? The question, even if the patron hadn't been standing next to the sign, would have been ludicrously simple after they'd spent the last seven months drilling on the supernatural nomenclature. So the obviously transparent question made them collectively wary. Brianna rolled her eyes and shot her hand up in an artful sway as she answered, making the gesture pointless but perfectly her. The Zaduhach bird. Elemental birds from the Serbian mountains. They helped protect the local farmland from all spirits and other crazy mean beings so farmers loved them would put out so much grain for them to munch on. They called them dragon birds even though they have no relation to dragons. The superstition was that they could turn into dragons or men, probably hot ones with ripped abs, but spent time as birds to protect the farmlands. Historians thought the locals thought that because the birds have such an aloof, majestic manner, akin to dragons. Thank you, Brianna, said the patron with the faintest twitch of her lip. Does anyone know why these birds should not be allowed to live near farmlands, despite their benefits? There was a lot of turning to each other, as the tomes they'd been studying, said nothing about dangers, only the advantages of their existence. The Zaduhachi, began patron Adele, are fiercely territorial, specifically against other elementally aligned creatures, which makes them natural enemies of the Allah spirits, which can attack cattle or small children in the fields. But they also repel other useful elementals, like the sightless goblin worm and the spark sprites, which help fields grow lush. Particularly in Serbia, there was a region that cultivated the Zaduhachi, made them nests, allowed them to flourish, but with so many of them, the sightless goblin worm and the spark sprites no longer visited the fields which due to their soil composition greatly relied on them. They didn't notice the absence of those minor predators at first, but eventually their fields faltered, leading to famine and other hardships. Only when many of the farmers and their families died, and there was no extra grain or wood to build nests for the Zaduhachi, did the relationship end. She paused, looking over the gathered students. What is the lesson here? After glancing around, Logan said, we should be careful of supernatural animals, even while we study and rely on them. Excellently stated, said patron Adele, nodding towards him while Pax seethed inside. She knew that the patron had picked this topic to sway her against Callie. At the end of the year, you will each choose a house. Each one comes with its own dangers, its own challenges. While most equate the largest share of hazard to hunters, which in certain regards is not incorrect, at least their dangers are up front. The others' houses have their own insidious risks. In shifters, you might have your mind broken if you are killed while connected to a beloved animal friend. Or in tamers, a once docile creature might turn on you when you least expect it or in keepers, feeling that you understand an animal well enough to push the boundaries of your relationship, you might put yourself in grave danger. In some respects, hunters is easiest for danger recognition, because the brutalities of it are up front, but even there, as that house seeks not to kill, to capture and relocate when possible, many mages have lost their lives. You'd think we were mages in coterie, the way she's talking, whispered Janelle. Patron Adele lifted her chin, looking over the crowd of first years. Has anyone ever heard about the Lioness Queen of Zambia? There were a few nods, but mostly headshakes. In the late 1700s, as Africa was being colonized, there was a mage who lived amongst the lions of the savanna, 
shapeshifted as one of them perhaps let's say, to study them. When the British came to impose their rule, this mage, in the guise of a lioness, led the prides against the armies in the dark of the night, terrorizing the troops, sneaking into their camps and ripping out the throats of the officers. She spent so much time as a lion, killing as they do, feeding on the hot blood of humans, that despite her successes in striking fear into the British, she lost her humanity. Eventually the British brought in hunter teams, and she was driven into the wilds, and the lions were killed en masse to ensure she had no place to hide. This mage lost herself to the wilds, to the sweet relief of being someone else, especially in a time of great personal anguish and peril for her people. Patron Adele surveyed them, her keen gaze seeing both the past and present. We are the Society for the Understanding of Animals. But we cannot forget that we, too, are creatures that require consideration and care. Do not forget yourselves. Do not forget each other. We are all we have. She strode away from the enclosure, leaving the first years bewildered and talking amongst themselves. Anyone else get the impression she was talking about herself? asked Janelle as they strolled back to campus. I thought she was only a little over a hundred years old, said Liam. That's the common story, but who's to say that it's true, said Janelle. What do you think, Pax? Huh? Pax looked up. I don't know. Essie told me that many of the patrons of older houses are much older than they appear, or have led people to believe. The rumor in Essie's time was that Adele was around when Rome conquered Egypt, but I think she's too tall for that. Why Adele Montgomery? asked Liam. She studied at Oxford in the early 1900s, or something like that, before anyone knew she was a mage. I think that's why people think she's a little over a hundred, said Pax. Janelle glanced sideways, screwed up her face. I saw Callie this morning, outside the window when you were in the bathroom. Why won't she come back? Pax blew out a breath. I don't know. Maybe she's mad at me that I have to make a decision between her and the school, she lied. Both her friends gave her sympathetic glances, but Pax didn't want the attention. What was that between you and Logan back there? asked Pax. Liam stiffened, eyes wide. He offered a cautious grimace. I found out his dad gives to the Pacific Cryptid Foundation. They operate on the trails, keeping people safe, that sort of thing. I hoped his dad could give me a good word, it's really competitive to get in, said Liam. Janelle made faux gagging noises. Gross? Liam threw his hands out. What gives? Mr. Lovelace is going to help Pax when she graduates. I knew his dad before I knew Logan, said Pax. And I didn't ask Logan directly, and I definitely don't trust him. He's a dick. He'll try to screw us somehow. Liam backed away, hands up. I have to do this for my mom. I don't have the resources that others do. If I have to make a temporary truce with Logan, I'll do it. It's not like I'm going to side with him if he does anything. I'll still kick his ass, but I need the recommendation. Liam's eyes rounded with hurt, so Pax nodded gently, but the interaction worried her that Logan would use her friends against her. Chapter 27 On a Saturday afternoon late in March, Pax was in a containment room in the basement of the menagerie with Professor Keiko and her translator to milk the baby in coxal vipers for venom. The room had rune-locked doors, which Pax had the keys and passwords for, made for controlling dangerous supernatural creatures. It wasn't as top security as a kill room, the Animalians campus supposedly only had one of them, but it was only for the upperclassmen and professors. The room had rows of tables and cages that went far back, but she was near the front with the vipers. Are you comfortable with the job? signed Professor Keiko. The enormous gorilla made fluid movements while her translator, Su Kim, spoke for her. During the course of the year, Pax had been learning the basic signs, so she made the gestures to respond, I can do. Professor Keiko flattened her hands in front of her, making upward motions. She hooted softly, signaling her pleasure. Remember to confirm your enchantment with a burnt sage leaf before attempting to call the vipers, signed Professor Keiko. And place the venom jars in the refrigerator, clearly marked. It's being picked up next week. Pax signed the affirmative while saying, I will do that. 
May I ask what the venom will be used for? The gorilla grunted, before nodding her head. Incoxal venom can paralyze a mage's ability to produce phase. It's very valuable because of this property. We sell it to the Dagestine Corporation, who turns it into medical grade anesthesia for mages so they don't burn down the hospital in the middle of an operation. Pax must have made a face because Professor Keiko continued, We are not a rich hall like Coterie or even Arcanium, so we must eat stems when it's too hot to find termites. Warmth rose to Pax's cheeks, and she nodded enthusiastically to show support, even though the sale of the venom surprised her. Any questions? Signed Professor Keiko. Pax surveyed the assembled gear, a pair of long leather gloves, three venom vials, a sensor of sage with a lighter, two black paint pens for the enchantment, and a strange oblong gourd that would call the vipers when she shook it. Since they weren't displaying the vipers, the cage was reinforced wire mesh around hard plastic, but it was pushed against the wall, leaving a gap between her and the box. Can we move this forward? asked Pax, miming a pulling motion. It'll be hard to reach into the cage otherwise. Professor Keiko ambled forward, putting her thick hands onto the top of the cage. With barely a grunt, she pulled the box forward until it was flush with the table. Thank you, said Pax, signing as she spoke. Professor Keiko and her translator left, leaving Pax to the task of milking the vipers. Before she started, she found a whiteboard and a dry erase marker, set the board against the cage, and wrote Vipers Milked at the top. It was a trick she'd learned at the Portland Zoo. When dealing with multiple dangerous magical creatures, you didn't want to forget how many were in the cage or enclosure and leave your guard down thinking you were done or the place was empty. All right, she said aloud. First the enchantment to make our pretty little babies sleepy. The incoxal vipers were drawn to fays, making them dangerous for mages. They'd been used by assassins in the Middle Ages. Pax uncapped the first black paint marker and marked the runes along the front edge of the box where she would be standing. When she was finished, she sniffed the paint marker briefly before recapping it, then cracked her knuckles to limber up her fingers. The spell required heavy use of the pinky, making separate circles while the rest of the fingers moved in concert. It was the type of spell that would have flummoxed her at the beginning of the year, but after months of practice, she didn't feel completely inept. Okay, she said, grabbing the sage and lighter, now to confirm that it's working. After sparking the dried sage to flame, she blew it out and waved the smoke over the edge of the box. The gray mist swirled backwards as if running into a force field. Excellent, she said, rubbing her hands together. She loved playing in the herpetarium, so getting to handle snakes again, even deadly ones, brought a grin to her lips. Pax pulled the leather gloves on, all the way up to her upper arms, flexing her fingers a few times to get used to the motion before unlocking the cage and lifting the lid, pushing it back until the catch clicked, holding it open. The inside of the cage was filled with sand, round rocks, and juniper shrubs, which mimicked the Arabian desert where the incoxal vipers were native. Pax shook the gourd, which made a rattling sound. She scanned the 5 by 8 box, looking for signs of movement. A curving shape slipped from beneath a juniper bush, sluggishly moving towards the front of the box. After checking no other vipers were near, Pax neatly grabbed the baby and coxal behind its triangle-shaped head. A soft squeeze opened its mouth, revealing curved fangs, which she slipped into the latex top of the vial. Massaging the viper could injure it, so Pax gently moved it back and forth, which helped secrete the venom from the fangs. When the yellowish liquid stopped dripping into the vial, Pax removed the viper and set it back into the cage along the left edge. Between the enchantment and the milking, the baby viper wouldn't want to move again. She marked a single line on the whiteboard and looked back into the cage for the next viper. The work was slow, as the incoxal vipers were good at camouflaging themselves against the sand and stones of their native habitat, but Pax didn't allow herself to rush, knowing that could be fatal. It took an hour to milk the next five vipers. It would have gone faster, but she'd found the others piled together on the hot rock so she had to retrieve a long pole to slide them apart. Okay, last one, she said, after closing the lid on the dry erase marker. The board had six marks on it, and the three vials were each half full of yellowish liquid. She could count the sleepy baby vipers on the left side of the tank, twitching their tails but otherwise not moving. 
Pax searched the cage for the seventh in Coxal Viper, using the long pole to move the scrubs and poke beneath the sand. After ten minutes of fruitless searching, an anxious tingle formed between her shoulder blades. Did someone count wrong? Did they move one out and forget to change the number on the cage? She counted the vipers she could see again, coming away with six. She had them spread out, so they were easy to see. What am I missing? she asked. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Where is the seventh? Pax rubbed the sticker on the cage that had the number seven written on it. Signed by Professor Alloyt, who mostly worked in the zoo, so she knew the vipers had been counted by a professional. She thought about going to get Professor Keiko, but if someone entered the room while she was gone, they could be in danger and not know it. She checked behind her to confirm the viper hadn't gotten out somehow, before leaning further into the cage to check the back wall, making sure the seventh wasn't hiding in the warm sands. As she ran the pole along the edge, the tip caught on something an inch beneath the sand. When she pushed the pole forward and it did not hit the wall, a pit opened in her stomach. She was able to clear the sand away from a little hole in the cage. From years of volunteering in the Portland Zoo, she instantly knew the source of the hole, the common mouse, which could chew through just about anything given enough time. The hole had been beneath the sand and against the wall, so none of the vipers had been able to get out, but when she asked Professor Keiko to pull the cage away it had opened up an escape route. As she leaned over the edge of the box, her heart rate doubled when she heard the soft impact of something small hitting the floor. The incoxal viper was behind her. It had probably been crawling through the shelves while she worked, sleepy at first from her enchantment, and was now awake enough to come for her. Without moving, keeping her mouth shut tight so she didn't exhale phase, which all mages did in trace amounts, Pax weighed her options. She could turn and try to hit the viper with a flame spell, but the snake was small and she wasn't a great shot. There was a chance she could climb onto the table, make a running leap towards the door, and get through it before the viper caught her. Or she could hold still, and hope that it slithered away so she could quietly leave, standing guard at the door until someone came by that could summon Professor Keiko and a retrieval team properly equipped to deal with the baby in Coxal Viper. Turning her head ever so slightly, Pax spied the viper moving towards her position in a lazy side shift with its tongue flicking the air, tasting it for phase. It was possible that the enchantments she'd cast before were enough for the viper to detect, even if she held her breath. Pax was trapped. She eyed the bowl of dried sage, wondering if she could throw it at the snake and leap over it on her way to the door, but she'd seen videos of incoxal vipers moving and knew there was no way she could avoid it, even a baby one, but given she was out of options, she decided it was her best albeit slim chance of survival. Pax reached out to grab the wide bowl of dried sage, keeping her lips clamped while shallowly breathing through her nose. She lifted the bowl, readying to throw it, when she felt the tinge of black licorice in her mind. Callie. She didn't know how the resourceful fox had gotten into the room, but she was there, stalking behind the viper on silent padded paws. Pax quickly formulated a plan, sending her intention to Callie, hoping she could understand enough to enact her part. Now, said Pax, grabbing the bowl and leaping towards the baby viper as she hoped Callie was muting the snake's senses with her psychic abilities. As Pax slid across the floor with the bowl flipped over, spilling dried sage everywhere, the viper thrashed its head trying to dislodge the fox. Before the snake could slither away, Pax slammed the bowl over it, trapping it beneath. Oh thank Merlin, said Pax as her hands trembled atop the bowl. Or I guess thank you Callie. The fox sat on her haunches, her head tilted in reproach. I know little one, said Pax as she leaned on the upside down bowl. I've been acting terribly. I never should have let Patron Adele convince me that you were bad. I know you'd never hurt me. Callie let her tongue hang loose and sent the feeling of warm cherry pie. I need to get this viper back into the cage and close it before the others wake up or we'll have a real pickle on our hands, said Pax. After dragging over a bag of dog food that they used to feed the spike pigs and using it to weigh the bowl down, Pax checked on the vipers, counting six before searching for a sheet of metal to slide under the bowl. The operation to relocate the seventh viper was precarious, but with Callie's help, she managed to get it back into the cage, which she closed, 
then shoved against the wall to block the hole. Relieved to be safe again, Pax crouched on the ground, opened up her arms for Callie, and gave her a long hug while the fox licked her chin. I'm so sorry, Callie. I never should have doubted you, said Pax. You were here when I needed you. The fox put her paw on Pax's chest and tilted her head. School? Yeah, I don't know. I guess if I can't find a solution or a way to hide you, then maybe this is my one and only year here, which I suppose is better than nothing at all, said Pax with a sigh. As she said the words a great weight lifted from her shoulders. She hated the idea that she wouldn't get to continue at Animalians, but she couldn't believe they were asking her to choose between the school and her best friend. How did you even get in here? asked Pax. The fox looked up towards the ceiling, near the shelves and back. An open grate that led to the heating and cooling revealed the answer. So that's how you've been getting around, said Pax, scratching the fox behind the ear. Callie leaned into it, making tiny grunts. I'll never doubt you again, Callie. The fox looked up to the cage, lolling her tongue out. Yeah, let me get this cleaned up. I'll leave a note, then go tell Professor Keiko what happened. She paused and thought. I should probably leave your role out of it but I don't want anyone else to come in here and get hurt. After she let Callie out of the containment room, Pax cleaned up the supplies, put the three vials of incoxal venom into the refrigerator, and checked the cage again to make sure it was flush against the wall. By the time she left, the Viper encounter had faded to a nervous memory, replaced with the warm, secure knowledge that despite almost killing her, it had helped her see the light with her companion. Chapter 28 the city was a wheel. Thirteen wards in two rings, four for the inner, nine for the outer, with the spire as the axle. The world ran on that wheel powered by magic, which threaded out to the realms through portals known and unknown alike. Though Pax had decided to leave the school after her first year, it didn't lessen the thrill of traveling through the city, riding on the train lines with her face pressed against the window. The other halls have much more impressive buildings, said Liam on her right tapping on the glass as they passed the obelisk, the glistening black tower that housed the coterie of mages. It was a fitting symbol for the wealthiest hall. Janelle, who was on Pax's left, face also pressed against the window, said, it's not like we're the worst, imagine some of those smaller halls. Cyber Magics is in some old abandoned strip mall, and Daring Maids is in some crappy former office building. Ours isn't great, but it's way better than those. I don't know, Pax said softly. I kinda like ours. We have the biggest campus, the most space to run around, plus we have all the animals. As the train car rattled around a curve, leaving the view of the obelisk behind, they sat back on their seats. Pax had to share hers with Callie, but after over a month apart, she enjoyed the nearness. So what are we doing, Liam? It's not like you to keep your mouth shut about anything, said Pax. It's a special treat, said Liam, wagging his eyebrows. I hope it's a special free treat, she responded. He winked. I got it covered. Janelle crossed her arms. This sounds suspiciously like that time I got stuck with the bill at Wizard Coffee. Liam patted his jeans. Don't worry. I got this. Pax was a little worried when they got off in the 13th ward, as the boarded up buildings they'd passed left her uneasy, but outside the station, as soon as she saw the rainbow symbol of a smiling baboon, she knew everything would be great. Madame Adam's authentic animal traveling circus and petting zoo. I've always wanted to see them. I didn't know they were in town, said Pax breathlessly. Liam hooked his thumbs into his jeans and shot her a wink. Still worried? She threw her arms around his shoulders, giving him a peck, enjoying his minty smell and his freshly shaven cheek, but pulled away before he got the wrong idea. Janelle rolled her eyes. Someone's going to have to catch me up on this, said Janelle. They're a traveling zoo, but kinda, not really. They do all sorts of interactive events, you know, like talking with dolphins, feeding lycanthropic hawk rats, or mind riding with their little dragonlings, but that last one is super expensive, and you have to register way ahead of time, said Pax the words flowing out of her mouth a thousand miles an hour as they strolled beneath the colorful archway with the traveling circus title. From Liam's back pocket, he produced three tickets, spreading them out in a fan. 
These tickets, he asked with a grin. She punched him in the arm. How did you even get those? Or afford them for that matter? I've been working a lot of hours in the barn, said Liam. And we get a discount because we're animalians, since the founder is from the hall. You really shouldn't have, said Janelle. No, I wanted to, said Liam. We've been working our asses off all year, I wanted to treat us to a little adventure. Half the booths contained events that were mundane for three members of Animalians. When they passed a unicorn petting area, complete with big pink signs that spelled out UNICORN in balloon letters, Janelle said, I bet Professor Vlad is rolling over in his grave with this sign in existence. In his grave? He's not dead, said Pax. He's a vampire, or some sort of undead with that unhealthy pallor and attitude. Every time we have class with him, I feel like I've disappointed him just by existing, said Janelle. Liam lifted a single shoulder. I don't know. He's not too bad. Pax led them straight back to the dragonling tent. The sign in front showed a little kid riding atop a miniature dragon, soaring through the skies. A woman with black hair twisted into a crown upon her head greeted them at the tent entrance. She carried a riding crop and was decked out in a black leather vest and copious armbands. Are you flying with us today? asked the attendant cheerfully. You'd better believe it, said Pax. The woman gestured towards Callie, who'd left her shoulder and trotted alongside as they'd wandered through the circus. She's tame and takes directions well, said Pax giving Callie a wink. The fox yawned, revealing sharp teeth which received an eyebrow raise from the woman. I'm afraid the fox will have to wait outside the tent, said the woman. We don't want any accidents. Pax crouched down. Are you okay with that? Callie put her paw on Pax's leg. Thanks little one. I appreciate it. As she stood up Liam remarked, I swear that fox understands human language. Pax buzzed with energy as they handed over the tickets and the attendant led them inside. The tent had no inner roof, opening up to the sky, which was a patchwork of clouds and sunshine. The dragonling cages formed an arc around the tent, all but one open with the tiny flying lizards perched atop. They were the size of a kitten. Most of them were various shades of green and blue, but a gold-colored dragonling rested in the closed cage on a pile of hay. My name is Patricia. I will be your flying instructor today, said the woman, as she strolled around the circle, giving each of the dragonlings a piece of bloody meat she had in her hip pouch. The creatures gobbled them down, extending their necks with glee. Patricia launched into a short explanation about the dragonlings, but Pax already knew everything there was to know. They'd come from another realm, and were not really dragons, but literal flying lizards that were capable of psychically bonding to humans to let them share their experiences. Outside of the traveling circus, they were typically owned by the ultra-wealthy as a status symbol. Okay, said Patricia. Any questions? And if not, who is my first writer? When they all looked at her, Pax shook her head. No, I want to go last. I want to savor being here. Janelle stepped forward, and Patricia led her to a hardback chair at the back of the ark. Straps were fastened around her wrists and ankles. The bindings are only to keep you from hurting yourself, should you come out of the link too quickly, said the attendant. Now, to link with the dragonling that you'll be flying with, calm your mind and let one of them pick you. Don't be alarmed when you lose sense of yourself. You'll feel like you're weightless, which can be a little disorienting at first, but pretty quickly, you'll feel great. Janelle blew out a calming breath before closing her eyes. It only took a few seconds, but a sleek azure dragonling flew over to her leg, landing softly before settling against her stomach. Patricia reacted as if this was unusual, but not so strange as to stop the encounter. The quick in-breath, followed by the twitching of her eyelids, signaled that Janelle had bonded with the creature. The dragonling looked to Patricia, who pulled out a little whistle and blew it. Like an arrow, the dragonling shot into the sky. For the next few minutes, Janelle rocked on the chair as the dragonling flew high in the air, far out of sight. While waiting for her turn, Pax crouched by the cage with the gold dragonling. Is she sick? Patricia's eyes widened. She's in heat. The females turn a gold color when they're ready to mate. 
We're keeping the cage closed until there's a good time to let them have a go at it. Pax waggled her finger through the cage. Hello, pretty lady. There was a wooden ledge next to the cage, so she sat on it while they waited for Janelle to return. The gold dragonling climbed from her nest and meandered along the edge of the cage. Pax stuck her finger through the mesh, scratching her leathery skin. The little dragonling batted her elvish eyes at Pax, which practically melted her off her seat. Further interactions ended when she heard a sharp whistle and everyone looked up. When the azure dragonling finally returned, spiraling through the sky to land back on Janelle's lap, her eyes shot open and even though she'd been sitting still, her tongue hung out her mouth out of breath. Oh my oh my, said Janelle clearly delirious. That was um, that was? Better than sex, asked Patricia as she unstrapped the bindings. Janelle screwed up her face. In a weird way, yeah. Wow. I need to have a drink, or something. As she vacated the chair, Liam replaced her, rolling up his sleeve so he could be strapped in. The whole time he stared at Pax, which brought heat to her cheeks. She stuck her tongue out, which was intended to end his silent flirting, but he merely raised an eyebrow. Pax focused on the gold dragonling. The creature stood eagerly at the door, as if it were waiting to be released. As Pax kept her gaze upon the tiny winged lizard, a pang of desire shot through her middle. While Patricia gave instructions to Liam, Pax felt the world slowly dissolve around her. One blink she was staring at the creature, the next, Pax was staring at herself in blue jeans and a lavender top. But there was no time to contemplate as the yearning blasted through her. While Pax was no stranger to being horny, the feeling that had taken hold of her mind was like getting shot up with morphine. A whistle sounded, which to her new ears sounded slowed down. The verdant dragonling on Liam's lap leapt into the sky. Before she knew it, she was throwing herself against the front of the cage while the other dragonlings shrieked. Lilibel, said Patricia, hurrying near and putting her over-large face against the cage, what's wrong? The attendant touched the locking mechanism. Maybe she only meant to check if it were closed, but as soon as the thin piece of metal slid back a millimeter, the gold dragonling burst out of the cage, taking Pax with her. The fear, like the moment before a roller coaster fell on the first hill, was brief, an ephemeral rush, quickly replaced with the mad spike of upward flight, wings beating, ascending into the sky. The sensation of climbing as if she were moving up an invisible ladder lasted until the next wave of burning desire hit her. Nothing else mattered to Pax in that moment. She was faintly aware that Patricia was shaking her body, but her mind was firmly in the gold dragonling, which furiously pursued the verdant one. When they neared, Pax thought they would impact, but the verdant one, finally sensing the collision, turned. But as Lilibel shifted sideways, she realized that the other male dragonlings in the tent were right behind. The next few minutes were an aerial battle that Pax had no words for. Once she'd seen two hummingbirds attacking each other like jet fighters, but this battle consisted of five motivated male dragonlings and one very interested but flirtatious female. The gold dragonling did everything she could to avoid the males, except for the verdant one. As soon as Pax realized what was going to happen, she tried to force her way back to herself or encourage the gold to find a different partner, but as rapidly as the battle for her attention began, it ended as the verdant caught the gold mid-wing. Their coupling was as quick as two train cars hitching, then powerful waves of pleasure annihilated every thought in her head. As the two dragonlings mated, they fell through the air like a meteor. Carnal explosions left Pax as a bystander, completely aware that they were falling at great speeds, but no longer caring enough to do anything about it. But the instincts of the dragonlings kicked in, and they broke apart, catching the downdrafts and soaring over the circus separately. The link ended as Pax snapped awake in her body on the grassy floor of the tent, twitching with the aftereffects of the mating. Patricia knelt over her. Oh good, you're back, she said, clearly concerned about the repercussions, helping Pax into an upright position. That's never happened before. Janelle, who was rubbing Pax's back, said, that seems to happen to her a lot. A soft fuck from behind signaled that Liam was back in his body. He immediately curled over, placing his forearms over his crotch. Oh, Merlin, what in the abyss just happened, he muttered, shaking his head and breathing heavily. 
Pax had a good idea of why he was bent over, but she didn't want to make the situation any more awkward. Help me up, said Pax keeping her head turned towards the tent entrance. We should give him a few minutes. She grabbed Janelle's hand. They went outside, leaving the attendant to deal with Liam. Did he just, asked Janelle. Probably, I assume, said Pax with her hand to her head. I could use a panty ring myself. Oh shit, said Janelle, glancing at her then back at the tent. So you two were linked to the dragonlings when they had sex? Pax nodded as she leaned against a sign pole, fanning herself. Her skin tingled from the after effects. Her fox companion hopped down from atop a nearby crate, looking a little misty-eyed herself. Pax didn't even want to consider that Callie had been a voyeur on the aerial sex capades. Patricia stuck her head out of the tent, biting her lower lip. One of the stagehands is about your friend's size. I sent him to grab a pair of his jeans. She screwed up her face. I'm really sorry. I don't know how she got out or how you linked. This is my fault. If you want your money back or something else free, let me know. I, um, no, said Pax, thinking about the other times she'd connected so easily with animals, this isn't your fault. Let's just call it a unique experience that we, um, won't ever forget. Oh, thank you, said Patricia, her eyes fluttering closed. I thought I was going to get fired. During the 15-minute wait, while a replacement pair of jeans was found, Pax was able to recover enough to stand on her own. When Liam finally poked back through the tent flap, eyes trained on the ground, she didn't feel like she needed to hide in a hole. Wearing jeans a size too small, Liam kicked the dirt and said, I'm really sorry. Why? You didn't do anything wrong, said Pax. Janelle quickly stood up. Come on, Kelly. Let's take a walk around and let these two be awkward in private. I just feel like I did. That wasn't my intention of bringing you here, said Liam, who looked like he was going to be sick. Pax put a hand on his arm. We had a unique and very awkward experience. Let's not make it any more than that. But I... He screwed up his face before looking into her eyes. The sudden matching of gazes made her heart skip. I really like you. Pax took a careful breath. Liam? Maybe if this were a different time in our lives. His attempted smile faltered. Liam nodded his head. This wasn't intended. It was supposed to be a fun break for us. Pax sighed and held out her arm for him to take. And it was. A wonderful panty-destroying event that I, and you and Janelle will never forget. Or at least, she's unlikely to let us forget. He looked like he was ready to say more, as his face broke with anguish, but she couldn't deal with his feelings, however exposed they were in this moment. I need to find Callie, said Pax glancing away. They found Janelle and Callie further up at the funnel cake booth. The fox was riding on her shoulder, sniffing at the sugary treats. You two okay? Happens all the time, said Pax with an offhand shrug. She'd conveniently positioned herself where she didn't have to meet Liam's gaze. Good, said Janelle. I'd hate for my two best friends to suddenly get all weird around each other. We're already weird, said Pax. Hard to get worse. Janelle hooked her arm around Pax's, and the three of them strolled out of the circus in silence. Hey Liam, said Janelle as they entered the busy train station, climbing up concrete stairs towards the platform with Liam trailing. He looked up. Yeah? She cocked her head, letting a smile slowly spread across her face. Nice jeans. Chapter 29 As April brought massive thunderstorms blown up from the coast, their classes stayed inside, which was a relief to Pax after the dragonling encounter with Liam. It gave her ample opportunity to escape back to her room before he could speak to her, but eventually, she knew that they'd have to talk again. A few days from her birthday, when the sun made an appearance, drying out the campus, Pax headed to the cryptozoo to wander the paths. Mist rose from the wet concrete in the warm sunlight, while the death hawks made soft screeches in the aviary tower. She was passing the Carnifex tree enclosure, when Liam appeared from the other direction. He put up a good attempt to make it seem like the meeting was accidental, but she thought she'd seen him around the Urbear cage, and he'd clearly been looking for her. 
Pax he said. I feel like I haven't seen you in forever. You see me in class all the time, she responded. His normal cocky exterior had been replaced by an awkward teenager about to ask a girl to the prom for the first time. He glanced back where he'd come from twice, before offering a hesitant smile. His green eyes twinkled with interest. Can we talk? Aren't we doing that, she said. I want to talk about us, he said intently, stepping closer. She opened her mouth to respond that there was no us, but his earthy nearness left her skin tingling. She couldn't deny that part of her avoidance of him had been that she became quite aroused every time he was near, and now that he was close enough that she could lean forward and press her lips against his, that desire came with throbbing pangs. You know we're both attracted to each other, said Liam. I'm not an idiot, and neither are you. I don't know, said Pax raising a playful eyebrow. I think I've proved otherwise this last year. His lips twitched with a smile. It's one of the most endearing things about you. I don't have time for a relationship, said Pax, looking at her shoes so she didn't have to look into his distracting green eyes anymore. It's hard enough figuring out who I am without involving someone else. You don't have to give me all your time, said Liam. We're both busy, I get that. But why not enjoy ourselves from time to time? When we're free. We deserve that much. Pax closed her eyes and inhaled his earthy scent. Even before the accident with the dragonlings, she'd had her fantasies about him, which had only quintupled since. His rough fingertips caressed the back of her hand, sending shivers down her spine. The urge to lean into him, to feel his hands across her lower back, was like a haze. Her eyes flashed open, catching him studying her with exquisite anguish. Liam quickly shoved his feelings behind a facade of confidence, but that glance told her everything about him, revealed his inner thoughts as if they were written on his face. He was smitten with her. The dragonling encounter must have ripped the lid off his feelings, which he couldn't hide anymore. His green eyes rounded, a question she answered by grabbing the back of his neck and pulling him close until their lips were smashed against each other. Her knees melted and she'd unhooked her claws, ready to run them down his back as a warning of what was to come, when she heard a familiar voice call her name. Pax? A sudden rush of cool air was between them as she pulled away from Liam, who looked bewildered by the second sudden change. Baba. Her grandmother's gray hair had been tamed into a thick braid that hung on her shoulder. Her kind eyes twinkled with mirth as she reached out to touch Pax's face. Oh Pax how I've missed you said Baba as she adjusted her prismatic woven shawl. Pax captured her grandmother in her arms, squeezing softly around the shoulders. Have you gotten shorter, Baba? Baba chuckled. Or you've gotten taller. She pulled away, her eyes flashing to Liam as she raised an eyebrow and let a Cheshire grin spread her wrinkled lips. And who is this lovely fellow? I'm sorry to interrupt your makeout session, but I haven't seen my granddaughter in nine months. I'm Liam. He took her hand and kissed the back of it as if she were royalty, which brought a great guffaw of laughter from Baba. Oh, I like him, she said, patting Liam on the chest. Hopefully you two are making good use of your strapping young bodies. Baba, said Pax, blushing. What? asked Baba with a devil-may-care smile. Youth is wasted on the young. You don't know what you have until it's gone, so make sure and have a good time. Just wear protection and all that. Pax felt like she was going to burst into a bubble of embarrassment, but Liam was chuckling. She has my consent to do anything she wants, said Liam, bowing like a courtier at court. Baba looked Liam up and down, as if he were a side of beef. You should take him up on that. Baba, said Pax, hooking herself around her grandmother's arm. I wasn't expecting you until this weekend. Flights from Sweden aren't cheap on the weekend, said Baba. And we have a lot to talk about. Liam backed away from them. I'll leave you two ladies alone. I have some schoolwork to catch up on anyway. It was lovely to meet you, Baba. That means grandmother, said Baba. But you can call me that. Goodbye, Baba, said Liam, then to Pax while biting his lower lip. I'll see you later. She gave him a steely look, pursed up her lips and said in faux seriousness, maybe. After he left, 
Pax walked with her grandmother around the paths. Sorry about interrupting your kiss, said Baba. But I'm sure you've had plenty of that. Lots I'm sure, said Pax with a sigh. How is your sister? Ines is good. The old witch just gets tougher in her old age, like petrified wood. The Ville Jack celebration was lovely, but Ines can't make Sakaka bread for shit. I was picking seeds out of my teeth all through the night. But anyway, the sauna has been restorative. This old bag of bones really needed them. You sound like you miss it, said Pax. I missed you more, said Baba. But don't worry about me. I'm headed back to Sweden. Ines got me invited to a particularly important mud summer near Bowdoin. I do not want to miss. Not visiting mom and dad. Baba's lips flattened. After today, yes, I'm headed back to Portland for the weekend. Then I'll return to Sweden on Tuesday. You're not just staying for the summer, you're staying there permanently, said Pax. I am. I only stayed in Portland because of you, Pax. Now that you're here with your new friends, you don't need me, said Baba, patting her hand. But when you become rich and famous, you can come visit me. Baba directed them to a wooden bench near the ghost dog enclosure. Her grandmother faced her, staring deep into her eyes with a great reluctance as if she'd been long afraid this day would come. Pax Nygaard. My dearest grandchild, said Baba as she caressed away a strand of wild hair from Pax's face. You have a heart as big as a mountain, especially when it comes to animals. From the earliest days, you did everything from rescuing rodents from their traps, fixing their legs and setting them free in the garden, to climbing high into trees, to return baby birds that had fallen out. Her grandmother looked away for a moment and inhaled deeply, a slight quiver to her lower lip. It happened the summer after you turned eight. Sandy was always telling me about the creatures you brought home, progressively more feral and dangerous, but she marveled at how you cared for them, coaxed them into behaving while they were under your care. My favorite story was about the baby Cheruf that you'd found. They assumed that it had escaped from the zoo. That little lizard kept starting fires all over the house, and your parents could never figure out why, except to assume you'd become a firebug, but then they found you cuddling with it in your bed, trails of smoke drifting from the little critter's horned nostrils. Baba stared into the palm of her hand, rubbing it with her other thumb while her eyes creased. Do you know what a Negan Na Kragen is? asked Baba suddenly. The name was familiar, but it must not have been a genus they'd had to study this year. Pax shook her head tightly as her throat had clenched. No words could come. It's called a crag worm, said Baba. Like almost everything else, you appeared one day with this creature, a baby one as I understand it. You kept your critters in your room in those days. It didn't bite you right away. That honor was given to your parents. Its venom rots away what makes a person good. Baba couldn't meet her gaze. The hardy granite woman that was her grandmother seemed so frail in that moment. You said it wasn't my fault. Pax screwed up her face as a hole opened beneath her. You said I wasn't the cause. That was a lie. No, Pax. I never said that. I said you didn't do anything. You didn't make them that way, not on purpose and not directly. There was no bad thing, that was an idea that you had later. There was just bad luck, said Baba, squeezing Pax's hand, the grandmother who had sustained her all those years returning. Sometimes bad things happen to good people. That's all. I did it, said Pax as her insides hollowed out. I caused it all. It was my fault. No, Pax. No, said Baba. But I did. I brought the crag worm into the house, it bit my parents, making them into awful versions of themselves, and then you had to leave your comfortable life in Sweden and come care for me, said Pax. You should have just had them put me in an orphanage. That would have been safer for everyone. Though there were differences, echoes of the events with her parents matched what patron Adele told her could happen with Callie, which made her bones ache worse. The cragworm bit me too, didn't it? asked Pax. Baba's face relaxed. It did, but for whatever reason it didn't affect you like it had your parents. The doctors were astounded. No, said Pax, squeezing her lips to a thin line. Don't you see? It did work. 
but I already had a black heart. I know it. Sometimes I go into a rage when things happen, and I'm sure that I'm right but afterwards, afterwards it's just regret. You see, there was nothing to burn away. It's why I gravitate to animals, because I must hate the human world. Her grandmother shut her eyes, water leaking from the edges as she shook her head. No, this isn't the conclusion you're supposed to come to. But it's the correct one, said Pax. You said it yourself. I was bitten by a creature that drives out what makes a person good, but I was unchanged. How can you draw any other answer? The first hearing of it had hurt as if she'd been branded by a hot iron, but the more that the pain sunk in, the more it made sense. It was why she pushed away Liam, and probably why she'd broken Logan's nose. She wondered if the events of that day had happened as she remembered them. A tiger doesn't change its stripes, so why would she be different? Thank you, Baba, said Pax, hearing the calmness in her own voice. I'm sorry you had to take care of me all those years. I'm sorry I took you away from your sister, Ines. I see that now. Her grandmother put her hand to Pax's temple and leaned in close, her face wrinkled with intention. See, you're doing it again. You're trying to take all the bad on yourself. You've always done that. Can't you see how big your heart is? How kind you are. But how do you explain that there was no change from the venom, she asked. I can't, said Baba. Your great-grandmother was a famous witch in Sweden, maybe her blood protected you somehow. I don't know. It's okay, Baba. I know who I am, said Pax. I know it's not who you wanted it to be, but hearing about what happened makes so many things make sense for me. I bet I know why Callie chose me. What does Callie have to do with this? asked Baba, tilting her head. More than you can imagine, said Pax, standing up. Baba grabbed her hands. Pax Nygaard. I know this has been hard to hear. Your reaction, maybe it's not what I expected but it will pass. Pax held her grandmother, kissed her on the forehead. I love you, Baba. Thank you for taking care of me. Enjoy your time back in Sweden. Their parting felt like a large part of her life had been cleaved away. It hurt, stung like salt in a great wound, but maybe that's what she deserved, maybe it was what was important to save them from further harm. Chapter 30 During the last month at school, her classmates talked incessantly about which house they were going to choose. No one asked her, probably because they assumed it would be keepers. They'd probably be quite surprised to find that she'd chosen herself and Callie. Knowing that she wouldn't come back after her first year didn't make her classes less enjoyable. In fact, she relished everyone, even the lessons with Professor Vladimir. As well, she spent as much time with Janelle and Liam as she could. She couldn't tell if she was being selfish and self-serving, but decided that as long as her friends didn't appear miserable, she wouldn't let them know she was going to leave. Nothing more came of the kiss with Liam, because she made sure never to be alone with him. It wasn't that she didn't want him, but she couldn't trust herself that her motives weren't compromised. One of her strategies for staying apart was to work as much as possible, which meant she spent a lot of time in the menagerie, feeding the animals and organizing the supply rooms. Pax was in the back room, preparing the various buckets that she would later carry to the animals. Where do you want to go after the year's over? She asked Callie who was lounging on the chair in the corner of the room with one ear perked up. Pax shoveled another scoop of dead crickets into a bin labeled, Oread Spider. Callie sent back images of the Eiffel Tower. Paris? I thought you'd want to head to mountains or back to the northwest, said Pax laughing. Let me try again. Where do you want to go that doesn't cost a lot of money? Wherever we go, we'll have to find a job. I know there are little zoos and animal parks all over the West. They won't be the Portland Zoo, but we'll make do." The little fox put her head on her paws, while Pax pulled out the raw meat from the freezer, took a couple of chunks, and placed them into a bowl that went into the microwave. An image of the menagerie appeared in Pax's mind. Huh? You like it here? The fox lifted her furry chin. Janelle's face followed by Liam's floated through her mind. She thought the fox was finished, but her friend's images were followed by the professor's, even Vladimir. 
I like it here too, but you know the deal. I can't stay if you're here, said Pax. An image of Callie heading down a street away from Pax brought a shake of her head. No. No. I chose you, not the school. It's probably for the best, after what Baba told me. It ends up I'm a bad person. She had to stop in place with her hand on the microwave door, because Callie sent wave after wave of images in her head, Pax sticking her hand in the hole to save the owl thing, Pax rushing into the sewers to save Logan, the time Pax threw herself in front of a wild bobcat that was about to pounce on an injured rabbit. The images kept coming, time after time of Pax putting herself in harm's way. When at last the images subsided, Pax said, but how do you explain the crag worm venom? It didn't affect me, which means I was already bad. An image of Pax and Callie, cuddled on the bed, rose up in her mind. The little fox was licking her chin, which was making her giggle. This happened often enough that Pax didn't know which time she meant. Callie loved to wake her with fox kisses. I don't know, Callie. Maybe. But it still doesn't change the fact that we have to leave. She paused. We'll at least enjoy ourselves before we go. The images ended, leaving Pax to her duties. She was deep in thought, remaining still to pluck the thread from the whirlwind in her head, when she heard a door click open. No one was supposed to be in the menagerie this evening, especially as late as it was. Thinking it might be one of the other students sneaking in for a make-out session, Pax stepped around the shelving that held the feeding buckets, where she wouldn't be visible from the front of the room. The light's on, said a voice from the other side of the shelves. He said no one would be here. Maybe someone left them on, said a second voice. These fucking animal twits aren't all right in the head. Pax knew those voices. They were the men who chased her and Janelle down in the streets. Callie appeared at her side, staring intently at the front of the room, ready for action, but Pax couldn't find anything that would serve as a weapon. If they'd been in the containment room, there would have been options, but the storage room held nothing but bins of food and other storage containers. Motioning to the fox, she crept around the back side of the shelves, heading towards the front, as the two men walked purposely to a wall on the far side. He said they'd be in here, said the man. The beaks will bring a pretty penny. Shame the poor critter ate that bad seed and had to die. The two men shared a laugh as Pax's blood boiled. Her hands turned to fists at her sides, but she knew there was no way she could take them even with Callie's help. The little fox could only invade one mind at a time, leaving the other guy ample time to hurt her. She didn't doubt that he had a weapon of some kind. A gun would be fatal for her. But the two men didn't stay long. They put the two dead deathhawks into a sack. She knew what they'd grabbed since their unexpected deaths had been big news around campus. She stayed hidden, intending to follow them when they left the room, but they turned off the light before leaving. She slammed her ankle into a shelf before stopping to give herself dark vision. Once the grays of the room bloomed into view, she hurried to the front with Callie at her side. They ran up the stairs into the main area of the menagerie, but she didn't see them. Shit, said Pax, slamming her hand into her fist. Edgar the octopus appeared at the glass. She signed danger to him, and he responded affirmatively, extending a tentacle to the glass doors. She hurried after, but once again saw no sign of the two men. Her delay had kept her from following them, not that she could have done anything about it. But their conversation revealed that they had a friend on the inside. Someone who worked at the school, and had given them access to the facilities. Other events at the school, the shooting on the night of the ghost dogs that they'd been chased on the way back from ice cream, made the perpetrator all too clear to her. She knew exactly who was to blame. Chapter 31 Pax headed straight for the nest. The men's section of the living quarters was on the other side. She headed to her room first, with Callie on her heels, to grab Janelle before she confronted him. To her surprise, Liam was standing in her open door, leaning on the frame. He turned, his face brightening as he saw her, at least until he saw her expression. You fucking traitor, she said, slamming both hands into his chest, knocking him into the room. The ferocity and surprise kept him from reacting. He held his hands up as Janelle looked upon her, aghast. For a brief moment, 
Pax worried that this was a misunderstanding of the crag worm venom, but the events of the evening were beyond misinterpretation. Before he could take a step towards her with his hands out, Callie growled, baring her teeth at him. He hesitated. I was just looking for you. I didn't know you worked tonight, he said, glancing to Janelle for support. You're working with those people who chased Janelle and I, who shot the Virgil bird. Aren't you? I don't know what you're talking about, he said, turning up his palms. I swear. The confusion and anguish in his face made her doubt her conclusions, especially when Janelle screwed up her face. Pax, what's going on? I've never seen you this angry, she said. Some men, they came into the storage room and took the bodies of the death hawks to sell. I recognized their voices. They were the same ones that chased us, said Pax. Janelle's head turned quickly. Liam? Aye aye, he said, water forming at the corner of his eyes. He looked back at Pax and she knew she was right. She could see the pain of his decision, dissolving him. His mouth screwed up. I had no choice. They'll kill my mom if I don't keep helping them. What? asked Janelle, rising from the bed. You sent them after us? Liam held his hands up. No. I didn't know about that, and after you guys told me about it, I told them I wouldn't work with them anymore if they hurt my friends. But they can hurt other people? They can kill the animals? asked Pax. He looked like he was being ripped apart, internally. He placed his clawed hand against his jaw. They recruited me before I came to the halls. I don't think I'm the only one. They claim they're only there to help me, but then the things they ask kept getting worse, he said. I didn't know you were working tonight. I thought it was tomorrow. I'm so sorry. I don't know what to do. Askel is a scary dude. I couldn't tell him no. I do anything for my mom. Anything? Murder steal betray your hall your friends, said Pax. You'd do the same if you were in my shoes, said Liam, thumbing away wetness on his cheek. Clearly you don't know me then, said Pax, pacing away momentarily. What the abyss? You've lied to me before. The night with the Virgil bird. You didn't take it to Professor Keiko. You took it to them. How could I ever trust you again? How can anyone? If she'd pulled out a knife and shoved it deep into his chest, he probably would have looked more alive than he did in that moment. He stumbled towards the door, his hands missing the handle before finally working enough to let himself free. When he was gone, Pax turned to Janelle, who looked equally devastated. I never suspected, she said. Callie jumped into Pax's lap when she fell onto the bed. Neither did I. In fact, I almost went after Logan. Thinking that it was him. I wish it would have been him, said Janelle. Yeah, me too. Janelle jabbed her thumb towards the door. What are you going to do about him? I'll give him a few days to fess up to the school, or get the hell out. I never want to see him again, said Pax. At least you didn't sleep with him, said Janelle. I don't know, said Pax. Maybe wish I had. At least I could have had that moment of joy before this shit show. Janelle tilted her head. You still like him, don't you? After this? No, but before, absolutely. But it wasn't going to work, said Pax as she put her hand on Callie's neck, scratching her behind the ears. After a long silence, Janelle asked, What do you think they'll do to his mom? Do you believe him on that? After all the other lies, asked Pax. Janelle lifted a hesitant shoulder. Maybe? Pax had no answer. Chapter 32 The next day, Liam was missing in classes. Pax felt a measure of relief that he'd chosen to disappear quietly. It had been hard enough to confront him. Only Callie's affection had helped her finally fall asleep, deep into the night. Professor Keiko had asked after him, but Liam's roommate Linus said he hadn't seen him since the previous night. It was unusual, but not unheard of, for students to take a day off. The grind of schoolwork could be quite rough, so it was accepted as a sanity day. When Pax made it back to her room before dinner, she found a note on her bed in Liam's handwriting. Janelle entered right after she found the note. 
They stared at it with trepidation. Are you going to read it? asked Janelle. Pax flipped it open to find a terse message. I'm sorry I hurt you. I'm going to fix it. Liam. Oh shit, said Pax putting the back of her hand against her forehead. He's an idiot. She read the note to Janelle, who put her face in her hands. What if they've killed him? asked Pax squeezing her arms around her chest. I didn't think he'd go to them. He was put in a pretty unwinnable situation, said Janelle. He probably thought it was his one way out. A dumb one, said Pax shaking her head. I wonder if his passion to get into the school was to repay this Askel or because he really wanted to be here. I feel like I don't know him as well as I thought. Do we really know each other that well? asked Janelle, eyebrow raised. What do you mean? You've been really quiet lately, said Janelle, searching her with her eyes. You've got something serious on your mind, but you haven't let out a peep of it. I know I'm a shit friend, said Pax. And a worse person, or so I learned. Janelle blinked hard. That's not true. I don't know anymore, said Pax as she folded the note, then lifted it up. What are we going to do about this? That wasn't the only secret that Liam was keeping from you, said Janelle. Please don't tell me he was into cockfighting, said Pax. Two summers ago, on the PCT, he was off trail and found a guy who'd shattered his leg and couldn't move, but a storm was coming in. He could have left him on the mountain, the guy probably would have died, but it put Liam at risk. He stayed with him, rode out the storm. Then he built a travoy and hauled the guy out of the mountains, 80 miles, which took two weeks. He had to forage for two and keep them safe. There was a whole series of articles about it. I found them when I looked him up. Why didn't he tell me that story? asked Pax. When I asked him, he told me he didn't want to influence you into liking him because of that, said Janelle. You're telling me this now because you want me to go after him, said Pax. I'm telling you this now so you don't think he's a total monster, said Janelle especially if he's dead already. As for going after him, I figured you would do that anyway. It's what you do. Pax looked away. Maybe we should tell the professors. If he's alive, they could rescue him. They'd probably just defer it to the police, said Janelle. He'd either die before they found him, or they'd put him in jail for being an accomplice after they rescued him. What the hell can we do about it? These are grown men criminals, said Pax. It's not like we're members of Coterie with big, flashy spells at our fingertips. I could probably bore them into submission by reciting what I know about the nomenclature. That didn't stop you from rushing into the sewers after Logan, said Janelle. Okay, said Pax, crossing her arms. If we're going to go after him, how do we even find him? Silence intruded as they thought about the problem. After a few minutes of contemplation Janelle said, the snort horn is a great tracker. We could sneak it out of the barn. Use it to find where Liam went. Once we know that, maybe we can decide what to do. Pax nodded right away. Let's do that. I have the keys to the barn. The problem will be sneaking out one of the snort horns. We need a distraction. They both looked to Callie, who'd been sleeping on the bed, curled into a little furry ball. Her snout raised as her right ear twitched. She sent a feeling of warm cherry pie as acknowledgement of their request. Great, said Pax. It's getting dark now, we should get moving before his scent gets too muddled. The holding pens in the barn were in the lower level of the structure. There were a half dozen floors beneath the ground, which made it deceptively roomy. Callie needed no instruction, as she could get in and out of the various facilities without help. Pax and Janelle went through the front, telling the third year on duty at the desk that they were headed back to find a lost notebook from class last week. They barely made it to the door at the end of the hallway when they heard an alarm going off and saw the third year run down a different hallway towards the main barn grounds. Not knowing how long they had, they ran to sublevel 2, where the snort horns were kept. The area wasn't locked since they weren't dangerous creatures, and students came down to work on their taming marks. The snort horns looked like anteaters with lizard skin and a strange protrusion on their forehead that wasn't a horn, but
but allowed them to sample the air, tasting odor down to the individual particle. Janelle grabbed a leash and hooked it around Princess, a young female snorthorn that had an energetic personality, while Pax grabbed a box of treats and a signal whistle. Come on, Princess, said Janelle, giving the snorthorn a treat, before leading them out of the level at a fast trot. We have work to do. Princess ambled at their pace, her little legs pumping furiously to keep up. After a ride up the elevator, they headed to the front, relieved that no one was at the desk. Callie had done her job well. Once they were outside, they slowed down, as to not give themselves away. Having a snort horn outside the barn was not unusual, though they were typically seen during the day. Callie caught up to them around the time they entered the nest, headed to the men's section. No one questioned the snort horn, mostly they waved to Princess. Do your thing, Pax said as Janelle parked Princess before Liam's door. Janelle's spellcasting was efficient and graceful as she linked herself to Princess to parse through the scents in the hallway. When Janelle opened her eyes, she turned Princess back the way they came. Let's go, she said, giving Princess a treat, which she greedily gobbled down. The trail led out of the nest and straight west. Princess had no problem following where Liam had gone. His highly charged emotional state left markers on the street. The honks and rumblings of nearby cars made the snort horn a little skittish, but Janelle stopped frequently to coax her, supplying additional treats for the extra work. When they neared Psychic Cream and Princess showed signs of confusion, Pax worried that either the trail had gone cold, or the enchantments they used in the shop to create the delicious effects were confusing the creature. He might have crossed the street here, said Janelle, craning her neck in both directions as families passed them with ice cream cones in their hands and smiles on their faces as they greedily licked the treats. I don't know. Psychic cream is messing her up. I can feel it through the link. Liam went on foot, which means it can't be far, or he could have gone to the trains or hired a taxi. Pax put a hand to her chin. He mentioned Askel last night. I wonder if he works at one of these shops. Janelle handed the leash to Pax, pulled out her phone, and started looking up the shops on the street. After a few minutes of sleuthing she extended her arm and said, Askel Ragnarsson. He owns the deadly and delightful threads across the street. I found an article on the guy. It looks like he was a former alchemist student but dropped out or was kicked out something. They'd seen the place before. It was a men's tailor. They made enchanted clothing. They probably saw us with Callie from their shop when we got ice cream, said Pax shaking her head. Liam probably went in, said Janelle. They could have taken him anywhere. Wait here, said Pax. Let me and Callie take a peek. There's an alleyway on the side. Janelle stayed with Princess, which brought coups and attention from the family's leaving psychic cream. Pax hurried across the street with Callie on her shoulders, letting her down once they'd passed the shop. They slunk down the alleyway. A street behind the shop echoed with the rumblings of a running motor. She heard guys talking about unloading crates and edged far enough to see the front of a white van. The building was larger than she thought. The business part was only a third of the total. She spied a window above her, but the bars were so narrow that Callie couldn't fit. After returning to Janelle, she said, they're unloading stuff in back. Probably the death hawks and other materials they've stolen. We sell reagents to Alchemist Hall and to the Dagestine Corporation. I bet this Askel learned about the connection with Animalians when he was in school. Lucky he's not mad, said Janelle. Or unlucky for us, said Pax. Janelle shook her head as they stared across the street. You're right. We're in way over our head. I'm not ready to bring the five elements against a bunch of guys who probably have guns. Yeah, said Pax. If it's just the two of us, I don't think we can do it. We couldn't even get in if we wanted. But if we could, it might be as simple as sneaking in and breaking him out. I bet I know where we can get help. You're not going to ask Logan or the other students, are you? Asked Janelle, wrinkling her forehead. Merlin's no, said Pax, then gestured to Princess. We have other friends at the hall. Way more useful, too. Patron Adele did say that one of the strengths of the hall was its diversity. I don't know, said Janelle. Using Princess to find Liam was one thing, 
but I don't want to put any animals in danger. What if we get their consent, asked Pax. Janelle thought for a moment. Okay. If they agree to help, knowing the danger, I would do it. Who do you have in mind? Pax let a slow smile spread across her face. Chapter 33 After stashing Princess in their room with the remainder of the treats, they entered the menagerie, where Edgar the Octopus greeted them upon their arrival. He gave Pax a delightful spin, before slapping his tentacles against the glass in greeting. Hi Edgar, signed Pax. She put her hand opposite his tentacle. Good to see you, buddy. We need your help. Edgar gave a second spin, then crouched patiently near the glass while Janelle explained why they needed his help with her superior sign language skills. Okay, he's agreed, said Janelle, the corner of her lips tugging upward. Now how do we take him six blocks without being totally obvious or drying him out? There's a tank on a roller cart in back for taking the aquatic creatures to get checked out, said Pax. You get him into the tank, cover it with a tarp. I need to go into the containment room to get something. Janelle raised an eyebrow. Consent? As much as is possible, said Pax. It's just an insurance policy, anyway. Ten minutes later, Pax met up with Janelle and the tarp-covered tank with Edgar inside. What's in the backpack? asked Janelle. I told you insurance, said Pax. Janelle made a motion signifying she wanted to see inside. Pax slid out of the straps and handed her the backpack. Janelle pulled a metal box from inside that had private, do not open, written in paint marker on the top, while a lock kept the box shut tight. After handing Pax the backpack, Janelle said, let's hope this goes smoothly. Pushing the water-filled tank six blocks took over an hour, especially because Edgar kept wanting to take a peek, pushing up the tarp. A little girl with an ice cream cone spied him and started telling her mother, Mommy, mommy, there's a tentacle thing in there. The mother rolled her eyes and told her, Stop making up things, Delilah dear. They crossed the street well ahead of their destination, heading down an alleyway, then using the back street to reach the shop. The white van was gone. Pax checked the back door just in case, finding it locked. So they pushed the tank to the alleyway and pulled off the tarp. Think you can get up there? She asked Edgar, who signed in the affirmative. Pax stood along the wall giving Edgar a human ladder. He slinked onto her shoulders, then extended a tentacle to the barred window. Once he grabbed hold, he yanked himself up, condensing himself until he fit neatly through the bars like mail through a letter opening. After a few minutes, Pax grew worried, but then the door at the back of the shop opened, revealing the clever ochre octopus. She gave him a thumbs up, and then a piggyback ride to the tank where he climbed inside. Janelle signed to stay put in the tank while they went through the door, promising lots of shrimp when they got back to the menagerie. The inside was dark, which required a quick dark vision spell before they could move again. Callie went ahead while they were finishing up, scouting through the dark room with ease. The back was filled with shelves, each one containing crates and boxes with labels. Pax read a few that listed various supernatural animal parts, herbs, and other reagents, some that were restricted, in the containers. She worried that either Liam wasn't in the shop, or they'd already killed him and dumped his body, because she couldn't see where he might be. But then a door opened further up, revealing light as an older guy with a shaved head and scratchy beard stepped through, heading to a bathroom in the storage room. He'd left the door open, and Pax could see Liam looking bruised and beaten in a cage. Sneaking up to the open door, they saw no one else was in the room. When they heard an extended flatulence from the bathroom, they rushed to the cage. Liam's eyes went wide upon their approach. He whispered, No, you have to get out of here. They'll kill you. But Pax ignored him, searching for a key which she found nearly right away hanging on a hook. She shoved it into the lock and turned it. A click later the door was open. Callie flashed black licorice, danger, into her mind the moment before she heard the cocking of a gun. The older guy held out his phone, which had a video playing of the room they were standing in. Technology is a beautiful thing, ladies, he said. But I'm a little perturbed that you interrupted my evening constitutional. Chapter 34 The number of cages with magical blockers built into the wiring they had on the premises 
suggested their supernatural animal trafficking was not confined to the occasional catch, but a significant part of their operation. Pax crouched in one that smelled like wet fur. Janelle was to her left, and Liam was on the other side of her. The guy with the shaved head was named Jakob, and the other two that joined them from the front were Nils and Stein. Jakob stood before the cages, rubbing his stubbled chin. I swear I recognize these two, he said, looking back to his compatriots. Do they ring a bell for you? Nils, a thin man with blonde hair and empty eyes, who'd been eating a pretzel stick, jabbed it in Pax's direction. That's the fox girl. Where's your little friend, girly? I'd been working with her at school, said Pax. She's back in the menagerie. Nils made a noise in the back of his throat that he didn't believe her. Either way, you're kind of fucked now, said Nils. And none of you think about any spellcasting. Not that you animalians can cast for shit, those cages will only make a fuckery of your attempts. What are you going to do with us? asked Janelle with her arms squeezed around her bent knees. Ain't for us to decide, said Jakob. When Askel gets back, he'll give the order. I can assure you that it won't be good, but we won't be cruel about it. Short and sweet. Stein turned on a little TV on the desk, plopped into a chair, and put his feet up. I guess we'll be here a while. Jakob disappeared in front while Nils took a chair next to Stein. Turn on the motion detector, in case more of their friends poke around. After adjusting the settings on a wall pad, they pulled up a daytime soap about mages called The Arcanes and started gossiping about the various characters on the show. At first, Pax sat quietly in her cage, head down trying to make contact with Callie. When the fox was near, and if she calmed her mind, she could sense Callie's presence. But there was no sign of her furry friend. Nothing. The motion detector showed no signs of movement in the building either. While Callie couldn't easily sneak in due to the height of the window, there were shelves on the inside to facilitate her escape. Pax feared that patron Adele had been right. Callie cared for her only because she was food, and now that it was likely she'd be killed, the fox had abandoned her. When Pax turned her head, Janelle signed, what to do? Pax gestured toward her backpack on the table. The men had taken it from her, but forgotten about it. Callie, signed Janelle. Pax shook her head, which brought a furrowed brow from her friend. What's going on with you and Callie? That day with patron Adele changed something in you both, signed Janelle. Pax sighed, working up the courage to explain. The hesitant start was mostly due to her inexperience with sign language, and at times she had to spell out the words, but she managed to work it out for Janelle. I have to leave Animalians, she signed. Callie isn't a thoracic fox, but a dangerous creature called a Calidus. Patron Adele gave me a choice. Break the bond with Callie, or I cannot come back to school. Janelle had never heard of the Calidus, so Pax filled her in on what Patron Adele had told her, and what she'd read about later. The stories of previous encounters were damning, written more like horror stories than historical fact, but she didn't hold anything back. After the explanation, Janelle sat quietly in her cage, lips squeezed to a point. So you were going to leave school? Stay with Callie, asked Janelle. Pax shook her head then added, maybe patron Adele was right. Callie left us. I'm no use to her dead. I'm sorry, signed Janelle, adding a hug to her message. Me too, signed Pax, wishing she hadn't been wrong about her friend. Even though Pax was likely to die in the coming hours, it wasn't her impending death that occupied her thoughts, but the empty hole where her furry companion had once resided. She'd been with Callie so long, it was hard to remember a time they weren't together, especially when the bad thing had muddled her memories of her early years. It was hard to admit patron Adele had been right, but her love for Callie had clouded her judgment. Or was it really love? Or a psychically imposed need? Even knowing what Callie was, didn't change her positive feelings towards her. After a few hours, sitting in the cramped cage made her knees ache, and the wires on the bottom bit into her legs. She tried shifting around but nothing worked. Then the men quickly turned off the TV and stood up as an extremely well-dressed man in a custom suit with a silk scarf over his shoulders entered the room. He held himself like an emperor. When his gaze fell upon Pax and her friends, it was full of supreme disappointment. 
He shook his head. You're a complication I would rather not be dealing with right now, said Askal. He wandered to Liam's cage, tapped on it. You should have just kept your mouth shut and done what I asked. Now you got your friends killed. Liam glanced sideways, his eyes hollowed out with pain. He hung his head between his bent knees. You should leave his mother alone, said Pax, looking up at Askal. He approached her cage, a twitch on his lips. You're a fierce one. I'm sorry that this is the end, but I know you wouldn't be able to keep your mouth shut. Complications in my line of business are unacceptable. You got kicked out of alchemists for stealing, I bet, said Janelle. Oh fun, they're both not shy, said Askel to his men. And yes, you are correct. I was skimming reagents from class, selling them on the black market. Like you I got caught, and like you I had to pay the price. But your price is a lot steeper. Are you going to kill us here? asked Liam, finally finding his voice. No. There are some nice abandoned buildings in the 13th Ward that make lovely dumping grounds. Askel snapped his fingers. Come on, boys. Let's get them out of these cages. When Pax finally got to stand, the blood rushing back into her legs turned them to needles. They zip tied her hands around the wrists, which would make spellcasting extremely difficult. While they were pulling Liam from his cage, Pax asked, I know I probably don't deserve this since we interrupted your night, but is there any way you could return my backpack to the campus so it gets back to my family in Portland? The forgotten backpack lay on the table. Everyone in the room turned towards it. What's so special about it? asked Askel upon approach. It has my diaries, some family knickknacks, that sort of thing, said Pax. At least they can know that I enjoyed my last year at school. Askel scratched his jaw, staring at the backpack. He unzipped the top, pulling out the metal box, weighing it. This doesn't feel like notebooks to me, said Askel. Oh how cute, it says do not open on the bottom, said Jakob. I'm surprised there aren't little hearts or unicorns too. Askel grabbed Pax by the shoulder, pulling her forward. What's in here? I told you notebooks nothing special, said Pax, glancing askew, which only intrigued him further. Askel rattled the cheap lock on the front. He grabbed a pair of pliers off the table and snapped the wire-thin loop that connected the lock. Behind her back, Pax signed to her friends, no magic. Hold breath. Before he opened the latch, Askel cocked his head at her. What are you playing at? He turned the box on its side, snapping open the lid as he dumped the contents on the table right next to Pax, who had already taken a huge breath and held it tight. The three Encoxal Vipers landed in a pile, uncoiling immediately. Askel threw himself backwards, fingers and mouth moving for a spell, but the Encoxal Viper that landed nearest was faster, extending itself like a whip, catching him before he finished. The Viper hung from his arm as he screamed, eyes rolling into the back of his head, foam forming at the corners of his lips. A cannon-like gunshot from close range deafened Pax's left ear, as Jakob fired his weapon at the two vipers remaining on the table. The bullet blew a hole in the table, and the two snakes dropped onto the ground next to Pax's legs. The men screamed, firing indiscriminately as the vipers slithered across the ground. Jakob tripped over Janelle's outstretched foot, landing within reach of a viper which bit him directly in the crotch. His friend Nils in an attempt to kill the snake fired his weapon, hitting Jakob in the stomach, then a second shot caught the snake, blowing it to bits. As Stein and Nils backed away, guns trained on the floor, the third viper slithered beneath the desk where the TV rested. Where'd it go? Where'd it go? said Nils as he jumped onto the table, knocking Stein out of the way. The chaos of the room made it hard to focus on anything. Pax was aware of the convulsing Askel on her left, the viper that had bitten him lying lazily across his arm sated. While the Encoxal vipers grew sleepy after giving up their venom, she wasn't about to test it by making a sudden movement. Stein, who was still on their level, made a run for the door, but the viper had moved under a shelf and bit him right in the ankle. He went down holding his leg, and the viper got him a second time in the thigh. Nil screamed, training his gun on Pax. You did this. You brought those fucking snakes, you lying bitch. I'm going to put a bullet in all three of your stupid heads, said Nils, face blotchy with anger. Pax backed against the wall next to the desk, 
hoping that if he fired at her, Liam or Janelle could rush him before he could kill them. Before he could pull the trigger, Callie jumped down from a shelf, landing next to Pax. The barrel of Nil's gun bounced between her and Callie. What the fuck is the fox doing here? At first, Pax was confused why Callie hadn't blinded Nils, but realized that he would just fire indiscriminately, probably hitting them in his panic. Nils didn't quite know what he wanted to do, mumbling to himself as he kept his gun rotating between them. Pax wished she knew more about guns, and how many bullets the version he was holding might have. Not that she was sure how many shots had been fired already, as her ears still rang from the concussive blasts. The conclusion to his indecision, came with the narrowing of his gaze. Pax knew he planned to kill her first as he straightened his arms aiming at her chest. In the moment before he pulled the trigger, Callie leapt across the gap, startling him to twitch the gun her direction. No. The blast echoed through the room. Callie spun away as the bullet caught her at short range. Before Nils could re-aim his gun, Liam tackled him off the table, knocking him onto Askel. Nils rose briefly before the viper bit him in the back. Pax rushed to Callie, who lay on her side, heaving. Her fur was matted with blood. Janelle joined her, quickly finding the wound and placing her hands over it. No, Callie, said Pax. Don't die. We need to get her back to campus, said Janelle. The bullet went under her arm, not a direct hit, but she's losing a lot of blood. You two go back, said Liam, grabbing a blanket from one of the shelves. I'll get the vipers. Using Janelle's phone, Pax summoned a ghost taxi so they wouldn't have to explain the blood or wounded animals. They threw themselves in back, crowding around Callie, who lay shivering on Janelle's lap as she pressed her hands against the wound. Please don't die, Callie, said Pax, shaking as she held her hands against her friend. The little fox's tongue hung out her mouth while her eyes looked listless. It was only seven blocks back to campus, but the ride took forever. Callie's eyes were barely opened by the time they returned. Scrambling out of the taxi, they rushed towards the menagerie, hoping to find Professor Ansel, who was the campus veterinarian. They ran around the corner, right into Patron Adele. Chapter 35 The tall, ebony-skinned patron had a worn traveling sack slung over her shoulder. She looked tired, but snapped to attention the moment she saw the wounded animal. Follow me, she said, abandoning her sack on the sidewalk, and the three of them ran across the grounds, entered the menagerie, and headed to the second floor to the veterinary facilities. What happened? asked Patron Adele as they gently laid Callie on an operating table. Her fur was completely matted with blood. The only motion Pax could detect from the fox was a slight raising and lowering of her abdomen. Gunshot wound nicked but she's bled a ton, said Janelle. Pax expected questions about the circumstances, but Patron Adele looked her right in the eyes and said, Do you want me to save Callie? A hole opened in her chest as she reckoned with the question. Her doubt lasted until she remembered Callie leaping in front of the gun, saving her life. Yes, said Pax. Please. Patron Adele's stern mouth squeezed with understanding. Pax, you wait outside. Janelle grabbed that green box on the second shelf. Pax took a step back as Janelle rushed into action, clearly in her element. Patron Adele nodded towards the door. It will be easier for both of you, if you're not here. Pax left the bright lights and sterile stainless steel tables, returning to the hallway, where she paced. When Liam came rushing up the stairs, the viper box in his hands, his shirt soaking wet, he said, I gave Edgar a piggyback ride. Is Callie all right? We ran into Patron Adele, said Pax gravely. Liam's lips pulled grim. Oh shit. I'm sorry. I'm not, said Pax. I'm sorry I didn't back you right away. I should have understood your circumstances. He gestured wildly. Even after all that? That was a mess. Liam? You're my friend. I'm here for you, that means even in the bad times, she said, thinking about her own circumstance. Does that mean you're going to stop lying about Callie? I caught your conversation with Janelle, he said. She squeezed her eyes shut. I'm not very good with human friends. Liam put his arms around her. She collapsed into them, tears flowing as she heaved with sobs. 
When she could see again, she washed her face in the bathroom, returning to the hallway right as a stone-faced Janelle exited, followed by patron Adele. Pax felt her knees go weak as they approached. She will survive, but she must rest here tonight, said patron Adele as she scrutinized Pax. Are those the vipers? Liam stepped forward, holding the metal box closed with a piece of wire through the latch. Patron Adele took the box gently. One of the vipers was killed, said Pax, struggling to meet the patron's steely gaze. I am aware. She cradled the box to her chest. For now you may return to the nest, get what rest you can. I have been traveling for days and now must deal with the fallout from these events. I will send for you tomorrow when I am ready. After patron Adele left them, Janelle said, I told her everything. I didn't think there was any choice. You did the right thing, said Pax. Let's go get some sleep. At least for Liam and I, it's probably our last night at Animalians. You were only trying to help, Janelle. I'll beg her to at least keep you. The heaviness of the moment squashed further discussion. They trudged back to the nest. Sleep claimed Pax when the adrenaline of the night wore off. She slept until Jillian, the fourth year with pink hair, shook her. Patron Adele wants to see you now, Jillian said grimly. Pax glanced to the empty bed. Jillian offered no further explanation, waiting outside until Pax dressed. Patron Adele met her in the menagerie, in a side office near the veterinary clinic. She sat behind a simple desk, which did nothing to match the gravity she carried with her. Good morning, Miss Nygaard, said Patron Adele. Is Callie still doing okay? asked Pax. The patron lifted her chin. Do you not trust my skills? I'm sorry, said Pax, staring at her shoes. Patron Adele sighed. Callie is awake, doing quite well considering. Professor Ansel is checking up on her. Thank you, Patron Adele, for saving her, said Pax. What am I to do with you, Miss Nygaard? With the weight of the recent events bearing down, Pax might have just accepted leaving Animalians without her friends getting into further trouble. It was easier to leave. As she told Baba, maybe she was just a bad person and tigers don't change their stripes. But if Callie proved that she could be different than her species, maybe Pax had a chance to. Maybe the crag worm venom had done something to her, but she'd chosen not to let that unfortunate luck drag her down a bad path. If at all possible, let me and Callie stay, said Pax, her request feeling like a glass sculpture that would shatter at the slightest touch. Patron Adele chuckled incredulously. You are as bold as your professors tell me you are. Bold but reckless. Why would I let you stay with Callie? Haven't I made my intentions about her clear? You have, Patron Adele. But I think that you are wrong about her. She had every opportunity to abandon me last night. Not only did she not, but she threw herself in the way of the shot, saving me. Patron Adele stared at Pax, which was the longest ten seconds of her life. I am aware of this fact, Miss Nygaard. Your friends were very clear about the circumstances of the evening and Callie's role in it, but a near-death experience is hardly enough for me to disregard the potential danger she poses," said the patron. Pax met the patron's gaze. When you welcomed us to the hall, you talked about the mission of this place, of better understanding animals, so that we might live peacefully with them. While the history of Callie's ancestors is not kind, they were neither scientific in their explanations or even-handed. Based on my experiences and the events of last night, I think that Emotep was wrong. There might have been Calidus who killed mages, but humans are just as guilty, and hopefully we have become more civilized. Kali should be given that chance. Patron Adele tilted her head. It's a worthy argument, but is it enough to guarantee the safety of the school? If there were protocols, ways to reduce the risk, I would submit to them. Whatever it took, said Pax intently. Whatever it took, repeated Patron Adele, the corner of her lip twitching upward. I am prepared for whatever sacrifices that entails, said Pax. I believe you, Miss Nygaard, based on your unusual first year at this hall. Patron Adele steepled her fingers. But what of Edgar? And the Snorthorn? and the three vipers you brought into harm's way, resulting in the death of one of them. How do you answer for those transgressions? 
Both Edgar and the Snorthorn were involved with their consent, said Pax. But I have no excuse when it comes to the Vipers. I brought them as an insurance policy that I hoped would not come to fruition. We do not use animals as weapons here, said Patron Adele, frowning. But on the other hand, it was the men that opened the box, even though you had clearly labeled it. A loophole but a clever one nonetheless. A warmth built in packs that she tamped down, afraid to let her feelings show. If you were to stay, Miss Nygaard, what house did you wish to join? asked the patron. Keepers, said Pax right away, hope blooming. It's the only house for me. Is it now? asked patron Adele. What if I told you that the condition for you staying in Animalians is that you join hunters? Before you say anything, let me explain my reasons. First, hunters is woefully understaffed. Professor Cassius is one of the most capable hunters we've ever had teaching at this school, but he is also a bit over the top when selling the dangers of his house, which has left minimal students a few years running. I need more hunters. Secondly, the Calidus is the type of creature that hunters might be called upon to deal with. They have the best tools for fighting against creatures that influence the mind. Cassius can help you and Callie in this regard. And kill her if she cannot be controlled, said Pax grimly. Patron Adele didn't answer, but she didn't have to. The final reason is that despite your experiences at the Portland Zoo, I believe you are more suited to become a hunter. You proved as much in the sewers going after Logan, or last night with your friend Liam. Hunters require bravery, which you have in spades. A lack of sense is more like it, said Pax. Her patron's expression relaxed. That's another way to put it. Do you consent to this decision? Yes. Absolutely, said Pax, nodding enthusiastically while trying to keep an air of contrition. I will do my best for the hall in Hunters. A lack of effort has never been your problem, said Patron Adele sardonically. Now, you may go see Callie. I'm sure she misses you. Thank you again, Patron Adele, said Pax. I'll make sure you don't regret your decision. She practically ran back to the clinic, getting sent in to see Callie as soon as she arrived. The little fox was lying on a thin mattress. Her abdomen was wrapped with bandages. A blood bag hung on a pole, but the tubes were no longer connected. Pax shoved her face in Callie's fur, careful not to press, relishing the sweet scent as the fox licked her ear. Oh, Callie, said Pax as she crouched down so she could be eye level. Thank you for saving me. I have good news. You get to stay. We get to stay. I'm to join Hunters, but I like Professor Cassius, so that's a plus. Together, we're going to show them that you're not bad. Right? Callie thumped her tail weakly, letting out a little creaking sound. Behind her, the door opened, revealing Janelle and Liam. Callie. They gathered around the fox, letting her lick their hands in greeting. We get to stay, Pax blurted out as the joy of it threatened to explode out of her chest. I can't believe it. I thought I was going to have to leave the school. Her friends smirked as they glanced between themselves. You already knew this? So you know I have to join Hunters? Yep, said Janelle as she raised an eyebrow and Liam crossed his arms. Wait, said Pax. Does that mean? We had to join Hunters as well. A condition of staying in the school, said Liam. Oh, said Pax. I'm sorry, Janelle. I know you wanted to be in Keepers so you could be a vet. She shook her head. It's fine. Patron Adele told me Hunters needed someone with my skill sets. I'll be taking classes in Keepers too next year, and really the only thing that matters is that no one died and none of us had to leave school. I'd almost chosen Hunters myself, so this wasn't so hard, said Liam with a shrug. What about, asked Elle? And your mom, asked Pax. She didn't tell me what happened. Adele and a few other professors visited the shop, collected all the contraband. She said they passed some names to the authorities, so if there's anyone else involved, they'll be found and brought to justice. As for my mom, she's in the free and clear. No more threats on her life. Pax put a comforting hand on his arm. That's great. I know we only have a few weeks left, said Janelle, but I want to make one thing clear for next year. 
No more secrets between the three of us. Four, said Pax as she rubbed Callie's side. Four, repeated Janelle, bowing towards the fox. Sorry, Callie. But I'm serious. No more secrets. Especially in Hunters, where a mistake could get us killed. So if there's anything you three are holding back, speak now or I will kick your ass. Nothing, said Liam, laughing, but I will be the first to tell you if something comes up. I do have one confession, said Pax, squeezing her lips tight. They turned their heads towards her. Even Callie leaned forward, furry chin raised with interest. I have the best friends ever. Chapter 36 The final bewildering weeks of her first year at Animalians passed in a whirlwind. Before she knew it, she was back on a plane to Portland with Callie at her side. As a member of the Hundred Halls, she flew through security, then she was in the air, staring at the glittering city passing beneath with the fox in the next seat. Fox but not fox, she reminded herself, catching a lolling tongue from Callie in acknowledgement. A lot has changed in nine months. The return came with an excitement to see the updates at the zoo, but also a tightness in her chest. Being at home without Baba would be challenging, but knowing what had happened to her parents, that their meanness was only a side effect of being bitten by the crag worm, would help her cope. Maybe I can find a way to help them, she told Callie as they stared out the window at the fluffy white clouds. There has to be a reason it didn't affect me. A reason other than that, I'm just a bad person. No answer came, nor did she expect one. Such questions merely provided a brief glimpse of the path ahead, a light to keep one moving forward. Pax knew that an answer, if one existed, would require many years. Esmeralda picked her up at the airport in a faded green Toyota truck. She looked like she was getting ready to do a tarot reading in a dark room. Her bangles rattled with excitement when she threw her arms around Pax. First year completed. Congrats. As Esmeralda let Callie lick her nose, an SUV behind them honked, forcing Pax to throw her luggage into the back of the truck before hopping into the cab. Tell me everything that happened this year, said Esmeralda, barely keeping her eyes on the road in excitement. Pax chuckled. I promise I will, but if you'll forgive me, I'm tired from the flight. Esmeralda patted her leg. Nah, that's not from the flight. That's from a year of craziness, I'm sure. I'll be good, and wait until you're at work on Monday. Monday? No rest for the wicked, asked Pax. A shipment of baby leviathans came in, said Esmeralda. Some fishermen found them on an island on the coast. Whoa, the zoo doesn't have the space for those, said Pax. Alfred's donations came in, so yeah, we're gonna have space, said Esmeralda, eyes alight and lips parting in a grin. Pax was tired so she let Esmeralda chatter the whole way to her home. It was good to catch up on all the happenings at the zoo. The Camazots was sick for a few weeks, requiring medical attention. The Manticore grew a new set of spikes, and they auctioned off the old ones for additional funding. A little girl got lost in the zoo overnight, but they found her in a janitor closet sleeping peacefully after a search, and a Cthulhu beast ate a Nothic that had somehow gotten into its cage. Thanks for the ride she told Esmeralda when she dropped her off at home. Esmeralda leaned out the window and nodded towards the house. You going to be okay th this summer? You can bunk at my place if you'd like. Pax tightened her grip around the backpack slung over her shoulder. No. I need to do this. But thank you and see ya Monday. Pax and Callie stood on the sidewalk, neither moving towards the old two-story Victorian. The light in the front room illuminated her parents, sitting on the couch. Her mother was knitting while her father had a faded paperback nestled in his hands. They looked almost peaceful, not at all the scourge of her childhood. I'll open my window later, said Pax with a wink. Go hunt. I heard that tummy rumble in Essie's truck. Callie bumped her head against Pax's leg, then disappeared across the lawn and into the copse of trees between their neighbors. The peppery scent of the geraniums blooming behind the house reached her as she stepped foot on the porch. Baba's flowers. Her mother did not have her mother's touch in the garden. Black thumb, black plants, muttered Pax to herself, giggling softly before a heavy sigh overtook. I'm home, 
she announced as she stepped through the door, leaving her luggage in the entryway. It's me, Pax. I'm back from the Hundred Halls. She felt a little ridiculous reminding them who she was, but she hoped that the year had softened their anger and maybe her return could be a fresh start. As she stepped into the front room where her parents were sitting, their relaxed expressions hardened. You're back, said her mother flatly. With your penchant for chaos and the fuel of magic at your fingertips, I figured you'd get yourself killed or banished to another realm. With the paperback and old western set beside him, her father said, couldn't get a job in the city. Or an internship? Must not have done very well at the school, if you're back here. Their barbs knocked the scabs off old wounds, the traumas of time. Pax nearly walked out. Esmeralda had already offered a place to stay. It would be simple, easy to spend the summer with her friend. What are you staring at, girl? Her mother scrunched up her face like an angry ferret, while her father crossed his arms, leaning back against the couch with a scowl on his lips. I bet your teacher didn't think very much of you, said her father. Or your friends, if you have any, for that matter. Actually, said Pax right away, my professor said I was exemplary, brave, sometimes reckless but unusual in the good way, and that they were happy to have me at their school. I was formally invited to join the most difficult house, Hunters, so that I might put my skills to their best use. She took a deep breath. And I have the best of friends, the kind that would do anything for me, and I for them. All in all, it was a successful year, an exciting year that I will not let you tarnish, but know that I came back home because I wanted to, because I know that despite your animosity and your hard words, deep down you care for me, love me. Her declaration was such a shock to their system that Pax worried they'd blown a circuit. Neither moved for a long time, which gave her hope that the true them, the one deep inside, just needed encouragement to return to the surface. A smile burgeoned on her lips at her plan. She would smother them in love, rekindle that which had been burned out of them by the crag worm venom. Is that all, her father said mockingly. You know Baba told me I was a girl who fixes things, said Pax, her tongue resting on her teeth. And, asked her mother. Pax winked. That's all. Good to be back. Love you mom and dad. She didn't give them a chance to respond, she knew they weren't ready. But the encounter helped her recognize the path forward. It helped knowing that it was their trauma, not hers. Even if she bore some responsibility for what had happened, it didn't mean she had to shoulder all the weight. As she set her first foot on the creaky wooden stairs that led to the second floor, she remembered Esmeralda's last words before she left for the hundred halls. Be yourself, your best version of yourself, she'd said. At the time Pax hadn't known what that meant. She hadn't known who she was, except as a girl who liked animals and got into trouble. But the funny thing about trouble, or chaos as her mother liked to say, it was a forge for the soul. As she ascended, thinking about the potential perils of her second year, Pax let the corners of her lips part like a lioness contemplating a field full of antelope. This has been Wild Magic, Book 2 of the Animalians Hall series by Thomas K. Carpenter.